derailments and hazardous cargoes. The committee heard testimony this past week here in Washington from several citizen organizations and government officials about a recent derailment in California. California Congresswoman Barbara Boxer, who chairs the House Government Activities and Transportation Subcommittee, said that her panel would pursue evidence that the July 14th train derailment and spill of the pesticide metham sodium into the Sacramento River was worsened by the railroad's response to the emergency. Just ahead, we will bring you this week's hearing in its entirety. The subcommittee will come to order. In light of two devastating derailments in California and pursuant to rules 10 and 11 of the House of Representatives, this subcommittee has been conducting an investigation into the adequacy of federal regulations, laws, and procedures in preventing and responding to derailments resulting in toxic chemical spills. Today, the subcommittee will be examining, one, the circumstances surrounding the July 14, 1991 derailment of the Southern Pacific train near Dunsmuir, California, two, the health effects of the spilled chemical metamsodium on the surrounding populace and environment, three, the extent to which the Federal Environmental Protection Agency should have been aware of the toxic properties of metamsodium at the time of the spill, four, the relationship between the Federal Railway Administration and the Southern Pacific Rail Railroad, as well as other railroads, and five, the failure of the Research and Special Programs Administration within the Department of Transportation to exercise the emergency powers granted to it under law to classify metam sodium as a hazardous material. First, I'm going to talk about the movement of the tank car containing metam sodium. There are many issues which will be discussed today surrounding the Sunday, July 14th derailment. But the first of these is the issue of whether or not Southern Pacific attempted to move or in any way disturb the tank car containing the metam sodium before the official removal time of approximately 4.30 p.m. on Tuesday, July 16th. 1991. SP's public statements and the statements of the Federal Railroad Administration and the National Transportation Safety Board have led us to believe and the public to believe that the derailment caused the spill. Exhibit 1 are these statements that led us to believe that the derailment caused the spill. But the subcommittee has received numerous pieces of evidence which strongly call into question whether or not the tank car was moved or disturbed, thereby aggravating the effects of the derailment itself and causing the massive spill. For example, one, the time of the derailment at Kantara Loop near Dunsmuir was at 9.40 p.m. on July the 14th. SP continued to report for hours, as did the California Department of Fish and Game, who was in charge of the derailment scene, that the derailed tank car was in the Sacramento River and was not leaking. In fact, SP did not report any leak leaking of the tank car until sometime around 5 to 5.30 a.m. Monday, July 15th, almost eight hours after the train derailment. And we have exhibit two, which shows the first time the spill was recorded. In addition to these written reports that clearly state that nothing was leaking early, is the fact that metam sodium, had it spilled at the time of the derailment, would have emitted an extremely strong odor, much like rotten eggs within minutes. And exhibit three is the EPA stating the type of smell that would have been emitted immediately. Since the tank, <coughs> excuse me, since the tank car was in the river and the smell of metam sodium interacting with the water would have become quickly evident if it was leaking, SP's own reports 
as well as fish and games, support the logical conclusion that the tank car was not leaking until hours after the derailment. Interviews with the California Department of Fish and Game warden, Mr. Charles Convalin, who was in charge of the derailment scene and cleanup effort, have revealed that neither he nor anyone else who was with him at the derailment scene smelled the metam sodium until at least three and a half hours after the derailment. Further supporting the theory that there was no leaking of the tank car at the time of the derailment. Three, SP has stated that they had the necessary equipment to move the tank car at the derailment site, mainly large front end loaders, bulldozers, which are routinely used to move derailed cars, including tank cars like the one in the Sacramento River. Four, by SP's figures, the spill of metam sodium took almost nine hours to reach Dunsmuir as it flowed down the Sacramento River. However, Jim Pedry of the California Water Quality Control Board stated that their figures indicate that the travel time should have been closer to about four hours. Using the figures provided by the Water Quality Control Board, experts in the timing and movement of water, and working backwards in time from Dunsmuir, this would put the time of the spill hours later than SP's story, which is that the spill occurred at the time of the derailment at 9.40 p.m. on July the 14th. Five, SP's own press release regarding the movement of the tank car states the following, and I quote, quote, no attempt was made to move the car on Sunday night following the derailment before local and state officials arrived at the scene and began to assess the extent of the damage with Southern Pacific personnel. Therefore, SP's own press release does not eliminate the possibility that there was a movement of the tank car between Sunday night and Tuesday afternoon. And I have Exhibit 4, which is their own press release. In addition, on August the 23rd, 1991, SP spokesman Mike Furtney said in a Los Angeles Times interview regarding the moving of the tank allegations that, quote, nobody touched that tank car for the first several hours. Here again, SP does not vehemently deny moving the tank car before Tuesday afternoon. Instead, SP states that they didn't move the tank car, quote, for the first several hours, unquote. Exhibit 5 shows that interview. Also, when subcommittee staff met with SP officials, they stated twice that regarding the movement of the tank car issue that, quote, we have investigated the incident fully and we do not believe that we move the car as alleged, unquote. The SP official did not say that categorically SP did not move the tank car, only that they did not believe that the tank car was moved. It is important that I make very clear why the subcommittee is vigorously continuing its investigation into the movement of the tank car. First and foremost, it is the duty of this subcommittee to get at the truth wherever it may lead. Initially, the subcommittee's investigation was proceeding on the assumption that the official story of how the derailment occurred and of the actions that followed were correct. However, when the subcommittee began receiving calls from nu numerous and credible sources, as well as discovering evidence that the official story might be wrong, the subcommittee had no choice but to follow the investigation in the direction of the evidence. I hope that today's proceedings will shed further light on this most serious matter. The second issue, Southern Pacific's and Fish and Game's response to the spill. If, despite the evidence, Southern Pacific claims unequivocally that it did not move the tank car in any way or disturb it in any way, then the only logical conclusion is that the tank car began spilling metam sodium into the Sacramento River immediately after the derailment. In fact, only recently has SP begun to stress that the train crew and the first SP employee on the scene smelled a strong odor 
coming from the derailed tank car. Up until then, other SP officials who arrived at the scene shortly thereafter did not detect any odor at all. And this is Exhibit 6. If this scenario is true, and the smell was obvious immediately, then the following questions must be asked and answered. One, why didn't SP immediately report the spill and the odor to the National Response Center? They were not called until 1.18 a.m., July 15th, and that's Exhibit 7. A call to the National Response Center would have triggered the Coast Guard strike team, the federal EPA, and the National Transportation Safety Board into action much earlier than was the case. Two, why did SP say to the Dunsmuir Fire Department that they were not needed? Exhibit 8. 3. Why did Fish and Game tell the Dunsmuir Fire Department and Police Department to stay in their stations until they were needed? 4. Why did SP wait for almost 14 hours to report a major spill, putting thousands of people at a greater risk than necessary? Five, why did Fish and Game tell the EPA that their assistance wasn't needed? Six, why did Fish and Game tell the EPA that there was no leak as late as 3.30 a.m. July the 15th? And that's Exhibit 9. I am pleased to hear that SP has begun to improve the safety of the tracks in the Cantara Loop area and his plans to add an, uh, other safety modifications. But why has it taken 21 accidents in this stretch of track in the last 16 years, the last one resulting in needless and preventable human suffering and an environmental tragedy, the likes of which California has never seen, for Southern Pacific to come to the obvious realization that something needed to be done there? The third area we'll be pursuing. Failure of the federal agencies to regulate a dangerous chemical. At our July 31st hearing, the subcommittee asked the Environmental Protection Agency and the Research and Special Programs Administration within the Department of Transportation why metam sodium was not classified as a hazardous material. It became evident that neither agency would take responsibility for immediately regulating metam sodium or other chemicals that can devastate the environment and harm people when they are discharged in a transportation accident. What we did get, what we did get was an earful of bureaucratic mumbo jumbo from the Research and Special Programs Administration, that's RISPA, and from EPA, basically adding up to, it's not my job, or we have to follow administrative procedures, which of course take years. And I remember that I asked EPA at the time, their representative, what if the metam sodium had killed 45 people instead of 45 miles of a river? Would it still take you two years to get this chemical on the list? And he responded, that's right, Congresswoman. Since July 31st, the subcommittee has learned that EPA was sitting on information for months that proved metam sodium had extremely hazardous effects on humans, but they did nothing about it. Now that it is clear to everyone that metam sodium is very dangerous, EPA is still giving the same bureaucratic excuse. For its part, RISPA now knows how dangerous this chemical is, but they don't want to take any quick action. The fact is that RISPA does have the legal and administrative authority to immediately regulate dangerous materials like metam sodium. And again, when we asked that question at the last hearing, no federal agency volunteered that information. We had to dig it up and find out that, in fact, there were emergency laws that would enable RISPA to do this. Finally, 
the relationship between the Federal Railway Administration and the Southern Pacific Railroad. This hearing will explore what we consider a cozy relationship that appears to exist between the Federal Railway Administration and SP. When the situation develops that, one, FRA cancels a surprise inspection of SP because of the fear of the financial position it will put the company in, instead of worrying about the safety of the public to which it is charged to protect, two, defect rates of as high as 100% are detected but not vigorously acted upon, three, when violations against the railroad take as long as two years or longer to settle at less than 50 cents on the dollar, and four, when FRA officials are unable to provide this subcommittee with complete and accurate information on FRA inspections of SP, one has to wonder, is this any way to run a railroad? At this time, I would ask my colleagues if they have any opening statements. Mr. Zimmer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I think it's important to find out exactly what happened in this particular derailment. Uh, but as a representative from a, uh, from a corridor state with a major chemical industry, I hope uh, the ultimate uh, product of these hearings will be uh, specific policy and, and statutory recommendations that will uh, make uh, this a safer country in which to transport hazardous chemicals. And uh, I'm sure that uh, that's uh, a shared objective. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zimmer. I might tell you that as a result of these hearings that we had, the House has already passed uh, an amendment that came straight out of the last hearing, uh, where in the past the Federal Railway Administration would issue a citation to a railroad if they had a safety violation. There was no given time frame in which the railroad would have to make the improvement and remedy the problem. The House just passed uh, an amendment to the Federal Railway Safety Act which now says they must make that fix in 30 days. So I think that your concern um, is already being acted upon. And there are several other pieces of legislation that uh, I will talk to you about that I think you'll be pleased with in that same vein. I look forward to working with you on those. Very good. Thanks. And Mr. Herger from California, who's had a tremendous interest in this because his constituents are involved. I, I welcome you to the subcommittee. Do you have any opening comments? I thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I want to thank you for holding this hearing. There's certainly many questions that deserve answers. Uh, what is so very important is that we come up with the answers that can help ensure that this type of horrendous catastrophe does not take place again. So for that, I thank you for the hearing and look forward to uh, what we'll be hearing the witnesses later on. Thank you, and I look forward to working with you as well. Our first panel, Christy Osborne, Concerned Citizens of Dunsmuir, and Lynn Goldman, MD, California P Department of Health Services. We welcome you both and we ask you to uh, proceed with your statements. I would like to swear you in. I'm sorry, would you please rise? And raise your right hand, if you will, if you have no objection to being sworn in. You could rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give us is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Do? Witnesses have stated yes, and you may consider yourself sworn in. And please proceed. Ms. Osborne, concerned citizens of Dunsmuir, please proceed. My name is Christy Osborne. I live in Dunsmuir. It is a small, picturesque town with majestic Mount Shasta rising above. The Sacramento River Canyon, in which the town is located, is more green and magnificent than you can imagine. At first glance, the Sacramento River looks as wild and beautiful as it always was, but the river died. There was not even bacteria in the water. People are now seeing some insects and a few worms under rocks, and we all pray for the river's speedy recovery. For now, though, our river is not alive. Not yet. No one is sure whether the river sediments are still contaminated by the chemical, and the wild trout will need at least a few years to repopulate. Thankfully, a moratorium on fishing will temporarily give the fish an opportunity to return, but that still leaves the town in a bind. Tourism, 
and fishing in particular, have been vital to the town's economy. The town is built around the river, physically, economically, and emotionally. However, Dunsmuir is also a railroad town. Train memorabilia is everywhere. Generations of families have made their livings with some Southern Pacific. Now, sadly, the community is divided, and it is difficult for some to choose sides. When a 72-year-old neighbor has been rushed to the hospital because she can't breathe, it's hard to blame the hand that has fed your family. We all want to forget the spill, but we as people who have been forced to live in the midst of this disaster have changed. The spill affects our lives daily and will for a very long time. Most of our residents are worried about the town's economy. Will tourism ever flourish again? How long can businesses keep their doors open? SP can give financial assistance now, but what about in five years? Who knows what the future will bring? And the biggest concern is, in five years, how will our health be, or in 10 years? California, California Department of Health Services, Siskiyou County Health, and hospital personnel were all adamant that there would be no long-term health effects and that no evacuation was necessary. They said we had nothing to worry about, and this information was presented as fact. Now we have been informed that long-term health effects and birth defects are very possible. The, this chemical, metamsodium, was developed for chemical warfare, and without complete testing, it is being used by the growers of our food. Now we have reason to worry. When can we trust our public health officials? They have destroyed their credibility, and there's no way to take away our fear. Why were people not notified, not given the facts that were available, so that each person can make an informed decision to stay or to evacuate? Most people, if notified at all, were told that evacuation was voluntary and definitely not necessary. This included some pregnant women and senior citizens with pre-existing health conditions. Traffic on the freeway was stopped and rerouted, but if you were local, it was perfectly safe to be there. After the freeway was reopened, travelers were told to drive through Dunsmuir without stopping, and they were told not to use their air conditioners or vents and keep their windows shut tight. It was safe for us to live there, but it was not safe for motorists to breathe while driving through. When we complained of the double standard, the people traveling through were no longer warned. We had hoped instead for some concern over the townspeople. Our evacuation was said to be voluntary. Many people related to me that they always believed they could evacuate any time they wished. The word evacuate and the word voluntary do not belong together. Any evacuation, if there is a reason for an evacuation, should be mandatory. Most people stayed in their homes, either because they heard that there was no danger or because it made no sense to evacuate to a center in Dunsmuir. The town was engulfed by toxic vapors. City crews continued working downtown while a few blocks away at the high school, victims were being rushed by ambulance to local hospitals for exposure to chemical fumes. Women with babies in arms or strollers were walking along the river. No one told them of the possible danger. We've had at least two miscarriages, and many people who never had breathing problems now have asthma. People with pre-existing conditions have been hit very hard, and many older people are having a very difficult time. One lady almost died. She had recently recovered fully from pneumonia, but woke up unable to breathe. She was hospitalized, and after her release, she did not improve. A few blocks from her, an apparently healthy German shepherd died suddenly. Two children who live near the river have had severe peeling and cracking of the skin on the bottoms of their feet and on their hands. One man is afraid to leave his home because the rashes on his face and body are so severe that people stare at him with fear. Another man, well-respected, successful, and a workaholic, finally had to admit that he had spill-related symptoms so debilitating that he can no longer work at his business. And a 74-year-old woman, whose life revolves around raising her grandson, had to send him away for a second time, because when they stay in their home, they re-experience symptoms, as many people do after returning to the area. If a person had symptoms in the beginning, they were told to leave the area, but many had nowhere to go, or no money to get there. Southern Pacific told people to come down to the claims office and get money to leave. However, many people were refused and harassed. Admittedly, the hospital had no knowledge or little knowledge of how to treat our illnesses. But since Southern Pacific paid them to see spill victims, you'd think some of the staff could have refrained from making jokes about people's health problems. 
Southern Pacific is no longer paying for medical treatment, even though Mr. Mohan, SP's president, insisted that they were. And Southern Pacific stopped paying evacuation ex expenses as soon as the voluntary evacuation was lifted, even if people still had symptoms, and in some cases had doctor's orders to get out of the area. I have been told of numerous people being turned away from doctor's office or being warned upon entering the emergency room that you realize your symptoms aren't spill related, don't you? SP has gone so far as to return the hospital bills to the patients. Where is the medical care we were promised? There are hundreds of victims who are still sick. In a town with a population of considerably less than 3,000, I'd call that a significant number. We didn't cause this disaster, but we are paying for it in our everyday lives. We want to know why people are still sick. Someone needs to find out, no matter what the cost. Southern Pacific feels that they have paid their debt to spill victims, but how do you put a dollar value on the illness, suffering, stress, and fear that are now a part of our lives? Some people have lost their jobs for speaking out about the spill. Would those people still have their jobs if the spill never happened? Compensation for out-of-pocket expenses is fine, but what about our future? And what about the future of our children? The whole pesticide process is backwards. It is only common sense to test a product, any product, extensively before it is placed on the market to jeopardize the citizens of our nation and world. Are pesticides necessary at all? If there are alternatives, does it make sense to produce something such as pesticides and other chemicals that can hurt or kill people? The people in the spill communities did not cause this disaster, and we want to make sure that it never happens again in our backyard or anyone else's. One thing I'd like to add is that after going back through incident report bulletins and other information from the first week of the spill. Just wait one moment. <coughs> Go ahead. I noticed that the reduction of illness reports at the hospital was a factor in the recommendation of the voluntary evacuation being lifted and the river areas being reopened. I would like to clarify that this information was misleading. Although symptoms did decrease in some cases, many people stopped seeing the local doctors and hospital because they were not getting helped by going there. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you very much. Ms. Osborne, you can just wait there and we'll have some questions for you. Uh, Dr. Osborne, uh, Dr. No, I lost your name here. Goldman. Thank you. Please proceed, Dr. Goldman. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the Subcommittee on Government Affairs and Transportation about the toxic spill that occurred last July 14th. I'm a pediatrician by training. And as California's Depart Department of Health Services' responsibility to protect the public health, our legislatively mandated activities include response to environmental health emergencies such as the Cantera spill. There are three messages that I wish to convey today. The first is the need to prevent such events in the future. The second is that the public has a right to know about the chemicals to which they may be exposed. And the third is that when the unexpected happens, follow-up studies of the causes and effects, especially health effects, are important. When the railroad car derailed that night of July 14th, some 19,000 gallons of a mixture of metham sodium and water spilled into the Sacramento River a few miles north of Dunsmuir, California. Metham sodium is a powerful soil fumigant which is commonly used in California. On impact with water, it quickly breaks, begins to break down into several byproducts, the principal of which are methyl isothiocyanate, known as MITC, methylamine, and hydrogen sulfide. These breakdown products immediately begin to be released as vapors or gases and are all respiratory irritants. We think that in this case, the chemical breakdown process began right away, mixing MITC into water and expelling it into air. Data collected during and after the incident show that MITC quickly moved downriver and was present in large quantities miles downstream, probably within hours of the spill. Unfortunately, the speed with which the MITC and other byproducts moved was far quicker than the speed with which adequate information was available to protect the public. Today I'd like to tell you about the decisions we faced, the impacts on health, and how this event could be prevented in the future. Wait one moment. The, 
first principle of public health is to prevent adverse events before they occur. The Cantera spill was not an accident. It was an act of humans, not of nature, and was entirely preventable. Thus it is most important that a complete investigation be conducted and that steps be taken to ensure that this never happen again. Development of such preventive measures requires the examination of every aspect of the spill. Which chemicals are in commerce and what do we know about their toxicity? How many gallons are transported and by what means? Did the train have sufficient power? Would improved tank car design have prevented its rupture or slowed the spill? These questions are management and engineering questions, not medical questions, but are probably the most important for preventing recurrence of such incidents in the future. The second principle is to identify measures that can be taken to ensure that once adverse events occur, undesirable consequences can be prevented. What can be done to limit the amount of material released and how can we protect the populations from exposure once a substance is released? Was there any way to limit the amount of herbicide released and spread into nearby areas? We believe that the tank emptied very quickly, within a couple of hours, and too fast to be removed from the river, which is large and swiftly, swiftly flowing. According to our laboratory tests, the spill should have begun releasing toxic MITC vapors immediately. And there were no geographic features that would have allowed creation of a barrier between the spill and the town of Dunsmuir downstream. What could be done to protect the populations in Dunsmuir. Crucial to California's emergency response plan is the availability of accurate and timely information about toxicological and chemical properties of the material spilled. During the time of the spill, I and others in my department were responsible for assisting with hour-to-hour -hour decisions relevant to protecting the nearby population and emergency response workers. Yet, complete data about the health effects of methamsodium and its byproducts were not available to us in a timely fashion. The extremely important laboratory resources for monitoring the levels in air and water, measurements needed for making correct decisions about relocation and evacuation of residents were not available. So decision making relied to a large extent on incomplete toxicologic data, inadequate laboratory resources, and surveillance of emergency room visits by those from the affected communities. I'm going to talk a little bit about how the toxicologic information was incomplete. In the first place, metem sodium was not listed in the emergency response manual that is compiled by the Department of Transportation. Hundreds of thousands of gallons of this fumigant are shipped by rail every year and I believe that any chemical present to this great of an extent in commerce should be carefully evaluated for inclusion in that manual. Second, the material safety data sheet that is available in every workplace was largely inadequate. Lack of information about long-term effects and releases of the substances at high levels and poor quality assurance are the major, major shortcomings in these MSDS um, sheets. So even though an MSDS was quickly available, the information provided was inadequate. Third, because methamsodium is a pesticide, much of the detailed data about its toxicity are the property of the manufacturer. In this case, public health agencies did not have prompt access to very important information related to birth defects hazards of the methamsodium and possibly of MITC as well. The data summaries that had been prepared by industry for the regulators at the US EPA and the state did not include this information. The state of California had a toxicologist go through the files in the locked room at the California Department of Pesticide Regulation and did find that there was positive evidence related to birth defects. After we evaluated the information, we shared it with the public, but this was too late to protect the public during the spill. Three weeks ago, we learned that three women who were pregnant in the area have suffered adverse reproductive effects. Two are reported to have had premature births and one had a child that was stillborn. Were these problems caused by the spill? We may never know, but any parent who is placed in this situation will naturally suspect this is a cause for their misfortune. What about the availability of laboratory information to assess what was happening? 
Neither the state laboratories nor private laboratories had an off-the-shelf method for analyzing MedM sodium and its byproducts. Methods for analysis should be available for <coughs> chemicals and commerce in large quantities and for their breakdown products. During an emergency is not the time to develop these methods. What were the health consequences to the public? Several problems have been documented. First, during the week after the spill, six persons were admitted to the hospital for illnesses that we believe were related to spill byproducts. Three, a person with chronic lung disease and two with asthma were admitted for worsening of their prior medical problems. Three others were admitted for new problems, one with nausea, vomiting, and dizziness, a second with pneumonia, and a third who was a worker who was admitted to the hospital with a cardiac arrhythmia. Many more minor illnesses were also observed in the aftermath of the spill between July 15th and July 31st. The emergency room in the area reported 252 visits. The triage um, office in the relocation center evaluated 360 people. The most common symptoms that occurred were nausea, headache, eye irritation, throat irritation, dizziness, vomiting, and shortness of breath. In addition, there were many skin rashes. By July 20th, we thought that the river was ready for cleanup and levels of MITC were in the part per billion range. Emergency room visits had dropped off. Workers came in to clean up the river and much to our dismay, we learned that 21 members of one crew who worked in the river between July 21st and 22nd developed a very unusual skin rash on the feet and ankles. Even though the levels of MITC in the river at that time were, according to our toxicologic data, too low to cause skin rashes, we have been forced to conclude that under the right conditions, rashes can occur with these much lower levels. The lesson here is that the unexpected often does happen under these kinds of circumstances. Three weeks ago at a public meeting in Dunsmuir, we learned of many health problems that, if attributable to the spill, would indicate other unexpected toxicologic effects from the spill. In a sense, what we have here is an experiment in which an unsuspecting community was exposed as they slept. To evaluate these reports properly will require follow-up study, and the U.S. Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registries has provided us with some financial assistance to help get things going. But at this point, we're not sure whether these studies will be feasible, how many people were exposed, and will they cooperate with a government-funded study after what they experienced with the toxicologic data. During the next few months, we hope to begin the process of getting a study going. Our final concerns have to do with recovery of the community, not only from the medical consequences, but also from the impact on their daily lives. The community may be experiencing considerable stress as a result of the spill and the uncertainties that they have had to experience. This can cause symptoms, of course, during the immediate period, but can also have significant long-term medical consequences. Their attempts to recover, to return to life as usual, need to be fostered, and the efforts to restore the local economy need to be supported. In conclusion, I would like to again thank the subcommittee for inviting me here to testify. You are to be congratulated for your thoroughness in exploring the causes and circumstances surrounding this incident and for your concerns that it not be repeated. Thank you very much, Dr. Goldman. We have about five minutes to get to the House floor for a, a, a vote, and we'll return right after that vote and ask you some questions. Thank you. We stand adjourned just probably for hopefully 10, 15 minutes. <coughs> some more water. Mm -hmm. The subcommittee will be in order. Why is this not on? This isn't on. It's on. Is the mic on yet? Yes, here it is. Okay. I know these are really crowded conditions. Um, there are a few empty chairs uh, toward the front if people want to try and find them. I apologize that we're in this, uh, these crowded quarters. I welcome my colleague, Mr. English. And I know the others will return, uh, but we're going to begin the questioning. I want to say to both uh, Ms. Osborne and Dr. Goldman that your testimony is very important. Um, 
Christy, one of the things you said that stopped me in my tracks was that metamsodium was developed for chemical warfare. How did you find that out? We had some documents that some of our members got from some agencies in Sacramento, but Dr. Jackson um, agreed with it uh, at the hearing where Dr. Goldman and, and him came and spoke with us. Dr. Goldman, can you comment on that? If it was in fact being developed for uh, biological warfare or chemical warfare? That's my understanding also, that it was first developed um, during World War II and that was the original use that was proposed for the compound. So does it strike you as being, Dr. Goldman, as being amazing as it does me that a chemical that was initially developed uh, for chemical warfare wouldn't be on the hazardous materials list? It does seem to me, not only from that fact, but also from what occurred with the spill, that it should have been on the list. Do you believe from what you saw from looking at some of these injuries and discussing the injuries with the people that the federal government should act to put metamsodium on a list forthwith? I would certainly like to see that strongly considered. <laughs> I would also like to see an evaluation of the other chemicals that are shipped in large quantity to make sure that we're not missing other ones from the list. There is a, another list um, that the Coast Guard uses, which are chemicals that are hazardous when they mix with water. And uh, one of the proposals that the subcommittee is looking at is immediately having that Coast Guard list become part of uh, the, um, the other list so that, in fact, any time it's carried over land, they would be considered hazardous. Well, that's just for your information. We're working on that. Um, Ms. Osborne, when was Concerned Citizens of Dunsmuir formed, and why was it formed? There was a town meeting, kind of an informal get-together, the first time anyone in town had really gotten together, the Tuesday after the spill. And what we saw was a need for some group of citizens to form to represent the citizens as a whole because of course every citizen could not go down and and hit every meeting and there needed to be some kind of liaison between the city and the government agencies in southern pacific so that that was the reason that we were formed did people go to you to your committee to tell their stories or did they go to the town officials or did they go to both? I'm sure there were some people that went to the town officials, but the town officials were really not uh, wanting the information at first. I think they're a lot more open to it now, but they weren't getting the answers that they needed from the city, and we were doing everything we could to get as much information as possible and get it to as many people as we could. So I think that's why they came to me. What kind of, I'm sorry. Our group, anyway. What kind of reaction and support have you gotten from Southern Pacific since you formed your group? As a group, none. Um, Southern Pacific formed a claims office uh, to supposedly help meet some of the financial needs. And they have given some people some money, and they have given some people a very hard time, too. They've harassed people and intimidated people and said, well, bring us back receipts, get notarized documents, blah, blah, blah. They go and get them, they come back, and they say, well, what do you want? We're not giving you anything, we don't owe you anything, that kind of thing. So I'm not sure that they've been real supportive to the citizens. And what would you, you in your written testimony, you talked about some of the health problems. Um, and I just want to clarify, these health problems are continuing today? Yes. The ones you described, they're not yes. going away? Yes. Many people have now been diagnosed with asthma that never had a breathing difficulty before. They are still having a very difficult time and may have possible permanent damage. Um, there are people that still are experiencing rashes that never touched the water. This is just from the air. Some of them have gotten rid of the rashes and they keep coming back. Um, there's a lot of people that still have a lot of symptoms, and many people have gotten better, and many people never had symptoms at all, but there is a, a large proportion of people that are still sick. 
We saw graphic pictures of the hundreds of thousands of dead fish that have been well publicized and it's, we're all very hopeful that the river will come back. We had uh, one of the briefings I had, this is about the third one or the first one, a gentleman appeared before me and he just said, he just knew the river was going to come back. And he didn't know when it would come back, but whether it would be six years or 10 or 20 or 40, he knew it would come back. And I'm glad to hear there are a few signs of life and we're all going to work to make it come back and, and get this town back on track, if you will. Uh, but can you tell us, were any other types of wildlife affected by the spill? And how has Fish and Game responded uh, to those incidents? Um, there, were, there were a lot of animals found. Fish and Game could not say whether they died because of the spill. There were road kills of deer but whether they were caused from the spill or not, I don't know. What did uh, you say? They were what of deer? Road kills. The road kill. freeway runs parallel to the river, and it's, they're very close together. And um, there were a lot of dead deer the Monday and Tuesday after the spill. And that's unusual. Yes. We're lucky to see. Well, I'm not lucky, but I mean, if we see a, a dead deer in a month, a road kill, that's quite a bit. We saw five on Monday and three on Tuesday. Those are the ones that I personally saw. So there were, I talked to some fish and game employees that were working night shift one night, uh, the Thursday night after the spill. They said that there had been a bear found, um, many deer, many squirrel, some otters, skunk. So there were um, a lot of birds. There were a lot of dead animals. We had been told that fish and game would be testing these animals to find out if they died from the chemical but we never have gotten any information back from them. I, ho I hope that the testing has been done and I hope to get those results because we'd all like to know. So Fish and Game has told you, State Fish and Game, that they are trying to find out if these dead animals were in fact killed by the metamsodium. Not recently. Not recently. They said that there was no data available on the animals that were supposed to be tested. They told us that they would test them. They didn't tell us that they did test them. Okay. So we well, would we'll, like we'll to know. try to follow up on that. Thank you. The subcommittee has received dozens of calls from citizens who are concerned about um, the way SP claims officials have treated them. You talked a little bit about that. These calls cited such things as pressure tactics in order to get people to settle for the smallest amount possible and signing away their rights to any future claims if their problems persist. Do you know anything about that kind of situation? Yes. Could you expand on it a little bit? People were treated horribly. Um, one man that I know who got very, very ill, settled for $50, signed a full release. What happened was on the back of the check, there was an endorsement. And as soon as you endorsed the check, you released res all the responsibility and liability that SP had um, from the spill. So st another man signed for $35, released all liability to SP. Um, People were yelled at. Um, some people were not. Some people were treated nicely. Um, I, they treated me real nice, but they knew who I was real fast. One of the, the manager in the office, in the claims office, told me that he wasn't making any hard and fast rules and that he was making a judgment call on everyone that walked through the door. That made me personally angry because I felt that they didn't have the right to judge people. What they were claiming to do is weed out the people that were just trying to f make a fast buck and insinuating that people were faking symptoms. And I didn't feel that anyone has the right to make that judgment. Mm -hmm. The issue of when the town was notified of the seriousness of the spill is something which the subcommittee will be examining today. Please tell the subcommittee what you have been able to learn about how and when the townspeople were notified. We know the spill occurred at 940 and a Sunday. When was the first time the town was notified? Um, some reports um, were, I mean, it's real hard to say because many people were not notified officially at all. My official notification, I don't live directly on the river, um, but my official notification was the Wednesday after the spill. I got a letter in my mailbox from the city. <coughs> as far as the people that were out door knocking, canvassing the river areas, some were notified as early as 6 a.m. Many were not notified until noon on Monday. 
-hmm. that's that's kind of the range um, around 11 in the morning between 11 a.m. Monday and not until Wednesday for some others and some never and some never and those include people that live right on the river some were never notified and were in their homes Mm -hmm. and could have been notified Mm mm-hmm the subcommittee has learned that at one point there were plans to evacuate the town by bus because of the concern that the chemical spill would be hazardous to the people, but that plan was canceled. What can you tell the subcommittee about this? I know that the buses came to town to evacuate people on Tuesday night after the spill. And I know that I spoke with a highway patrolman that was getting ready to go knock on people's doors to evacuate the town and was waiting for news to get the okay to do that. And I know that he was told not to do it, and the buses left. The official reason was given that the weather was going to change the next day and that it wasn't going to be necessary the next day. But um, I know that a lot of people didn't even start experiencing symptoms until they had been exposed for a few days. Some people didn't get symptoms right away. They didn't get them until Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. So I don't really understand how that worked. What did SP tell the community at the first town meeting after the spill, Thursday, July 18th, about their knowledge of the dangers of menem sodium and when they became aware of these dangers, the night of the derailment? When did SP say they began to realize that menem sodium had begun to leak into the river? Do you remember that? Um, What I remember about that hearing was the direct quote from Mr. Taggart from SP was that they did not learn about the hazards of the chemical until the early morning hours of Monday. He didn't give an exact time. Um, As far as when the tank car was leaking, they didn't really say exactly that I remember, so I don't know. It seems like they, the one thing that he did say was that they didn't realize the extent of the damage until it was light, so. Okay. I want to thank you. I have a few questions for Dr. Goldman, and then I'll ask my colleagues for their questions. Dr. Goldman, you uh, talked about some miscarriages in the area or stillborn. What can pregnant women in the area do now uh, to calm their anxieties? What type of test uh, can they take? Is it an expensive test? Can it be done in any doctor's office? There is one thing that they can do, and that is be sure that they get prenatal care, which should include um, the alpha fetoprotein test, or AFP test, that is an early indicator of neural tube defects. Is it expensive to get that test? The test should be accessible for everyone. Um, It is a part of routine prenatal care and there should be some kind of coverage available for everybody. We do know that sometimes, and and I've heard from Chrissy Osborne and others, that there are people in the community who don't have um, medical coverage, um, but they should be able to get coverage from the state. Well, let's just, I mean, that's pretty vague. If a woman has no health insurance, and we know 37 million, 37 million Americans don't have health insurance, and she is pregnant, you're saying she can go to a state Department of Health and get the test? The um, State Department of Health has a special program called Baby Cal for pregnant women who are, um, do, do not have medical care and, and don't have sufficient financial resources to pay for care. Um, one issue is that there has to be a provider in the community who will take um, Medi-Cal. From discussions my staff has had with officials of California's EPA Office of Pesticide Regulation, that office has categorized menem sodium for moderate risk assessment. That means they are looking at it, they are looking at more studies and data. They say it may be taken off the market after January if additional data is not in, but that is far from certain. As far as I know, California EPA has not recommended to the federal EPA that menem sodium be immediately placed on a hazardous substance list. Should California and federal EPA be more aggressive in taking steps to immediately regulate the substance after what you've seen it do in the community? 
I think that both the California EPA and the federal EPA should strongly consider this. I don't know about the California EPA's stance on the substance at this I'm point sorry, in time. I'm sorry, you don't know what? I don't know about the California EPA's stand on this particular substance at this point in time. In light of the GAO report released yesterday about testing for reproductive effects and how little we know about the potential of chemicals to cause birth defects, should we be requiring more testing of these chemicals in light of what they can do uh, to a fetus? I think that routine testing of chemicals for reproductive effects should certainly be required. We've had a lot of concern about cancer and also about what's called acute toxicity. But reproductive effects um, have been neglected and we should have more concern about not only the ability to bear children but also the health of the children. An article in the LA Times on August 24th concerning the health effects of metamsodium describes one of your concerns. I'm quoting from the article. Goldman said she was most concerned about continuing respiratory problems. She noted that one of the breakdown chemicals of metamsodium, MITC, is closely related to the chemical that caused lasting respiratory illness in victims of toxic contamination in Bhopal, India." Unquote. Can you elaborate on the relationship of metamsodium to the chemical released in Bhopal? Yes, MITC is very similar in structure to MIC <coughs> and has similar toxicologic effects, although has different potencies. And the studies of people who were exposed to the MIT, MIC in Popol, um, many of them did have chronic respiratory effects. What we don't know is we don't know what the level of exposures were to people in the Dunsmuir area and whether there's a chance that these same effects would be observed there. But I think it's one of the reasons why a follow-up study is needed. <coughs> According to a story in the Reading Record Searchlight on August 23rd, you told an audience in Dunsmuir that the State Health Department would conduct follow-up tests on Dunsmuir residents' homes and sample water, soil and air for traces of venom sodium. However, you also said that the Health Department had no program to test persons exposed to the chemical for lingering health effects. Why isn't the Health Department conducting follow-up tests on the people of Dunsmuir? And what would it take to put such a program in place? Well, there, what was requested of me at that meeting was a setting up some kind of a medical clinic to provide medical care for people who had been exposed to the spill. And what that would require is some sort of provisions for emergency funding for government to move in and provide medical care under those circumstances. The way that the system works is that there, there is an agency that makes sure that the emergency medical system functions well and that directs um, the ambulance transports to the appropriate hospitals and make sure that the hospitals who are providing emergency treatment are not overloaded. But there is not a system for providing medical follow-up care. There is not. And the only way it would be possible is if there was some funding coming from somewhere to make that possible. That would be possible. Um, I'm also not certain that the attempts that were made to do this by the private sector were ineffective. One of the things that we'll find out when we conduct our studies is the extent to which people were indeed unable to receive care, as many of them have claimed. Well, I'm talking about the follow-up with people who had lingering health problems. Right. If we're to follow them, you're saying there is no program in place to follow these people, is that correct? Yeah, nothing other than the regular medical care system. So if there was a decision made by the state to do follow-up because they were interested in learning more about metamsodium's long-lasting effect, it would have to be a funded program. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. You state that, quote, the community may be experiencing considerable stress as a result of the spill, the relocation, the uncertainties that they've had to experience. This also, this can cause symptoms during the intermediate period, but can also have significant long-term medical in consequences. How is the California Department of Health going to help the people of Dunsmuir deal with these stress-related long-term medical uh, consequences? I think that our role is twofold. One is 
to provide the information that people need because I think lack of information exacerbates stress. I think that another role that we have is to document the health problems and again for the purpose of being able to let people know what indeed has happened to them as a result of the spill, what didn't happen and what they might be able to expect in the future. Doctor or, or Christy Osborne, do you know if there are any doctors in Dunsmuir who participate in the Medi-Cal program? I believe that, I, I'm not positive, but I believe that the doctors in town do take Medi-Cal. There is a Medi-Cal clinic in Mount Shasta. Um, people have related to me, however, that the medical care that they're getting there is not helping them. They Dr. don't know Bowman, what to do. Do you know if there are any doctors in Dunsmuir who participate in Medi-Cal? I think there are. Um, I don't know if, what I don't know about is the ratio between the numbers of doctors there who take Medi-Cal and the number of people who need them. Um, often in rural areas, we don't have enough medical personnel to take care of all the people who need care. It's, it's an overall problem. There's only two doctors in Dunsmuir. Mm -hmm. We go for our medical care to Mount Shasta, okay. which is six miles away. Okay. Dr. Goldman, this will be my last question. You state that, uh, quote, a crew who worked in the river on July 21st and July 22nd developed a very unusual skin rash on the feet and ankles. And you go on to say that the rash was probably caused by metamsodium, even though testing of the water showed it was present in very, very minimal quantities. Who was this crew? They were a group of inmates who were at a conservation camp, and they were sent in to clean up the dead fish in the river. So these were inmates in a conservation camp. Did, were they told that there could be a hazard to them if they went into the water? They knew about the spill. They were also told, along with the other work crews that were working those days, that it was, there was an all clear for going in and cleaning up the water. So they were told there was an all clear and they went into the water. Did they have protective clothing on? Yes, they were wearing waders, although they were in the water, many of them up to their hips and for very prolonged periods of time and their feet did get wet um, during the days that they were working. Was there a medical crew there to, to check them? Not on the scene, um, but their rashes appeared two days after they finished working. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Cox, do you have any questions of the witnesses? Yes, I do. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank and you. Thank you, Ms. Osborne and Dr. Goldman, for being here today. Our purpose is, of course, to pick up where we left off in our July 31 hearings on the spill, but also uh, it's even more important that this committee and the Congress work to take steps to prevent a recurrence of this kind of tragic accident. And I appreciate your directing your testimony as you have uh, to that part of our job. I wonder if I could begin, uh, Ms. Osborne, uh, by asking you, and I, I'm not taking these up in order of their importance, but rather in the order that you address them in your testimony. Uh, you stated in your testimony, uh, that the wild trout will need at least a few years to repopulate and that a moratorium on fishing will allow the fish to have an opportunity to return, but uh, still it will take some time. Uh, the tourism and fishing in particular have been vital to the town's economy and the town is built around the Sacramento River. Uh, is there anything that can be done to accelerate the repopulation of fish in the Sacramento River? Can it be, for example, restocked? And would that make sense? Um, everyone has an opinion. Um, the city council meeting the other night, uh, there was an uh, attempt made to next year put hatchery fish in certain sections of the river. Unfortunately, some people believe that if you put hatchery fish, <coughs> they will take the food supplies from the wild trout, and the wild trout will not be able to repopulate the area. There's many opinions. Um, some people believe that if you just put hatchery fish in a certain amount of the area, then people will be able to come, tourists will be able to come and fish and catch fish, and the wild trout will not be affected. So there's, some people say that you can replant eggs 
for the wild trout or small fish into the river. So uh, as far as, as me personally, I'm not a fisherman and I can't really comment on the feasibility of that either way, but everyone also agrees that the wild trout are gonna, it's gonna take a long time for them to come back and that's what that river has been known for is it's wild trout fishing. For sport fishermen, it's a world-class river. It was a world-class river. Well, thank you. Uh, you've asked a couple of rhetorical questions in your testimony. Will tourism ever flourish again? How long can businesses keep their doors open? What is your view? Uh, what's your answer to those questions? SP has been working with some of the businesses to give them some financial assistance to help them keep their doors open, which is nice for current losses and you can expect to lose X amount of dollars over the next couple of years. But who knows if the tourists are going to come back after that. Um, many businesses are afraid to settle for a certain amount of money for, say, you know, three years profit or four years profit. What if in five years the tourists don't come back? What if the fish aren't back in five years? No one knows. So that's a little scary. Um, it's a, the economy in Dunsmuir was just really starting to pick up before the spill happened. It's very depressed community economically. And things were coming around. Businesses were opening and, and things were going well. But I don't think anybody was on real solid footing quite yet. And it just kind of pulled the rug out of everyone's um, feet. Who knows what's going to happen with the tourism. If the fish don't come back, a lot of the tourists won't come back. Moving to the more significant effect on human health, uh, you mentioned that uh, while there were problems uh, early on with people getting medical treatment of various kinds, uh, at least SP was paying the medical bills. Uh, subsequently, uh, you stated, uh, SP is no longer paying for medical treatment. Uh, how did that come about? Why is that? Uh, and you also state that uh, uh, SP's president insists that they are paying medical bills. How can there be a difference of opinion about a fact? Well, at the claims office, uh, one of the claims representatives told a member of the community that had symptoms from late that night, um, uh, well, early Monday morning, um, she experienced symptoms. And the claims representative told her that her symptoms were no longer related to the spill and that they had no responsibility to pay those bills. Um, another man who has also, he had a rash from Monday after the spill, and he continues to have them. His bill was returned to him by SP. He said, Bill SP, now private lawyers are paying for him to see specialists. All he charged SP for was the drawing of some blood to be tested. That was all that the spill was for, and Southern Pacific returned the bill to him and said it is not pre-authorized. However, pre-authorization was not available. They were not paying. Dr. Baker um, in Dunsmuir has told a couple of people in town that if they can't pay, then they'll have to go up to the hospital because Southern Pacific is no longer paying. Mr. Mohan was on the Shasta Daylight Special, which was uh, sort of a fundraising pat on the back to help the economy. And the proceeds from that went to the different towns. It went to some other areas also, but Dunsmuir too. Mr. Mohan was on that train, and when he spoke to us, he said that they were paying medical bills. They certainly would. He wasn't aware that they weren't. When we checked after that, they weren't. People were still turned away and turned down for payment. To your knowledge, has the commencement of litigation affected one way or the other the relationship of SP and people who were submitting medical bills for voluntary payment? I, I don't really know if I can answer that. It's real complicated. Um, a lot of people didn't file suit with private attorneys until they could get no help through their claims office. I think most people were real willing to do that, but they were asked to settle and sign off SP's responsibility and liability and say, well, look, we're not responsible for anything that happens after you sign this. We'll give you 50 bucks. Um, in some cases, people were offered in advance. Well, we'll give you $200 for your out-of-pocket expenses, but if you settle now, we'll give you $450. 
um, one family who had severe symptoms. They were very, very ill. The entire family was given $1,400 and asked if they would leave the area and not tell anyone that they got that much money because most people aren't. Um, so there's a variety of things going on and I think they all kind of affect each other but I can't exactly explain how. With a view to using this tragedy as a means of preventing the recurrence in the future of similar problems, and in this case the problem of people getting paid for the medical bills. Are you aware of whether anybody's private medical insurance uh, has refused them coverage? Uh, anybody having trouble going to the doctor or to the hospital, turning in the bills uh, to a private carrier like Blue Cross? Um, only Medi-Cal is the only thing that I'm aware of because the first bills were sent in were paid by SP and even though the people had Medi-Cal, SP was being billed for them and the same people go back for the same symptoms and the hospital is billing Medi-Cal and Medi-Cal doesn't want to pay it because they feel it's related to the spill. That was reported to me in one case and possibly another but as far as private insurance, a lot of people in town don't have private insurance. I'm sure some do and I'm not sure whether that's been affected or not. Well, I thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goldman, uh, you have provided some helpful suggestions for things that we might do in the future. Uh, you pointed out that metam sodium was not contained in the emergency response manual that is compiled by the Department of Transportation. Uh, are you aware of any steps that have been taken since the accident to rectify that situation? I don't know the details of it. I do know that there is a reevaluation of that underway. Uh, you also uh, described how very quickly uh, metam sodium breaks into several byproducts when it mixes, as it did in this case with water, uh, principally methyl isothiocyanate or MITC. Uh, is that listed? The um, MITC, uh, I'm not Pardon sure. me, I should be more specific. Is that included in the emergency response manual provided by the Department of Transportation? I'm not sure of that. I don't know the answer. All right, and likewise, uh, hydrogen sulfide? It's hydrogen sulfide certainly is. All right. Uh, second, you pointed out that the material safety data sheet that's available in most workplaces was inadequate in this case. Uh, is that being fixed right now and whose responsibility is it to do so? As far as I'm aware, it's not being fixed right now. Um, the, the material safety data sheets are required, I believe, by OSHA and are compiled by the manufacturers. Well, subsequently, we're going to be hearing from the Department of Transportation and the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, do you have any questions you would like us to put to them with respect, for example, to the emergency response manual or anything else that, had it been handled differently in advance, would have helped you do your job? I think primarily those questions that I raised at the beginning of my testimony about the things that need to be evaluated in order to prevent these things from happening in the first place. Basically more engineering and management kinds of questions than medical questions. Well, that, of course, uh, we won't address uh, further to a doctor. No. But uh, I appreciate very much both of your being here and helping us uh, do our job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Mr. English. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I, uh, in reviewing your testimony and, and listening to your response to the questions, it occurs to me that the tragedy that uh, that you've suffered there is one that we will have to expect to be repeated elsewhere. Uh, we're transporting an awful lot of material around this country, whether it be by rail or whether it be by truck, whatever, means, aircraft, uh, some of it far more dangerous than, uh, than this material that uh, leaked into the river. Uh, we have hazardous waste, radioactive, uh, radioactive material chemicals of all sorts. And, uh, you know, simple odds indicate that this is going to happen again. That's reality. And we have to expect it. The thing I suppose that, that, that surprises me 
is that those who have the responsibility, whether it be the transportation system, whether it be the states, whether it be the federal government, evidently uh, has not done a very good job of preparing for these kinds of incidents. Uh, they, they don't know what they're going to do. And um, uh, there seem to be a, a lot of, of questions that, uh, that weren't answered uh, when, this, uh, when this accident took place. Uh, I guess, uh, uh, starting with you, uh, Dr. Goldman, uh, uh, looking at it from a, from a medical standpoint, uh, and, and let me make the point, too, I think we need to do this, that, that the reason I think we'll see more of these incidents, not fewer of these incidents, is simply because of the transportation system we've got in this country is deteriorating. There's no question about that. And the more it deteriorates, the more likely it is that we're going to see these kind of incidents. The more of this material that's being transported on roads that are less safe, I think, is going to bring more of this about. So it, that's the reality. So facing that reality, Dr. Goldman, how would you, uh, what kind of procedures would you put in place uh, from the standpoint of obligations of the carrier, obligations of the state, obligations of the federal government to deal with this in a proper manner? Well, for one, I think it's very important to keep statistics about these incidents in order to try to identify conditions that might be setting up um, spills. And that's the kind of thing like we do with traffic where we try to look for dangerous intersections and correct those intersections. And to, and your, to your knowledge, the, the, neither the state of California or the federal government keeps such statistics, is that correct? At least for this particular location, um, we, I heard a lot of anecdotes about there had been a number of spills there before, but there weren't comparative statistics that you, where you could say that you know, this is definitely a hot area for a spill to occur and attention needs to be placed here. Another thing is that what you said about preparedness I think is very true. And I think that preparedness has to be on very much a cookbook level. There have to be very explicit directions to the emergency responders about what they should do. Because during a response is not the time to bring in a panel of experts and have lengthy discussions about the pros and cons of options. You need to have a checklist, do A, B, C. And that's how you handle it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very much in, in agreement with that. I think you're, you're absolutely correct. Let me uh, ask you, though, um, uh, from the information that you've had at hand, have you seen any indication at all that either state, federal government, or the, the company that's involved have attempted to cover up these facts or any way to prevent information from uh, uh, going forth? Uh, uh, and, and what I'm talking about is more from the standpoint of these accidents that may have happened in this uh, area before. Have you seen any evidence of, of attempting to cover that up to prevent that? Well, it's too costly. We don't want to get into it. Gosh, uh, you know state, federal governments, we don't want to deal with these problems right now. I haven't seen efforts to cover it up. More, um, I'm concerned that I think there need to be more efforts to just meticulously track and document all these incidents in order to um, do the right analyses and figure out where the potential problems are. Would you characterize the uh, inaction of uh, officials who uh, uh, deal in this area as being as treating this being more of a case of benign neglect? No, not really. Um, I just think that when an incident like this occurs, that that can shock people into realizing what kinds of ongoing efforts need to be made. Mm -hmm. Ms. Osborne, um, uh, could you tell me, you know, what, what do you think, uh, in, if we're going to put together this, uh, this uh, book uh, to deal with these kinds of situations, looking at it from the standpoint of the community, the people who live in the area, you know, what approaches should be taken? Well, what I can tell you is what I saw and what I found out. Or what should have been done, I guess, is what I'm asking you that, that wasn't well, done. What I saw that happened was there were so many agencies involved, nobody seemed to want to make a decision. They had how many days before it went into the drinking water supply, and there were various propositions, and a lot of people really felt that that pesticide could have been kept from going into the water supply. But it seemed that people were just not making a decision, which in itself was a decision. And it went into the drinking water to supply. And mm -hmm. has it adversely 
affected people, you know, I, I really can't say. We, we don't get our drinking water from the Shasta Lake. Was it a case that, uh, that everyone was in charge, so no one was in charge? Well, Fish and Game was supposed to be the lead agency, but you would call all these different agencies, and, you know, I wasn't anybody important. I was just a mom trying to find out what was going on. And what I found was you'd call one agency and get one story and call another and get another. It was like the right hand never knew what the left hand was doing. There were so many people involved. I think there needed to just be one person to make some decisions. And maybe there was, but I certainly didn't see it, and I couldn't find out who it was because I had a hard time getting the information together. I think that was the most important thing because that just delayed all the processes. Um, and what happened was nothing. The pesticide kept going down the river and no one still knew what was going on for days and days. We kept getting conflicting stories. Mm. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Condit, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I have a couple questions, quick questions for Dr. Goldman. Uh, doctor, did uh, any of the SP workers suffer from any adverse effects uh, from the spill, to your knowledge? We do know that one of the individuals who was hospitalized, the person with the cardiac arrhythmia, was an SP worker. Uh, how is the worker now? I don't know his current status. I do know that he was in the hospital for a few days. Okay. I guess we can ask SP when they come up. Um, I do have an additional question. I'm curious about your, um, your testimony and, and your comment, and I'd like to read it back to you and have you clarify it for me. Um, you say the spill was not an accident. It was an act of humans, not of nature, and was entirely preventable. Um, that leads me to believe that you have some engineering knowledge of what took place, and if you do, I wish you would share it with us. Uh, my understanding is the study is not completed, and um, you have made a, a pretty strong statement that it was preventable, and I'd like for you to, if you can, clarify that statement and let me know how it could have been yeah. preventable. It's a basic public health principle that things don't occur by chance, that events like this have causes, and that when you have an event like this, it warrants a very critical investigation to find out what the factors were that contributed to that event occurring and to f look for solutions, look for ways to prevent those things that might trigger an event like this from happening in the future. Um, the kinds of factors that have been suggested to me are things such as the weight of the train and the fact that it's a very tight curve that the train was traveling along. Did the train have enough power? Um, it's kind of like if you have a string and um, you pull it straight, that it can snap. A string of train cars, if there's a lot of weight and not enough power, could that have been what made the car fall off? It's also been suggested that perhaps the tank could have been designed in a way so that even if it did fall off, that a leak would have not occurred or been slower. My understanding is that we are doing a, an analysis of all those uh, things that you've su just suggested. And, and in your comment there, you said could have been, uh, which leads me to believe that there's no conclusive evidence that any of the things that you just said was the cause. But you're, you've suggested that it could have been prevented, and then you've, you've given us the scenario. I, I, all I'm saying is that, that if I take your statement and your hypothesis, it would be that uh, all accidents could be prevented, and I'm not sure that that's the case. Uh, I wish it was the case, but I'm not sure it is the case. But I think this is a pretty strong statement, uh, given the fact that you have no scientific uh, well, analytical information to support that. What I am saying is that it's not like Hurricane Bob, where you know we don't have a way to modify the weather. We do have ways to modify how we transport materials. You may be correct. It may well be that after it's all said and done that the best engineering judgment tells us there would have been no way to prevent this. But all I'm saying is that it behooves us to do that thorough examination yeah. to find those factors. Well, I, 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 um, I, I wish and I hope there is a way to prevent this. I hope we can correct uh, these kinds of problems. Uh, but I think uh, Mr. English's comments was is probably where we need to focus is when we do have an accident, then we need to take action that is appropriate and, and actually does the job and protects the safety of the public. Um, 
uh, other than that, I, did you do any uh, monitoring on uh, uh, the comment about uh, medical claims? Did you have anything to do with that? And did you, uh, uh, Mrs. Osborne's uh, comments about medical claims and people being uh, discouraged to participate or to cut their deal and run real quick? Are, are you a, did you monitor your office, monitor any of that at all? We have no way of monitoring that. Um, we've heard some of the same complaints about how claims have been handled. Did anyone in California, any agency, take those complaints and check them out? The State Attorney General's Office, I believe, is checking those out. Okay. I'm not privy to that investigation. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate your answers. Thank you very much, Mr. Condit. Um, <clears throat> I think I understand what you meant when you made that statement. Um, given what we do know, that there were 21 accidents in that same area in 16 years, um, that we do know that metam sodium initially was developed, and I was shocked to hear this, uh, for chemical warfare. Um, we had certain facts in front of us that I think would have warranted a different type of shipping container uh, and perhaps the kind of corrections SP now happily says they're making on that loop. So I think I understand what you were saying. Um, I, I want to just say to Ms. Osborne, just one point. On August the 16th, I wrote Mr. Riley, um, the administrator of the EPA, and I asked if he would send a team of people out to interview the people in your town uh, to analyze what happened to them, because we're calling on EPA to move in classifying this, at least some of us are, metam sodium as a hazard. And I felt it was important for the EPA, the US EPA, to get a first-hand uh, look at some of the problems that the people were, were suffering there. Have you ever heard from them, uh, the federal EPA, in terms Not of personally, them no. calling you to find out? Have they done any surveys directly, the federal EPA? Not that I know of. Not that I'm aware of. Any other federal agency, like RISPA, which has the ability to immediately classify metam sodium as a hazard, have you heard from any of them? I haven't heard from them personally. Okay. I want to thank you both very, very much. I know it was tough, and I think that what Dr. Goldman said, um, it's very important that the town return to, to normal, and um, their attempts to recover need to be fostered. And I really do think what Dr. Goldman said is true. The most significant thing we can do is get all the information out there for the people, and that's one of the things that we're doing here. So the truth is known, and you put it behind you, and you move ahead. Thank you both very, very much. Thank you. And now we'll ask our uh, second panel. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, St uh, Howard Saracen, State Department of Fish and Game. Dr. Mo uh, I'm sorry, D.M. Mohan, Southern Pacific Transportation Company. Yep. Don Snow, Southern Pacific Transportation Company. Uh, Ron Martin, Dunsmuir Chamber of Commerce is our Next panel. I would ask all of you gentlemen if you could please uh, rise and raise your right hand. Unless you have any objection, I'm going to swear you in. Let's go. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you, and please proceed. We're going to begin uh, with the uh, State Department of, uh, of Fish and Game, Mr. Saracen. My name is Howard Saracen. I am the Deputy Director of the California Department of Fish and Game. I have been asked to come here today to provide you with information regarding the circumstances surrounding the derailment of the Southern Pacific train near Dunsmuir, California on Sunday, July 14th of this year at approximately 9.50 in the evening and the environmental effects of the spill of metam sodium into the Sacramento River. The other two areas being discussed by the committee today, the EPA's knowledge about metam sodium and the relationship with the Federal Railroad Regulation Agencies in Southern Pacific are outside of our bailiwick 
and therefore I will provide no comment on those. At 11.05 on the night of July 14th, our warden, Charles Novalin, was notified by the California Highway Patrol that a Southern Pacific train had derailed at the Cantera Loop. The location was approximately six miles north of Dunsmuir in Siskiyou County, California. Within 40 minutes, Warden Nolman and his supervisor, Lieutenant Matthews, were at the scene of the accident. They were the first to arrive other than the Southern Pacific employees. At that time, the tank car contained the medium sodium was in the Sacramento River. Initially, our staff were advised that the train car contained a herbicide and that a Southern Pacific hazardous materials team was called to the site. And sometimes later, they estimated that a small amount of the car's contents had spilled onto the bank and into the, into the Excuse water. Excuse me, when you say sometime later, what does that mean, approximately? Uh, the, the information that I got the following morning uh, by telephone call from the area was that when they first arrived, uh, they were informed that the, that the tank car contained a herbicide and that uh, being uh, trained uh, uh, to respond to hazardous materials, they knew that they should not approach the area without protective gear. Uh, they do not carry protective gear with them, so they stayed away from the car. And the report that I got at 8 o'clock in the morning was that a small amount had gone into the river. Thank you. Uh, Sometimes later, I mean, uh, we found out that uh, at first light, uh, people began seeing just scores of dead fish in the river. And that is when they first realized that this was a major, uh, a major spill. Well, excuse me. At 8 a.m., a small amount had gone no, into no. the river. At 8 o'clock in the morning when I got to the office, my phone was ringing. And that report indicated... That what they knew at that time, again, some distance from the spill, was that, a, that, a, that the train was in the water and that a small amount had been spilled. Later that morning, I got another phone call that indicated that there were now reports of large numbers of fish. And what time was that? Okay, I, I didn't bring, I don't, I but don't recall. But at 8 a.m., it was a small amount was in the river. Correct. At 8 a.m., a small amount was in the river. Okay, but you have to understand that this is in a canyon and that uh, radio communications are very, very difficult. And the phone call that I received, again, is now second or third hand information okay. that, that the warden is then you know, trans, uh, transmitting back to the field office. So there it, would be a time delay between. I understand. Okay. But you got a call at 8 a.m. that said a small amount had spilled into the river. Correct. Okay. That, that there was a, that the train had derailed that night and that uh, just a, kind of a heads up that this, this could be a big problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that reminds me, when I got into Washington uh, last night, uh, I was also informed that there were two other additional uh, uh, toxic spills yesterday in California from rail. I'm not sure you have heard about those no. or not. Could you tell me a bit about them, Th please? There was one in uh, Fairfield. Uh, it was uh, a tank car that was filled with chlorine gas that I, um, I think a valve was leaking on the car. And uh, I think they evacuated a small area and the tank car was taken, I believe, to a Clorox plant where the car was emptied. My understanding is that there was no, uh, no, no injuries from that one. And then they, there was a uh, uh, Union Pacific train derailed uh, along the Feather River. And a hazmat team was called because there was uh, hypochloric uh, acid in the car that was derailed. But again, I understand that there was no uh, or very little environmental damage. And again, that's just a preliminary report. And it's now about time I could call to find out more mm -hmm. information. But uh, I had, did not check this morning when I got up. Thank you. Uh, back to my testimony. The team remained at the site in their protective clothing while all others left the immediate area until more information was known about the substance. Here I'd like to add again that our staff would have stayed upwind you know, from the tank car and, and, and not approached it. At first light, the true impacts of the derailment were, were becoming clear. A significant fish kill was being seen with unknown impacts to other, other wildlife and human health. At approximately 11 a.m., the Hazard Material team reported that a rupture had been located below the water line, resu resulting in the spill of up to 19,000 gallons of metam sodium into the river. Again, my understanding was that the uh, uh, rupture was in the car below the water line and that the, uh, the, uh, the team had donned uh, scuba gear and had gone into the water and, and seen it that way. 
Local emergencies were declared and the emergency response systems were activated by the two counties involved in the incident. A, Re a Reading Emergency Command Center was opened in Shasta County because this is the area into which the river flowed and a Mount Shasta Command Center was opened in Siskiyou County because this is the area where the spill occurred. We began acting as a state agency co coordinator at the Office of, of Emergency Services Command Center in Sacramento and assigned key staff to both of the county centers. The purpose of the two county centers were to help meet the needs of both of the areas that had been impacted. At the Mount Shasta Command Center, activities were focused on the potential public health impacts as well as the ultimate removal of the train car from the river. In Reading, the center was focusing on the public health as well as the environmental impacts of the spill. We and other agencies involved began looking at the several options to contain the spill or to render it harmless. Unfortunately, because of the substance itself and the surrounding condition, none of the options considered, including damming, were feasible. You have to understand that this is the Sacramento River. At the, at the point of the spill, it was flowing at about 50 cubic feet a second. And that, that amount of water would probably fill this room in one or two seconds. So you're looking at a very, very large volume of water. When the river flows into uh, Lake Shasta, you know, 50 something miles downstream, it's flowing between 200 and 300 cubic feet a second. So it picks up a lot of volume in that time. So there were a lot of things that were looked at and uh, the team assembled believed that at that instant uh, they needed to, to find other options other than damming and, and, or pumping the water out of the river. Out of concern for public safety at 12 noon on July 15th, the California Highway Patrol closed Interstate 5 that runs adjacent to the Sacramento River after travelers and residents complained of discomfort from the fumes. With the two counties declaring local emergency, some areas were evacuated, particularly those businesses and residents close to the river. This evacuation included all of those who were camped in the popular recreational areas along the river to the mouth of, of Shasta Lake. Throughout this time, we and other law enforcement agencies and regulatory agencies were conducting an investigation to the causes of the accident. In addition, several entities were, were gathering information about the substance contained within the tank car. For example, the Regional Water Quality Control Board later learned that only 55 gallons of the substance would have been sufficient to kill everything in the river all the way to the lake. So after some time, we realized we were dealing with a very, very toxic material. And at this time, I'd like to, to reemphasize uh, what the people in Dunsmuir said about, uh, about the Sacramento River at that point. It is a world-class fishing stream. It's been written up in many European magazines. Uh, the trophy trout that are caught there you know, weigh up to two pounds, and they're, they're over uh, two to three pounds and are a couple of feet long, and they are just magnificent specimens. It was Wednesday, July 16, 1991, when the medicine sodium remaining in the car was pumped out and the car was removed from the river. Our involvement in virtually every aspect of the in of incident went on for the remainder of the emergency and continues to date. Our staff, as well as the staff of other local, state, and federal agencies, and many in the private sector, deserve our praise and recognition for their hard work. The second area that, that the subcommittee has asked CDF to focus on is the effect of the spill chemical on the, on the environment. To determine this effect, we have begun the process of preparing a natural resource damage assessment plan. The plan assessment is carried out under both state and federal laws. As you know, the damage caused by the spill took a number of different forms. As the plume of airborne contaminants moved down the river, all plants and animals in the path were exposed, as were all life forms in the river as the waterborne plume moved down it we observed that virtually all of the plants and animals in the river were killed instantly. Fish, algae, plankton, insects, and other organisms. It literally sterilized the stream. Many of the effects were immediately visible in the, in the form of the, of the dying fish, and of course the, the, the foliage began to turn brown and, and fall off. Uh, other effects have not seen immediate, however. These extended impacts are taking the form of animals starving because the river no longer provides them with food. In fact, we observe that the lack of food may be affecting the young of the year in some species. Uh, animals dependent upon the river for food are leaving the area in search of food elsewhere. 
thereby disturbing the balance that exists in those areas. The vegetation has continued to die off and may become weakened and more vulnerable to disease and insects. In addition, the lack of food may mean that an adult young do not have enough fat in the year to reproduce next spring. Uh, there was a question earlier about uh, necropsies that the uh, department had done. My information is that we have done uh, a necropsy on, uh, on one sea otter that I know of, and it was proven that it, was, it did starve to death. There were other animals that we found that were so badly decomposed that uh, we do not know the cause of death. Uh, we've also had reports that the uh, uh, ratio of young birds to old birds, I mean, no, is, is very skewed for this time of year, indicating that there, there, there may have been uh, problems with very young birds because of lack of food. But again, the, the studies will indicate uh, what that impact is. Each plant animal along the Sacramento River plays a unique role in the ecosystem. They are as interdependent as the structural supports which holds up a building. Major sections of the food chains have been eliminated. The animals that depend upon that food source are now dying or leaving the area, and this will continue. However, I did uh, uh, talk with staff uh, yesterday before I came down, and they indicated that there uh, appears to be a large number of insects that are coming back into the river and that the, allerg that the algae is coming back, which is a really a, a hopeful sign. It's not surprising that there'd be a large number of insects since there's no predators for the insects as far as the fish, the bats, and the birds, that one would expect to see a, a, a large increase in insect population. And hopefully, uh, nature will, 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 will work, it, work its mysteries and, uh, and will have a, a rapid recovery. As resilient as nature may be, many of the injuries caused by the spill are progressive and will be slow to, re to recover. Therefore, assessing the injuries resulting from the spill will be a long-term process. Uh, I know. Uh, we plan to release a draft of our damage assessment plan uh, in the next two weeks to provide the public and the responsible parties will have an opportunity to comment on that plan and we will make sure that the committee gets a copy of the plan uh, and give you a chance to, uh, to comment on it. Uh, while our focus so far has been in relation to the, uh, to, uh, related to the environmental impacts, we have also given some thought to legislation or regulation changes necessary for the future. We believe that it may be appropriate to have a large scale review of the routes that are used by railroads to transport materials such as met and sodium. Again, this is a point that Dr. Goldman had talked about, to do the statistical analysis of where the accidents are, where the routes are, and try to find uh, a safer way. Alternative routes should be developed or require that will result in the transport of these materials through less ecologically sensitive areas. And an another area we'd like uh, for the regulators to look at is to look at the impacts that the chemicals will have not only on public health, but also on the environmental impacts of the substances. Uh, Metam sodium, I think, is a, is a prime example that uh, the, the initial reports indicate that it may not be that harmful to, uh, to human beings, but is obviously very, very deadly to, uh, to an ecosystem such as a river. In conclusion, we support the work of your subcommittee and will provide relevant information to your office to the extent possible, uh, you know, given our concerns about, about litigation. And then I'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Uh, before we hear from SP and then Mr. Martin, I would like to ask you a couple of questions here because yes, they're fresh in my mind. First of all, I know what a terribly difficult job you have, and this is the second time I've heard you testify, and I know how sincere you are um, about wanting to restore this river. And I, the mysteries of nature may well surprise all of us, and, and I certainly hope they will, and, and the... Uh, the river will be healthy again, uh, and I know you're doing everything you can to, to make that happen. I have a very simple and straightforward question. You didn't know about any of this yourself till 8 a.m., is that correct? In After the morning, the spill? that's correct. So the spill occurred 940, and you, you didn't know anything about it, and when we asked your agency who to send here, we asked partic particularly for the gentleman who was in charge of the cleanup, uh, Warden Convalin. Uh, he was not sent forward here. Do you have any idea why? 
Okay. Again, uh, there's a, a, a team of lawyers that are w looking at all aspects, legal aspects of this fill, spill. That team of lawyers is made up of uh, city, I mean, excuse me, state, county, and federal attorneys. There's, I think, 20-something attorneys on this team, and they advised us, me, and the department that, that since there's an ongoing investigation uh, that may lead to some form of litigation in this matter that it's best f and that we have you know some uh, legal foundation for attorney client privilege and also uh, uh, a need to make sure that that information is, is kept confidential and so Who's that's the attorney client privilege here who what are we talking about uh, again I'm not an attorney but I understand that there are uh, uh, legal precedences that, that allow or provide for uh, confidential uh, conversations and confidential information. And we believe that, that this is one of those cases. And in fact, I understand that our attorneys have supplied the, uh, your committee with a, writ, uh, a written response that outlines that those uh, legal precedences. Yeah, well, and again, I'm not a lawyer, say, so I, I, I can't well, let respond me say directly. The subcommittee stands um, at a disadvantage not having Warden uh, Convil in here since he was, in fact, in charge of this whole thing. So I'm going to ask you some questions, see if you can help me. Um, what was the responsibility of your agency once you were notified of the derailment on July 14th? Again, our, our responsibility is to go to the scene yes. and then to be the on-scene coordinating commander. Okay. So once Warden Convalin and Lieutenant Matthews arrived on the scene and discovered a tank car containing a herbicide and a pesticide had fallen from the bridge and was in the Sacramento River, why didn't they immediately assume there was a dangerous situation and that's call it. the National Response Center? Okay. Uh, that's exactly what they did. They they assumed it was it was a, a hazardous spill. Yes. I understand that they then made sure that there was a hazardous material team dispatched to the site to find out the uh, the extent of the spill. And I understand that the the the, uh, the California State Office of Emergency Services was also notified to begin putting in place the uh, the structure for responding to a, a hazardous material spill. So they called NRC 118? Again, I, I'm not sure exactly, you know, what steps they took. But well, I'm asking you, this is a hearing to find out what steps they took. You don't know when and if they call the National Response Center, is that correct? That is correct. You don't know that. According to telephone interviews with Warden Convalin and other documents the subcommittee has received, Fish and Game left the scene of the accident at 1 a.m., after SP personnel said they had called their own hazardous material personnel and they would handle the scene. From what we understand, the only people remaining at the scene and determining the seriousness of the situation throughout the night were SP personnel. As far as you know, did any of your officers stay at the derailment scene with them? I have no knowledge that they left the scene. Do you know if they were there on the scene <coughs> through the entire time of the emergency. I was not there. so I, I understand not. that. I, I just asked you if you know if they were on the scene, okay. state fish and okay. game. Again, I do not know if they left or if they stayed, but I knew that they did arrive on the scene. Haven't you discussed um, these details with Warden Convalin? Um, who was supposed to be in charge I as to whether or not he left the scene at 1 a.m. as, as the I, subcommittee I, has I been led to believe? I have not spoken with, the, with, with Warden Convalin on that issue. So you were coming here to this subcommittee uh, to testify today on the issues that we alerted you to, but you didn't discuss any information with the person who was supposedly in charge of the uh, cleanup. Is that correct? I, again, uh, you, you wrote us a letter you know, requesting that I, that I come to the subcommittee, and uh, you specifically asked that I be here, and I, and, and I, uh, and I, and, 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 and I came. Uh, we had corresponded with you, with your staff, indicating uh, the reasons why we believe that, uh, that Warden Conlin should not, should not be here. Documentation of phone calls made to the Chemtrek hotline show that the material safety data sheet 
were sent to Southern Pacific within an hour and a half of the derailment and to other agencies within the area, including the sheriff's office. By the time Warden Convalin arrived on the scene from your agency, he was in charge, they had an MSDS that said menem sodium was a weed and a tree killer which reacted with water to decompose into compounds which are highly flammable and highly poisonous. The MSDS, again, that's the material safety data sheet, also stated that the material will release toxic fumes of nitrogen oxide when heated. So my question is, you have diesel fuel on the ground, you have material that becomes highly flammable in the water, you have material that is highly poisonous. Why did Warden Convalin tell the fire department to stay away? Okay. Again, I, I have no knowledge that he told the uh, fire department to stay away. Excuse me? Okay. You did not discuss the way Warden Convalin reacted with him, even though we specifically asked um, that you be briefed by Warden Convalin before you came here to testify. Okay. I was not aware that you had asked me to be specifically briefed by, by, by Warden Conlon. So no one I... in your department told you that we had made that request? That's correct. One moment, please. Records show that that specific request was very clearly transmitted to Ann Malcolm. I guess I'm a little uneasy about having uh, all the information about the spill and the hours immediately after it coming from the railroad. I mean, in other words, here is a state agency who you tell me arrived on the scene, but you don't know if they left or stayed. And I, mean, and that, I get that, no information. Easy, I, I, well, let me just finish, do, please. I, may I finish certainly. my question? We have a state agency who is in charge of this, clearly. And you can't tell us whether or not they stayed on the scene or they left the scene. And whether they left all of this to the Southern Pacific Hazmat team. You I'll, can't answer that. I'll be more than happy to, to check with the warden and, and provide you with, uh, with a response. Yes, I'd appreciate to, you do to, that when we break kay. and then come back. Because it's very crucial information kay. for us. And we need to have that. Kay. We need to know if Fish and Game was on the scene the entire time, or whether they left the cleanup to Southern Pacific. Okay. That, that's an easily verifiable fact. If I can, in fact, get a hold of Warden Conlon today, I will certainly make the effort. All right. Southern Pacific has now given us information that says the train crew and the first Southern Pacific official on the scene Gary Mayon smells strong odors coming from the overturned tank. Their testimony states Warden Convalin and Lieutenant Matthews of Fish and Game were also on the scene. Knowing how strong an odor this emits, according to our written information from EPA and others, can you tell us why Mr. Convalin, in conversation with the subcommittee, told them that there was no odor? and why he told the response center there was no leak. I can't. I, you know, I, I have not specifically asked him those okay. questions. If you would do that when you call him, uh, we will allow you to go and use the telephone back here. Now we have several questions. Did he remain on the scene? Did anyone from Fish and Game remain on the scene? Uh, he told us uh, there was no smell. And he told the response center there was no leak. Can you find out? He, he told us those things. Why is that in conflict with what Southern Pacific is saying? Before you left, what questions did you ask Mr. Con Convalin? I did not ask him any questions because I was not aware that you had uh, made the request for, for that briefing. Excuse me. Mr. Saracen, I have a deep liking for you as a human. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I have to express my chagrin that you knew from newspaper reports, you knew very much more than maybe anybody else in the state that we were looking at what happened on the night of the 14th. 
You knew. And it, it strains me to think that you could come here and, and just say, gee, I didn't think you were going to ask me these questions. I have a problem with that. According to federal EPA in California Region 9, both federal and California state emergency planning and community right to know laws require local communities to develop an emergency response plan. We understand that in the case of Dunsmuir, this plan should reside in the town of Reading and should cover a 13 county area. Does such a plan exist? I, I, I really can't answer that question. I, I do know that there was a, you know, a, an emergency response plan that the, the two uh, counties each, you know, um, activated their, their, their emergency response plans and that the two centers were established. So I'm just assuming that, that it does exist since it, it seemed to work and that uh, the, uh, I know that the California Department of Forestry, uh, you know, served as the command center mm -hmm. and that it was uh, a very, it was a, a routine procedure to set it up and establish this, these command centers. Okay. So uh, covering the 13 county area, I'm just, I'm just don't know. Okay, maybe you can check on that find out whether or not we have that plan. Is, is that a, fe a state law that requires that 13 county plan? Tell you. Federal EPA in California Region 9, both federal and California state emergency planning and community right to know laws. So it's both federal and state law. That's, that's Would, probably we're following the jurisdiction of the California Department of Emergency Services. Okay. So I'm not pushing on that. Okay, I no, just, no, I just... And, we just would like to know. Certainly. Would you say that California Fish and Game did a good job on this spill? In, re in retrospective, I would say that we did, yes. You would? Yes. How would you know if you don't even know if Mr. Convalence was on the scene? <laughs> Again, I think the, uh, the, the first, our first duty is, is, is public you know, safety and health in this situation. And even though there were and are or possibly some, you know, some, some health impacts on this. There were, there were no, you know, no deaths resulted from this as far as human deaths are concerned. And that uh, given what we know now, there's probably very nothing that could, be, could have been done to save the, uh, the ecosystem in the river, given that the toxicity of, of, of the compound that went into it. So even though you don't even know if fish and game people remained on the scene, it's possible that they got there and then turned over their responsibility to SP and left. You're willing to say you did a good job. Well, the agency did a good job. I, I know the trainings that, that our officers have. I know the commitment that our officers have. I don't and question all, that. And all, and all but the were staff. they on the scene? Okay. You know, I will be surprised if, if our staff left the scene. That's, that's not, you know, our standard operating procedure, and that's not by the manual. But until I ask that specific question, you know, I, I, I can't affirm or deny it, and that's, and that's the reason I said I'll have to check. But you know they showed up. Oh, absolutely. But you don't know if they stayed there. Uh, Is that correct? Absolutely. But you don't know if they stayed there. Uh, Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Let me ask you one last question. Um, Right now, under federal law, if a substance is a threat to life or property, it goes on to the list of hazardous substances. And when it's traveled over land by rail or by truck, it has to be carried in a certain fashion. Obviously, menom sodium was not listed as such and was not carried as such. Do you think, and this is an opinion, just personal, not the State Department of Fish and Game, it would be wise to amend that law to state that if a substance is a threat to the environment and could cause the kind of fish kill and destruction that you have seen with your own eyes and you have now talked about other wildlife that you're concerned about, do you think that that also should be a criteria for adding a substance to the list? In other words, life, property, and then we should add or threat to the environment. Oh, absolutely. I think I made that statement in my Good. prepared remarks that I, I think that that, that that should be another requirement other, you know, the, the, imp, the possible impacts to, uh, to the environment. Okay. Because the reason I ask that is that I do have a bill that would do that. And I think having this, your support would be very helpful. Um, 
So what I'm going to do is turn the questioning over to my good colleagues. And when that's completed, if you just come and see the staff, we'll take you to a telephone. And we can ask Mr. Convalin if he remained on the scene, uh, if he, in fact, smelled an odor, which we have been told by him he did not, and uh, the other questions that my staff will but again, it, again, it would not surprise me that he did not smell anything since, again, I know that part of the training when you respond to hazardous waste, I mean, hazardous spills, is that you make an attempt to stay, you know, upwind of the spill. And then also what I know of the area that the prevailing wind is down canyon at that, at, at that time of Well, we have the, some contradiction here. Okay, we have an SP official who says he smelled it. We have Convalin who said he didn't smell it. They must have been talking to each other at some point. And according to testimony we have written, this is a very strong odor. This isn't like diesel fuel. This is no, hydrogen sulfide very is classified strong. as rotten egg, rotten egg gas. So it's not, yes. it's not something that, that is difficult to smell. So in any event, you don't know anyway because you haven't talked to him. So you're going to talk to him and hopefully shed some light on the subject. Mr. Cox. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have questions for Mr. Sarasone and for the representatives of the Dunsmuir Chamber of Commerce and SP on the panel. I'm perfectly willing to uh, waive my questions at this sure. time, uh, permitting Mr. Sarasone to make his phone call and also permitting us to hear from the other members of the panel. Okay. Mr. I do have a question, Mr. Sarasone. He may want to call and, and get the answer. So, um, Do you have a uh, procedure like a piece of paper that when these kinds of things happen that you check off the procedures, yes, we did this, uh, no, we didn't do this, and here's the reason why. I mean, is it that simple? Well, You pull it out of the file and say, in this case, the spill, here are the things that we check and do. I, I, I do know that our wardens undergo you no know, specific training on how to respond to, to different kinds of spills. I personally have not gone through the training so I do not know if they actually have a checklist of what they're supposed to do. Well, but I do know that they're, they're given specific instructions on how to respond to those kinds of things. Would you find out whether or not you have a process or a system after an accident happens like this that the employee is instructed to follow these guidelines? And if you do, if you don't, you can tell us you don't. If you do, provide us with the uh, report or the documentation that they checked off. Either they did the things that the chairwoman's asking for or they didn't. You have. I'll, I'll be glad to, and if, if that's not uh, available, I'll see if I can't get at the syllabus from the, uh, from the training program that they go through. Thank you very much, Mr. Condit. As you go to uh, make the phone call, um, it is our understanding that a Mr. Al Matthews from State Fish and Game was mit with Mr. Convalin and walked exactly to the site with SP. So it might be worthwhile asking uh, Mr. Convalin if he knew if Mr. Matthews smelled anything at that point of the derailment. We'd appreciate that. Yes. And just do your best if you can uh, reach him. And we will make every attempt, if you cannot, uh, to continue to find him and talk to him. Okay. If, if Get him in front of the committee. It's 856 in California, so I'm sure that worked now. Good. Okay. We'll see you in a little while. and. Um, and I'm happy to welcome the rest of the um, panel. And we're going to go now to, uh, to Mr. Mo uh, Mike Mohan, president of the Southern Pacific uh, Transportation Company. Welcome. Thank you, Congressman. May I proceed? Yes, please proceed. Okay. Yes. Uh, Madam Chairman, what I have done here is uh, compiled uh, a few brief remarks, but We've also given your staff a 23-page chronology of the derailment sequence that's available to them. It uh, contains five exhibits, and I believe it addresses most of the questions that you've asked today. As far as opening remarks, we at SP regret the chemical discharge into the Sacramento River. Since July 14th, we have cleaned up the spill, and we are working with various government agencies to assist people and businesses affected by it. We are investigating the causes of the derailment and have implemented measures to help prevent simpler, similar occurrences. To summarize the accident for you, at approximately 9.40 p.m. on July 14th, our train 1 WCEUM-13, operating between West Colton, California and Eugene, Oregon, 
derailed at Cantera Loop north of Dunsmuir, California. The derailment involved the fourth locomotive and first seven cars of the train. Six of the cars were empty. The fifth car was a common DOT 111 type tank car loaded with metam sodium. It derailed on or approaching the Sacramento River Bridge and came to rest partially inverted in the river. The car was punctured in three places. Through these punctures, approximately 12,000 gallons of metam sodium, a herbicide, and 32.7% solution was discharged. The river flow rate at the point of discharge was approximately 29 million gallons per day. The car was owned by GATX and loaded and shipped by AMVAC. It was tendered to Southern Pacific by the shipper in accordance with existing regulations, which do not classify this product as hazardous. As a result, the car was not placarded nor documented as hazardous. Because of the rate of discharge of the product and the rate of the river flow, all of the lost product was probably discharged and moving downriver within the first hour after the derailment. The derailment site involves a 14 degree curve. It's shown on a uh, board over here to your right and an ascending grade. The track structure was good. It did not have any defects. It was not the cause of the derailment. The train had four locomotives and 97 cars, 86 of which were empty. The third and fourth cars were 79-foot empty center beam flat cars. They were coupled to the shorter loaded tank car, which derailed. The combination of these long empty cars and the shorter tank car over the 14-degree curve may have created undesirable coupler angularity. The train crew was qualified by experience and training. They were fully rested before going on duty. Their actions do not appear to have been a cause of the derailment. Although the derailment investigation is not yet complete, it was probably the result of a combination of complex factors. Among those factors is the combination of long cars and short cars. This have, may have been further aggravated by a possible momentary locomotive wheel slip, followed by a surge when the wheels regained adhesion. At the location of this curve, these events and circumstances may have increased the relationship of the lateral forces to the vertical forces in the train beyond a critical point, causing wheel lift and a string lining of the head portion of the train. We've taken steps to restrict operations in the area while we study the derailment and its causes. Some, although not all, are a restriction against long empty cars on the front of trains, a requirement for loaded cars on the front of trains when they are available, a restriction on the use of four axle locomotives, a restriction on the amount of trailing tonnage, this limit is subject to change based on further study and analysis. In addition, we have changed the grade and are designing a protective bridge intended to keep both equipment and lading from entering the river during a transportation incident. A sketch of this is shown on Exhibit A in our formal statement. We believe our cleanup and re-railing response was excellent. It was through the efforts of Southern Pacific that the chemical was removed from Lake Shasta. The California Regional Water Quality Control Board has said it is now not detectable in the water. During the cleanup process, SP worked with 60 government agencies. We cooperated with them and played a leadership role in completing the job. We've taken several initiatives to help the communities along the river and the lake. Some are, we have offered to fund the restocking of the river and assist with logistics if that decision is made. We have opened a community assistance office in Dunsmuir we have opened two claims offices in the area, one at Dunsmuir and one at Lakehead, and have settled over 500 claims. We have also paid for over 500 physical examinations in a community of 2,100 people. We are paying bills totaling a million four hundred thousand submitted by government agencies for their emergency response costs. So far, we have spent about two million on the cleanup and for individual and community assistance. We are working with the City of Dunsmuir on a public relations campaign to get tourists back to the area including promotional train trips, the proceeds of which have gone to the community. In addition, we will pay the startup costs of a computer database and library to have all current and future information about this bill and its after aftermath. Because of this chemical discharge, questions have been raised about regulations regarding the movement of environmentally sensitive chemicals. As far as we have been able to determine, we followed all existing regulations for carriage of this product. We are, however, committed to working with appropriate governmental agencies to improve the situation. Toward that end, 
SP is taking a leading role as part of the subcommittee of the Inter-Industry Task Force on the Safe Transportation of Hazardous Materials by Rail. This group, formed by the AAR and the Chemical Manufacturers Association, is currently reviewing the effects of design and construction of tank cars, commodity documentation, and railroad operating procedures in order to provide safer transportation. I want to thank you for allowing me to the opportunity to address you, and we'll take any questions you may have. Thank you. Did any of the other uh, SP employees wish to make a prepared? Ms. Boxer, they have no opening statements, but uh, right. let me introduce them. Uh, Larry Phipps is our general manager of uh, operations for the Western Region, which includes territory involved. Don Snow is our ha one of our hazardous materials uh, officers uh, who responded to the uh, to the scene. Oh, I have so many questions. Let me start with this one. The time of the derailment was 9.40 p.m. I'm going to direct this to Mr. Snow since he was at the scene. <coughs> SP continued to report for hours, as did the California Department of Fish and Game, who was in charge of the scene, we believe, that the derailed tank car was in the Sacramento River and was not leaking. In fact, SP, and we have looked at all the records, did not report any leaking of the tank car until sometime around 5 a.m., almost eight hours after the train derailment. Can you explain why, if in fact there was this smell and this leaking and this hazard in the river, why it took all those hours? Yes, ma'am. Our, our investigations have found that our crew members did report a smell, also one of our SP officials stated that they had smelled something. I arrived at the scene at 3.30 a.m. myself and another hazmat officer. We went down and assessed the tank car and in this period of time that we were there we did find a hole in the bottom of the car. We made some additional assessments and between 4.30 and 5 a.m. which would have been about an hour, hour and 15 minutes after we arrived, we did go back to the command post which was up the road quarter, half mile, and let the agencies know that there had been a release. So, there was a smell immediately evident, and yet there was no report made until 5 to 5.30 a.m., almost eight hours after the spill. Well, the report that, that you're speaking of, uh, I don't understand which one you're talking about, ma'am. Well, I will, I will show it to you. The one it's to the National made, Response Center? Yes, by okay. SP. Uh, okay. Ms. Boxer, I can be helpful to you on the issue if you'd like. Uh, sure. In the, uh, our formal statement on page 12, I think you'll find that. Again, a, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed what you said. Do, do you have that uh, available to you? If not, we'll be sure that you're furnished uh, additional copies. But in the formal statement, on the section uh, titled Initial Response to the Derailment Site, uh, that begins on page 12. And I think that. Um, to capsulize this whole thing for you. If you look over here uh, to the right, this is an aerial photograph of the Cantera Loop. And I, I think that can capture for you what kind of country this is. This is, uh, to say the least, uh, remote. There's a dirt access road that comes down at the uh, apex of the loop. That's basically the only access in there other than by walking up the railroad from, uh, from Shasta Retreat or from Dunsmere. So this is remote uh, territory. Uh, the radio communication is uh, adequate. I uh, wouldn't call it perfect. Uh, the sequence of events was uh, after the derailment occurred at 940. If you walk yourself through the chronology that begins on page 12, the engineer and the conductor on the train went back to inspect what had occurred. Uh, they, of course, are not hazardous materials uh, specialists. Uh, the incident was surprising to them. On their trip down from Klamath Falls the preceding day, they had seen what they thought were some campers under one of the bridge abutments. One of their primary concerns was getting down underneath the bridge to see if anybody was actually there. Uh, after they made their initial assessment, uh, they called the clerk at Dunsmere by radio and advised them that there had been a uh, derailment and that there was a car of metamsodium uh, in the river. What they had to rely on was uh, on their consist that uh, metamsodium was documented since it wasn't hazardous only as a herbicide. That's what they knew. 
Now, they smelled uh, an odor at that time, which was 9.40, no question about it. Which was what? 9.40 p.m. They smelled the odor at 9.40? Yeah, sometime after 9.40, there is no doubt that, that, that they smelled it. That's what they've told us. Now, the first SP officer uh, who got uh, close to the scene was uh, Gary Mann, who is a uh, district engineer, and uh, meaning civil engineer. He was in the area sometime around 1040. There was no question that he smelled uh, the spill. Now, our records indicate that uh, the Fish and Game Warden arrived about 1130, and I don't think there's much dispute that by 1130 or so, there was no smell. There was a smell. No, I, I don't think so. Not, no not, not by that time frame. And, and again, to, to try the, to nail this event down in terms of intervals of 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, that's, that's very, very difficult. But Tuesday, after the car was removed from the river, and the two holes that were below the water line were apparent as to size, and that's to be distinguished from the one hole that was above the water line that, was, that Don was talking about, uh, it was a pretty simple calculation to say that given the lean of the tank, given the specific density of the commodity, given the gallonage, that all of that product would have been discharged uh, sometime between the initial incident and uh, within an hour of, uh, of the initial incident. So I think, uh, although it's not a perfect reconstruction, it's the best we can do, that anybody who was at site definitely would have smelled it. Anybody who was at site within an hour of the incident probably would have smelled it. Right, Anybody well, after that, unlikely. Yeah. Mr. Mahon, let, let me say this. We have a letter from the United States Environmental Protection Agency and says, in general, these compounds have relatively low odor thresholds, and we would expect the odors to become apparent very shortly after the material hit water, a matter of minutes, and could continue to be detectable for several days for several days, given the large volume of materials spilled. You're saying that it smelled at 940, but it didn't smell at 1130? At the site. And what we have to remember here is that the Sacramento River has a uh, flow rate. The flow rate is roughly 50 or 60 cubic feet a second. Uh, surface speed is probably a, a mile an hour on average. And what that would tell you, if you knew the length of the plume, is that as it moved downriver, that there's no question that the people at site wouldn't smell it. There is no question that the people further downriver would smell it. Now, the Water Quality Control Board said it would take about four hours to reach Dunsmere. Under your scenario, it would have taken nine hours. How do you account for that? I don't believe the latter is correct, and I'm not sure what information you're referring to, but if the surface speed of the river between uh, Cantera Loop and Dunsmuir is uh, a mile to a mile and a half an hour. You're dealing with approximately six miles of uh, distance. Uh, roughly four hours is about right. Well, I have real trouble with this issue of the smell, and that's why we need to know what the warden Convalin tells us. But all I could tell you is at 3.30, and here is the incident notification report, at 3.30 in the morning, uh, there's a call from Fish and Game Warden Convalin to say uh, no leakage into the river, does not need EPA assistance. So can you explain that? I can give you our chronology. I can refer you to page 12 and give you the sequence Just, of events. Well, why don't I ask Mr. Snow? I'd, I'd be glad to do it. How could this be? I arrived at the scene at approximately 3.30 in the morning. And I met with Mr. Convalin and ask permission to proceed down to the scene. That Where did you meet with Mr. Convoy? Up yes. above the site, about a half mile. There was a temporary, what we call the, a cook trailer, or a trailer, a maintenance away trailer there. That was a temporary mm -hmm. uh, command post. Did, did he say that he had been at the site before? I don't recall. I think that he told me, that, well, Mr. Matthews was up there with him, and Mr. Matthews went with us on down to the scene. But did they tell you that they had been to the scene? I know that Mr. Matthews had been. I do not recall what. Did he Mr. mention there was a smell? I don't recall that. You don't recall that? No, ma'am, I do not. So when you got there at 3.30, did you smell anything? No, not from where we were initially. 
Well, do you think if you were, and I'm asking this question because I think it's an obvious answer, at least to me, if you were from Fish and Game mm -hmm. and you knew there was a problem and you had smelled something, you think you would have noticed the smell and said something to the person who came in who was in charge of cleanup for Southern Pacific? Think you would have said, I smell this odor. I'm worried about it. Maybe killing the fish. We've got to do something, don't you think? On my assessment, what we found out there was a leak. I immediately returned to the Fish and Game and Department of County Health and advised them that there was a spill. I asked you if you were from Fish and Game and you were now having your first meeting with the man, Mr. Snow, who's in charge of cleaning this up for Southern Pacific. And you're happy to see him because you're worried. If you had smelled something at that site. If I was fishing game, yes. You would have mentioned yes. it. Okay. Mr. Snow. Mr. Mayan's testimony says you went into the river to assess and examine the tank car and then discovered a hole approximately three inches by four inches in diameter. That is correct. Why did you go into the river? Uh, many photographs of the tank car show the three inch hole facing the land side and visible. I did not see it until we went down to the site below the bridge. And then we also assessed around the car, trying to see if there were any other holes that were visible. Mm -hmm. At that time of the morning, there were none. Mm -hmm. How did you determine how much product had escaped from the hole? Uh, your testimony also says no product was observed leaking from the hole or anywhere else and that you didn't detect any odor. That is correct. Looking from where the hole was on the bottom side, looking at the tank in the one o'clock position, that's where the hole was. Estimating the distance from the top of the shell to where the hole was, I am estimated immediately that there was a thousand to fifteen hundred gallon uh, release. And I conveyed that to Mr. Convalent. And you smell no odor? No, ma'am, I did not. I understand a California Highway Patrol officer had to go to the local hospital emergency room to get some pH paper so you could test the water in the river. Uh, initially, when I arrived there in my go bag, I did not have pH paper. He did go to the hospital and get some pH paper. But my associate, Mr. Saratek, found some pH paper in his bag. And you found no indication that the contents were leaking? No, ma'am. That's why we spent time going around the car. We went down river. We went across the river to, to pH the water. Okay. So you arrive at the scene, you get down to the tank and see a three by four inch hole located above the water line and estimate somehow that a thousand gallons had spilled. Yes, ma'am. 800 on the bank and 200 in the water. But it's no longer leaking, is that correct? We could not find any leaks, any evidence of any leaks at that time. Okay. This is the report that the incident command had and is the report that was now being called into various agencies. Now this was not reported publicly until 5 a.m. in the next morning. That was the first sign that anybody said there was a leak. Between 4.30 and 5 a.m. I went back to Mr. Conlon and to the public health agency that was on scene. So Mr. Convalin was not on the scene? When I say on scene, it's up from actually the loop, up the road, about a half mile, quarter mile. Was it the temporary? But he had left office? you, in, in essence, in charge of this? No, ma'am. He was not with Mr. you? Mr. Matthews was down with us. Was he with you the entire time? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Matthews was with you the entire time? He did not immediately go down by the tank car, but he was up on the bridge. Okay. So using the pH paper from the emergency room, your tests at this time show the water is normal just below the tank car, and so no further leaking from the tank car was taking place. We used the pH paper that Mr. Ceratek had. I'm sorry? We used the pH paper that my associate, Mr. Ceratek, had. Okay. And we found that the water got no readings on the uh, corrosive side of the pH paper. Okay, at 5.52 a.m., SP hears that people in Dunsmere report odor and burning eyes. And at 7.45, dead fish and the tail end of the chemical plume were spotted a half a mile south of SP's Dunsmere Yard office. That is correct. I was at the yard office at the time making arrangements to get contractors and so forth up there. I had a call from our Southern, Police, uh, Southern Pacific Police Department okay. who was with the county health agencies that someone had called in to them and had smelled something in their backyard. 
So you go back to the site, you re-enter the river, and again take a pH reading. Is that this correct? This was later in the morning. At this time, I proceed down with county health to this person's property, and we go down to the river. But then you go back to the site about what time? It was around 8.30, 9 o'clock. Okay, and now you report that. the car has lost two-thirds of its contents, spilling 13,000 gallons, whereas before you that said is correct. it was a small leak. So at 4.30, you test and say it's not leaking. Then at 8 a.m., after people report dead fish and burning eyes, you go back and test and report it is leaking. And you find it's just about empty. That is correct. When Did we you have to get more pH paper from the hospital? No, ma'am. When we went back, we gauged, we took a stick, stuck it in the hole, and took a reading off of the, uh, the, the material that was in the tank. So, if we follow the scenario, you know at 8 a.m. the car is now totally empty. <clears throat> well, it has one-third of liquid in the car okay. left. Why do you wait until 11 a.m., three hours later, to report this to the public and to set this emergency incident plans in motion? with all the various agencies. We were not hiding anything. This was I, I didn't ask. Okay. I just say, why did you wait till 11 a.m.? I mean, I'm just asking a question. Well, I, I turned this information over to uh, one of our environmental engineers who had arrived at the scene, and he was going to the meeting, uh, apparently uh, at the command post, and it was reported at that time. Ms. Boxer, I can be helpful when you'd like. All right, go ahead. Uh, first of all, I, I think that uh, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is what people are trying to do is respond and spend their time most effectively at uh, a hazardous material response site. Now, one of the things that uh, was very much on uh, Don's mind is as soon as they detected the original discharge was to get word to someone to warn communities downstream to stop water consumption. That, I think, was paramount on his mind because that's the first thing that you would want to protect. As far as notifications go, bear in mind that what you have assembled at this site with a, a command post created is all of the people who are beginning assemb to assemble from the various agencies to handle the site, uh, to handle the incident, both ourselves, uh, Fish and Game, uh, later in the day, uh, EPA, and, and others. As far as notifications go, and I'm not certain that this has been provided to your staff, uh, perhaps yes, perhaps no, uh, our first notification was to the uh, California Office of Emergency Services at 10.55 p.m. Typically, they will take care of notifying other response agencies. Uh, we also notified, as it became apparent, that there was something more than just a, a herbicide involved we notified the National Response Center at 1.20 a.m. Now, Don wouldn't know that. That was done from our Operations Planning and Control Center. Um, where's the dispatcher tape that we asked for in August? Uh, to Mr. the best, best of my knowledge, you have, and I may or may not be correct on this, you have both a written transcript of the tape and the tape itself. Well. We do not have that at this then time. That, it's simple missed communication because uh, I've reviewed the transcript myself. Well, we're going to put in the record. We were a little disappointed. We, we asked for it a very long time ago. Um, we, we haven't received it at this point. I was under the, the very distinct impression that... Yeah, as far as we're concerned, we were very clear about the dispatcher tape because okay. we knew it was going to take us a long time to uh, listen to it to check its authenticity, to do our own transcript, and we still don't have it. May I suggest at some time today your staff and ours get together and find out where the mix-up is. The yes, tape thank is, you. The tape is available and so is the transcript. Thank you. Mr. Snow, your testimony states you attempted to examine the submerged portion of the tank car after you discovered the three-inch hole. Explain to me what you did to try to examine the submerged portion of the tank car. We went around the car, on top of the car. We went across to the cars in front of it, the center beam flat, with lights looking at the car. We went to the far end of the car, as much as we could see visually at that time in the morning. What were the measurements of the two large holes that were submerged? Well, I couldn't tell at that time until we pulled the car out Tuesday afternoon. What, what were they? They were, uh, the holes themselves were probably about half inch wide and about six inches uh, long. How far apart were they from each other? Uh, they were fairly close within a couple of inches of each other. 
a couple of inches, okay? Was the tank car moved in any way or nudged in any way from the time of the derailment until 4.30 Tuesday afternoon when it was pulled from the river? No, ma'am, it was not. Were you on the scene the entire time? Just about the entire time for the first three days with the exception of night when we went into rest. No, I'm talking about the first, the first when initial you first day, arrived, yes, you said you left to go. I was there from, uh, when we got back from the Dunsmere office at around 8.30 or 9, I was on the scene the remainder of the day. No, no, I'm talking about what time did you arrive on the scene the night of the spill? At oh, 3.30 in the morning. 3.30 in the morning. That would have been Monday. And were you there continually between 3.30 and 5.30, for example? Or did you leave to go meet with Mr. Convalin or? Yes, ma'am, I went up the hill to you meet did. with Mr. Convalin so, at around 4.30. So you left the scene at 4.30? That is correct. And when did you come back to the scene? Uh, at approximately 8.30. And you discovered then, when you came back to the scene, that there was a much larger spill than you had thought, is that correct? Well, yes, ma'am, after being in town and, and the indications that we had gone with uh, County Health, yes, that is correct. But the car had not been moved from when we were there that morning. Well, you weren't there. You had left the I scene can, I can for tell. a while. Well, uh, looking at the car, the, the position of the, of the wheel uh, trucks up against the car, nothing had been moved, to my knowledge. What would have caused that, to your knowledge? What would have caused that sudden second explosion of spill? There, first there was a small amount, and then there was a huge amount that spilled. There was no second explosion it of all, It all spilled at once. That's all that 19,000 gallons. So that all the reports that we have that show just a small amount and then several hours later a large amount, that's incorrect. What I'm saying is my initial assessment that I had made initially at 3.30 in the morning that I thought there was a 1,000 to 1,500 gallon spill. Okay. How does this story explain SP reporting at 3.30 despite smells that you detected, you said, uh, and initially detected that there was no spill? There was they no reported there was no spill. We have that information. We have those documents. When I went down there, I had no smell. There was no smell. No, ma'am. Ms. Boxer, I... Despite the fact that EPA says that 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 type of smell would most likely be detectable for several days afterwards. There was no smell. And all of that spilled immediately upon impact. Is that what you're saying? That's what we're saying. Is there any scenario you're not saying that could have happened that you don't know about because you had left the scene for a little while there to meet with the fish and game person? A scenario of how the car could have been moved? Scenario that could have worsened the spill, caused the spill? There was no, no equipment there, ma'am, at that time. What time did the equipment uh, arrive? It was between 6 and 8 a.m. Ms. Boxer, The equipment I... arrived between 6 and 8 a.m. I can be helpful again when yes, you like. Yes, please. Go ahead. Right. Uh, if you would refer to uh, page 15 of our statement, uh, again, you have to keep in mind people are moving back and forth from the command post and communications trying to do what they regard as most important. What we've provided the, you, you there, as best we can reconstruct, is the names of SP officers who were in and out of the site that uh, can tell you what the circumstances were. Phipps, Kelly, Woodkey, Snow, Ernie Suratek, Melbo, Stone, and Castleberry were all present. I not sure how we can uh, can help facilitate whatever information they, be ha they may have, but they were all present uh, during the operation. Or if I could, uh, from Please. the time that uh, from the time uh, I got there about five o'clock in the morning, and I have interviewed all of the people that were involved uh, and, and that were there. Uh, our first guy there was Gary Mahon. He got there at 10:40, about 10:46 p.m. He had the smell. The crew members had the smell somewhere post 940 after the accident. Uh, Matthews, the field and game, uh, fishing game guy, got there about 1130. We had other people that got there. Our bridge, and, uh, bridge supervisor was there at 1115. He had no odor. So there was no odor, odor at 1115. After, th at uh, 1220 AM, when the MSDS sheet came through, and it was reported that this was a highly volatile type 
substance. At that time, Convalin uh, ordered the personnel out. And when they left the scene, uh, they didn't go back to town. They went up about a quarter mile up the dirt road. On their way out, our special agent Castleberry locked the gate and they went up to the what became the temporary command post about a half mile away. <coughs> Most of the people remained there until Mr. Snow arrived at 345. At 345, when he and Suratek went to the scene, they went with Matthews. And at that time is when they determined that there was no leak at that time. Whatever had spilled, they felt had spilled through the one visible hole because the other two weren't visible. The odors weren't, weren't apparent there. At 5 o'clock in the morning, there was no odor. There were fish, uh, at, certainly at 5.30 after daylight, there were fish in the water right adjacent to the tank car. None of that, that car was not moved. There was no way possible for that car to have been moved. And I can refer you to your photograph. Uh, a, as you can see in the photograph behind the, uh, it, could you move that one? That car was coupled to the flat car in front of it. So there's no, there's no way that it could have been moved post-accident unless that flat car was also moved. Neither the flat car nor those, nor those cars that you see derailed could have been moved because there was no way equipment could get to them. The locomotive that had turned over is immediately to this side of that picture, and it was foul of the track. So there's no way that any on-track equipment could have gotten to the scene. From the other end, if you look to the far end of the photograph, the rear end of the train was there, and it was there until about 5.30 a.m. And so no on-track equipment could have come from that end. At the command post at the top of the hill, they kept the, the uh, emergency equipment that arrived. They, they kept that at the top of the hill until such time as it was determined it was needed down below. That equipment didn't come into the scene until approximately 8 o'clock in the morning is when the equipment first went down. Well, I wanted to ask you that because we have documents that show that there was equipment on the scene starting at 4 a.m. When you say the scene, the scene the is the area. command post up the hill about a half mile away. There was no equipment on the scene. The first equipment on the scene was somewhere around 7 something in the morning. So there was equipment a half a mile away? Yes, ma'am. At 4 a.m.? Yes. You have to, if I can help with the geography, you have a command post just up the road, and then up at the top of the hill you have a railroad siding, Azalea, and there was a staging of equipment between Azalea, the command post, and the site. And what Mr. Phipps is telling you is that you just can't get to where that tank car is until, mm -hmm. uh, until other events happen. And you, can't, and you don't believe that the Water Quality Control Board's analysis, that that type of spill would have gone down to Dunsmuir in four hours, not nine. You disagree yeah, with it? That was an estimate, uh, that was an estimate on the part of, uh, of their engineer, Pedri. He estimated that the river flow at the top right. of the river is about one and a half miles per hour and in the lower river about three quarters of a mile of an hour. But if you look and if you calculate from the location of the plume at Sims, for example, 18 miles beyond, below the spill site and calculate the flow rate, it's 0.96 miles per hour. The plume was at Sims at 5.30 p.m. I'm talking about by the time it should have reached Dunsmuir. It should have so reached Dunsmuir. So you disagree Duns with the yes, water? Yes, it, it was okay. moving about one mile per okay. hour. Are you an expert in the movement of water? No, ma'am. Is the Water Quality Control Board an expert in the movement of water? I mean, I ask you this it, because I think It was an I estimate on his part. and if Well, that's what experts do. But calculating the location of the plume back to the point of derailment, it's about one mile per hour. The other thing to bear so in mind. So you would disagree with the expert at the Water Quality Control Board who gave the estimate that it should have reached Dunsmuir in four hours, not yes. nine. Yes, I would. Uh, the other it's thing a very to bear, big discrepancy. The, the other thing to bear in mind, Mrs. Boxer, and, yes. and I'm not sure that I'm familiar with what you're looking at there, but uh, at one point in time, the plume itself uh, stretched out to, by our, cal our calculations, approximately two miles. The other thing to bear in mind is that river flow rates do change. There's a change in the river gradient. Uh, there's also tributary streams that come in. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is that the town of Dunsmuir, I, I couldn't estimate how, uh, how long its exposure is along the river very accurately, but I would suspect uh, a mile and a half to two miles from top to bottom. So in between what people are observing and where they are observing it and when they are observing it may lay whatever the difference of opinion is. Well, I think that the expert at Regional Water Quality Control Board understands about tributaries and also He's, this is a five-hour difference in what they're saying and what, what you're saying happened. And I think it's significant enough 
um, well, to we, warrant study. Yeah, we would appreciate uh, being privy yeah. to the information too. Okay. Um, on August 23rd, 1991, an SP spokesman, Mike Furtney, said in an LA Times interview regarding the moving of the tank allegations that, quote, nobody touched that tank car for the first several hours. What does that mean? Uh, I would take you back to the formal statement. It lays it all out. No, but, I'm asking you to comment, if you might, on I'd nobody be, touched that ca tank car for the first several hours. What I'd does several mean to be you? I'd be very, very happy to, to lay out the whole thing for you. Uh, first well, of all... Well, what did he mean by that, is what I'm saying. I'm trying to get there. Uh, Mike Furtney is a public relations uh, temporary employee. He is not a, uh, a railroad <laughs> operating officer. Uh, he is also trying to do the best he can with technical information supplied him. Uh, the sequence of events about touching or not touching the tank car was, if, if you want to go back to uh, that other board, and I think this possibly may be uh, uh, what the concern may be, is that uh, if you look at the uh, box car that is uh, down the bank, the tank car, as you can see, is in the river. Uh, to capsulize it for you, that box car was moved. It was moved in a supervised state. It was moved to clear the bank, and it was witnessed and controlled not to touch the tank, and it didn't touch the tank. The other uh, piece of information that may be useful to you here is what is at the, towards the bottom of the photograph here are center beam flat cars. They're coupled to the tank. And uh, on Tuesday, I believe, uh, we uh, uncoupled the tank car from the center beam flat, pulled the center beam flat uphill so that we could get to the tank car and subsequently move it. That now, that, no, that was, that was Monday. Mon Monday. Right. Okay. So the tank car was never moved until it was uh, pulled out to... Tuesday, but uh, preparations to be able to move it were essentially conducted on Monday. Is that the, the gist of it, fellas? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. So you shoved down that box car at what yes. time? Yes, ma'am. At, at, at what time did you do? 8.30 a.m. At mm -hmm. 8.30 a.m. we had a 50-ton all-terrain crane that came out across the bridge and, uh, and we pushed the end that's up in the air uh, to the bank. Uh, that was at 8.30 a.m., and, uh, and the tank car was not touched. Well, how could you ensure moving that that it wouldn't fall on the tank car? Uh, from, from the location of the end that's, on the, that's already on the bank, the pivot point when it was shoved over was such that it wasn't going to come in contact with the tank and didn't. Mm -hmm. a and there were a number of us there at the time when that happened, and it did not touch. Okay. And, and so you were using equipment around that tank car around what time in the morning? 8.30 8 a.m. Okay. So uh, let me just get back. Mr. Mohan, what you're saying is Mike Furtney, the SP spokesman who was quoted in the LA Times, didn't check with you before he made that statement? Oh, you, you have to consider what was going on here, Mrs. Boxer. This is a transportation no, emergency. No, this is August 23rd. I'm talking yeah. about a long time after no. the accident. Mike Furtney said, and I quote, Nobody touched that tank car for the first several hours. And, and that's still true. Well, the first several day. hours, we've never said that it wasn't. In other words, what we're talking about is something happening in the hours five, six, seven, in that, that range, three, four, five. So the first several hours, Nothing he didn't happened. say nobody touched no. that tank car. To make it as, as plain as I know how to make it, that tank Period. car was not moved or touched until uh, Tuesday afternoon. Right. But he didn't say that. I'm, I'm trying well, to get to this. Okay. He said, nobody touched that tank car for the first several hours. I mean, what I'm trying to get, did he check with you before he said, that? This, is, this is months, I, a month I didn't, after. I didn't personally clear all press releases, but that's accurate. It's accurate that it wasn't moved for the first several hours. He didn't say it wasn't moved till Tuesday afternoon. That's my point. Well, I, I'm unable to comment on that. You're unable to comment. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Mr. Mohan, you mentioned, and I'm going to ask you this again, 
that it is SP's policy to comply fully with all governmental agencies investigating these accidents. And I appreciate that statement. But it's six weeks after we requested that dispatcher's tape. And again, I want to say that even if it did arrive now, as far as we know, our staff says it's still not ha it has not arrived. We have a real problem with that. Um, your testimony mentions how the train engineer attempted to inspect the rest of the train shortly after the derailment, but was blocked by a derailed car. Yet another SP employee, Mark Barnum, was able to make a walking inspection of the entire length of the train. This point is important because of the easily visible information about metamsodium that was on both sides of the second tank car containing the metamsodium. I'm sorry, could you okay. help me with the last part? Yes, I'm not sure I course. understand the question. Your testimony mentions how the train engineer attempted to inspect the rest of the train shortly after the derailment, but was blocked by a derailed car. Yet another SP employee, Mark Barnum, was able to make a walking inspection of the entire length of the train. Well, it would depend on which uh, direction and at what time Mr. Barnum uh, started his inspection. If he came up from the uh, Shasta retreat end, uh, obviously you can come right up. Okay. So he was able to make... He, he, he walked around and climbed around that, that car that you see in the picture that's crosswise that's up above. Mark went around that at between about 3.30 and 4 o'clock and walked both sides of the train. Uh, he was blocked, but he maneuvered his way around that car that you see that has the, that has a, the, uh, the route blocked. So he was able to look at the whole train? Yes, ma'am. He, he inspected okay. the whole train down to the, to the rear car at, uh, at approximately okay. 4 a.m. Did he see this? Um the visible information about metam sodium that was on both sides of the second tank car? He had the MSDS sheet that had all of the information. He had talked with AMVAC's chemist about the products of the, uh, about the product uh, and, and what its properties were and before he went down there. So he, he had all of the information that was available on the, uh, on the metam sodium. So at what point did he understand that this was metam sodium? He understood it at about uh, uh, 12.48 a.m., I believe, they received the fax of the MSDS sheet. At that point, there was, a, there was a, a discrepancy. The sheriff's dispatcher had indicated that it was a highly volatile substance. Uh, Mark called the chemist, uh, the AMVAC chemist, and uh, and discussed the issue with him, and he said that volatility was when it was in a confined area, that when in a river such as that, it wasn't going to be flammable and wasn't going to have those properties. Uh, he said that, uh, that uh, uh, you, could, you could smell it and it was an irritant, and based upon that, when they got ready to move the rear portion of the train at about 4 o'clock in the morning, Mark walked down. Mark at uh, down about uh, a mile, uh, uh, met up with the, the crew that was coming up to get the rear of the train. Okay, just so you understand, we have the Chemtrek incident report here. It shows that 11.14, uh, that information was in the hands of SP, that, and not 12.48. That might be. I, I, I read the time off the fax copy where it has a transmittal time, and, and I don't know what, what time zones, if that's a fact. But uh, I do know that Chemtrek was notified. So essentially, if, if you believe this incident report, an hour and a half into the accident, you knew what spilled. You knew it was metam sodium. We knew it was, yeah. we, we knew it was a weed killer, uh, metam sodium. You knew it was metam sodium because you, yes. you actually had the material safety data sheet which said it was poisonous and flammable. At 12, 12.48 At 11.14. According to this, an hour and a half in two. When we come back, we're going to ask, since you knew it, you smelled it, you knew something was there, we, we want to understand, you know, why the rest of it took so long. So we'll be back, and uh, after we vote, stand adjourned for about 10, 15 minutes. There you have the camera track notification. Okay, we're going to reconvene and uh, move along. 
I'm going to continue this issue of movement of the car with the next panel. And right now, for the purposes of continuing this, I'm going to take your scenario, your own scenario that you've agreed to, that as soon as this derailment occurred, the people, SP employees, said it was a horrible smell, it was a bad smell, that 1114, you knew that this was worse than a weed killer. You knew the properties of menom sodium because you had them. You had the material safety data sheet. And yet, as we understand it, the first time you even reported this was 3.30 a.m. or thereabouts. How can you explain that since it had a horrible smell initially and at 11.14, you knew what it was. It took you all those hours. And that the public downstream didn't know this for many, many hours. Can I be of assistance to you here, Mrs. Boxer, perhaps as an overview? The, uh... I don't want an overview. I want to know USP had the information at 11.14. You knew what this stuff was. You had the material safety data sheet, which which warns about it. You knew it was a horrible smell. You said yourself it spilled on the derailment, the minute it derailed. Your people warned of the smell, which we didn't know until recently, but that's your scenario. What took you so long to report this? Here are the reporting times uh, that our people have compiled. The California Office of Emergency Service, 10.55 p.m. 10.58 p.m. to the Siskiyou County Sheriff, although there was no answer initially. 11.15 p.m. to Chemtrek. 1.20 a.m. to the National Response Center. I think what you have to keep in mind here is in terms of subsequent notifications that Fish and Game and the beginning of other officials uh, were beginning to uh, congregate at this command post in this period of time. As far as the MSDS sheet goes, uh, I don't think any of us can particularly relate to what 1114 is, whether that's a okay. fax time or we, we simply don't, don't know what well, it means. Well, what did you tell the response center at after 1 o'clock in the morning? What did you tell them? Uh, what I have here is what our operations planning and control center did, which was to notify uh, Mr. Decker uh, of the NRC that we had had a spill and precisely what uh, we told him at that time, I don't know. Well, I have what you told him. You told him there was nothing in the water. Well, nothing I've, spilled. Again, we haven't seen that uh, haven't seen that document. But what what you need to appreciate, I think, is that there was or this site is uh, as you see uh, remote. <coughs> Communications are difficult, and events are evolving. You have an on-site command center. You have an operations planning and control center in San Francisco and a dispatcher's office in Roseville that contact the relevant agencies just as quickly as they can and tell them what they know at the time. Well, I mean, I just... Uh, well, you haven't seen this report, <coughs> right? This is the report from your person, Carl Frost, mm -hmm. Assistant Manager of Operations, Southern Pacific Transportation Company. At 1.18 Pacific time, no, nothing spilled. Okay, and nothing that would in the be, water. That would now, be you said there was, your own people said there was a horrific smell. You said at 11.18, you had the manifest. At 1 o'clock, you report nothing's in the water. I don't understand it. Right. At 3.30, there's another report, no leakage. So... You're testifying here that there was an immediate smell. Wait, wait, You're testifying here, that you knew at 11.18 what was in the water, and, and yet you didn't act. And here. I don't understand it, frankly. Let, let me take it piece by piece for you. Well, I've done it piece by piece, but you can go ahead okay. and try. What uh, the people who were on the scene first, obviously, was the train crew. Right. They did smell an odor. What they knew at the time, based on their 
manifest was that the car was metamsodium and not classified as hazardous. They knew it was a herbicide. They have what no, did they say about the smell? They have no knowledge of what, uh, what, its, what its characteristics or properties are. Uh, and what they told us is that they did smell an odor. Now, uh, apparently the odor wasn't so compelling as to cause them to leave immediately, although a few minutes after the incident, they, uh, they did decide uh, to, uh, to move away from the site. That's what they've told us. Then after that incident occurs, what happens is that in sequence, the train crew notified the clerk at Dunsmere where radio communication was available. He in turn notified the train dispatcher at Roseville who in turn notified operations planning and control. And then operations planning and control in San Francisco is whose responsibility it is to notify the agencies, notified them in the order that I gave you. Now, feed yourself back to the scene here. What you have is an evolution of events. At roughly 3.15 in the morning, Don Snow, who is the hazardous materials officer, does know how to deal with an MSDS sheet, uh, arrives at the scene, makes his inspection, and then makes his conclusions. And who he notifies first is the people that are in a position to do what he regarded as the most important thing, which is stop downstream water consumption. After that was done, then with fish and game there, and I'm not sure what other agencies may have been there by that time, but essentially we had people on site to deal with and upstream notifications to OPNC okay. and updates to the other let agencies. Me, let me were interrupt made. you here. You said that your crews, now I'm trying to get with your story, and I'm trying to accept it for purposes of moving on. Right. I mean, this, this subcommittee is going to continue to pursue some things we find very unusual, but we're going to take your story, mm -hmm. your own documents. Now you say the train crew said the odor wasn't compelling. No, I didn't say that. Well, I didn't I say that that's what they I'll said. I'll have to ask him to play it back. I mean, uh, could you tell me what he said? I'd, I'd be. If you will. Thank you. We'll take a little pause here because it's hard for you. He just said it shortly, but just take your time. They had no knowledge of what its characteristics or properties are. And what they told us is that they did smell an odor. Now apparently the odor wasn't so compelling as to cause them to leave immediately. Although a few minutes after the incident, they did decide to move away from the... Okay. The, the odor wasn't so compelling that it, okay. Now, according to your own records here, you say that at 1014, one of these people who was at the scene said, I don't know what weed killer does, but uh, but that one tank that is in the river there, boy, the fumes are pretty strong. And you might watch it if you walk up on it. I don't know if it affects people or not. Okay, the, the document and the time that you're alluding to, I'm not familiar with. Okay. SP, your transcript of the tape that we haven't gotten yet. Oh, we okay. just got it. Just okay. arrived. Dispatch a tape. Just arrived via Federal Express from SP. Now, I have, this is the transcript. Yeah, I have the transcript as, as well, although I can't say I have it in my own possession. Well, I mean, I'm reading it to you, sir. I would never, ever, ever tell you something I'm not reading. I don't know what weed killer does, uh, but that one tank that is in the river there, boy, the fumes are pretty strong, and you might watch it if you walk up on it. I don't know if it affects people or not. Well, that would, Mrs. Boxer, I, I could only guess until I read the, the transcript myself, but I think that would comport that uh, has the sound of either an engineman or a conductor telling you what he sees is, yes. and what he's beginning to smell when he's on the site. Yes. So what I'm saying is it doesn't sound to me that the smell, if this is all what happened, and I'm accepting your word for now that this is exactly what happened, mm -hmm. 
that it was a compelling odor, you put together your hazmat people, no, you are putting together a t report of a terrible smell, the fact that 1114, you knew what it was, you had the data that showed what it could do. At one o'clock, you call and say to the national response team, and this is a document I'll send over to you, it's an incident report, nothing spilled. It doesn't add up. Well, I can take you through it again if you'd like, and uh, then I don't know what else I can, can reasonably add. Why did, was it reported that there was no spill? Again. At 1 a.m.? I'm not familiar with the docu document. Well, could we but, send this document over to the But my team? assumption would be that our Operations Planning and Control Center in San Francisco, which is remote from Dunsmuir by some 350 miles, reported to the uh, National Response Center information transmitted from the field as soon as that information was transmitted to it. At 10.52, there's now, another... Now, there, there's one more that I'd, I'd like to follow up on here. Remember now that in terms of what Mr. Snow is telling you over here is that it's uh, roughly 3.15, 3.30 in the morning before he, who is the hazardous material <laughs> expert, determines that there has been a spill. That train crew or that engine crew don't see anything, don't know anything, are the hazardous materials experts. What they know is they smell something. Well, this tape um, transcript says some other interesting things. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to make sure I can identify these people. K.H. Eugene Yardmaster. I hear you screwing up down there again, dispatcher. Yeah, done it big this time. Eugene Yardmaster, is that right? Where, Cantara? Dispatcher, Cantara, yeah. Got seven cars, an engine on its side, leaking fuel. A uh, tank car with weed killers sitting in the river. Response, O, S, blank, blank, T. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's more. <laughs> <laughs> Bad deal. Dispatcher, yeah. Well, now no one can find out what in the hell's in this car. The train doesn't even show that it's dangerous. It doesn't show it's dangerous. It doesn't show it's a K train or nothing. And these guys are saying the fumes are so damn bad down there that Mahon could smell it before he even got down there just driving in. Eugene Yardmaster, KH. You know, we were just talking about it when I came in here. You know, we had a train come in here to Eugene last week, a BN, with two Class A explosive bombs. Crew brought it all the way down here, and there was absolutely no paperwork whatsoever in that stuff. Yep. I think that this is a very important document that we're going to have to look over and, and talk to you about some more. But obviously, this taking your scenario, taking this transcript, horrible smell, Still reporting at 1 o'clock, nothing in the river. I've got a lot of questions about what happened. I don't know why you uh, chose not to tell the response team that anything was wrong at 1 o'clock, saying that there was no, uh, the response center, there was nothing spilled at that time, okay. and hours later until you did it. It seems to me either, either it didn't happen right away, it happened later, and then you called the minute you knew it did, or... It happened right away, and you didn't want to tell anyone about it. That's where I'm left. And in either scenario, it raises some very disturbing questions to me. Taking your scenario, there should have been much more prompt action. Taking a scenario that the car might have been lifted or moved in any way, um, that's a whole other set of problems. I want to move may, on. May to, I help you with that yes, tape? You, you okay. want to help me with it, All or right. you want to correct me? Go right, right. ahead. Here, here is what you're hearing. First of all, uh, our apologies for the fact that we do have working men and women. Sometimes their language can be a little bit colorful. I respect them more than I could ever tell you. All right. As far as, far as what you heard there, uh, you heard a side phone conversation between a uh, trick dispatcher, meaning the fellow that actually lines the routes, and the general yard master in Eugene, Oregon, some 300 uh, miles distant, 
and what they were doing while the hazardous materials experts, the chief dispatchers, were gearing up to handle the incident was uh, perhaps, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, relieving a little bit of the, the tension themselves. But at any rate, we investigated what was on the tape as far as that uh, uh, misstatement about uh, Class A explosives. Uh, I think that was just a little bit of uh, railroad uh, uh, bar uh, rumor. Uh, when we investigated it, the train in question had all the documentation for Class A and, uh, explosives, and it was simply a, a misinformation on the part of the yardmaster. And as far as the sequence of events on movement of the car and information, it's, it's basically what we can tell you is, is what's here. Okay. Uh, Mr. Martin, welcome. Thank you. My name is Ron Martin. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Mr. Condit, did you have questions? Uh, Mr. Fine. Mr. Martin. I'm a resident of Dunsmere and a member of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, and I'd like to thank you for having us here to speak today. The specific purpose of the Dunsmere Chamber of Commerce is to promote harmony in the business community discover ways to increase the economic growth of our businesses and the community at large, and improve the quality of life for all citizens of Dunsmere. To achieve these goals, the Chamber works with community leaders to identify the needs of both the business community and all the residents of Dunsmere. The Chamber provides leadership to assist in reaching these goals. The Chamber also advertises Dunsmere throughout California and other strategic areas to attract tourism and new residents for the area. Therefore, the Chamber of Commerce is interested in all aspects of the July 14th toxic spill. Due to our five-minute uh, time limitation, uh, we have limited our testimony to two of the most pertinent issues, the general health of the citizens of Dunsmere, the perceived health issue and its effect on our economy, and a brief update on Southern Pacific's uh, restitution plan to the Chamber of Commerce. According to Dr. William Baker, one of our local physicians who practices family medicine and surgery, there are two notable aspects of the spill. One, actual contact with the metamsodium, and two, the vapors produced by metamsodium when mixed with water. Out of the 70 patients that Dr. Baker examined, only two of the patients were in direct contact with metamsodium. One of the patients was a hobo that was traveling through the area and actually drank a small amount of the water out of the river. The other patient was walking in the river with his boots on. Both have recovered. The remainder of the patients were exposed to the vapor of the chemical. They had symptoms of irritation to the respiratory tree, mucous membranes of the mouth, or eyelids. Only 10% of the patients had a slight amount of nausea. It is Dr. Baker's medical opinion that there will be no long-term carcinogenic effects or reproductive genetic defects. Dr. Baker's general assessment of the Dunsmere citizens' health is that we are in excellent health and that the to toxic exposure had very little adverse effect on our short or long-term health. As we all know it, it was Southern Pacific's derailment that caused a spill. And due to that spill, a small percentage of Dunsmere residents suffered minor short-term health effects. However, the day following the spill, the news media raised a black flag over the township of Dunsmere. And today, nearly three months later, many people throughout the state and country still see the skull and crossbones flying high above our heads. This simply isn't true. Our air is still fresh and our water is still the best on earth. People aren't dying in Dunsmere due to air and water. In general, we are very healthy and we have a very delightful town to visit and reside in. Our economy has suffered a severe blow to inaccurate and negative media coverage. What we need is our town to be made whole. We need the EPA to give our air and water a clean bill of health and publicize it. We need government doctors to conduct medical exams on the few citizens that say that they are still sick. If they are sick, they need to be treated. If they aren't sick, it needs to be known. We feel enough is enough. If the government is going to take and make a stance as far as what has been reported to them on health effects, we feel that they should follow through and also do a medical exam on the people. Following the spill, we were told that SP had no history of negotiated settlements. We had two choices to sue them or to negotiate. SP assured us that they would make right what they had made wrong. Being a historic railroad town, we wanted to believe this. To date, SP has lived up to this word and many individuals and businesses have negotiated settlements. Furthermore, due to such negative media coverage as being titled Toxic Spill Town, SP assured the uh, Dunsmere Chamber of Commerce from day one it would make a settlement with the Chamber to cover, to overcome this negativity. We believe everyone knows that for every ounce of negative media coverage, it takes 10 pounds of positive to, cover, uh, to overcome it. There's been millions of dollars of negative media coverage. 
One month following the spill, the president of SP, Mr. Mike Mohan, publicly addressed the Dunsmuir Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Mohan was asked to give the chamber $500,000 for our marketing campaign. Mr. Mohan declined on that, but did certainly say that they would support several hundred thousand dollars. In turn, two weeks ago, we asked for $350,000 from SP. And their response was that they would give us $250,000 at least for a regional campaign for all of Shasta and Siskiyou counties. We declined this offer, quoting uh, Mr. Mohan from the previous meeting. An SP representative told us in turn they would make the offer to the city instead of the chamber. Our feeling with this is there must be an internal error between the spokesman with SP in our town and Mr. Mohan. As we stated to date, SP has lived up to what they have said they would do for us. And we continue to believe that Mr. Mohan is a man of his word and will honor the, the several hundred thousand dollar commitment that he made to the Dunsmere Chamber of Commerce to assist in overcoming, overcoming the undue negative image bestowed upon us. We would also like to let you know that uh, Christy Osborne's group, the Concerned Citizens of Dunsmere, was born out of a Mel Melvin Belli meeting, at which office is backing that and formed the group. And I was present at that meeting. This, cer this group certainly is not a representation of all the Dunsmere community as a whole. They represent a very small segment of that community. And the fish issue, there's a resolution between the city council there, put together by the Dunsmere Chamber of Commerce, which basically states that we would like to see both planted trout and native fish back in that river the way it was prior to this. Not only is our economy based off of this, um, a number of the local residents have moved there for the purpose of being able to catch these trout. And there's a, a schedule here with this that uh, they would like to see commencing with the opening of the 1992 general trout season, plant hatchery fish in the Sacramento River between Prospect Avenue and Dunsmere and Sims Campground in Shasta County. Commencing with the opening of the 1992 general trout season, open the Sacramento River between Box Canyon Dam and Cantera Bridge and all tributaries down to the Lake Shasta to catch and release fishing, artificial lures, single barbless hooks. When an adequate insect base is established in the Sacramento River between Cantera Bridge in Siskiyou County and Prospect Avenue in Dunsmere, immediately commence planting fingerling wild trout in that section of the river. When an adequate insect base is established in the Sacramento River between Shotgun Creek and Lake Shasta in Shasta County, immediately commence planting fingerling wild trout in that section of the river also. And it has been my understanding that uh, SP, SP has committed to uh, paying for restoring the uh, fish in the river. I'd like to thank you for letting me address that and any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. I hope your doctor is right. That would be terrific and be no ill effects. And I hope that any of the ill effects that occurred on these fetuses had nothing to do with it because that would be very reassuring. Um, Mr. Condit. First of all, let me say um, uh, to the chair lady, that uh, woman, that we, um, I, I, I'm going to change the direction of the question, if I may. Any just, way you wish. Uh, you've done very well on trying to establish uh, uh, what happened after the spill occurred, and I commend you for that. I think you've done a fine job in trying to uh, determine what exactly happened afterwards. Um, I, I would like to um, turn just for a moment and, and talk about uh, some of the comments that were made earlier and ask uh, Mr. Mohan if he would... Uh, uh, if he has any response uh, to the charge that uh, SP uh, was giving people a bad time about their medical claims, uh, are you aware of this? And uh, if so, what have you done? No, I, I'm really not. Uh, let me uh, try and set it for you. I, I don't know if there's any uh, particular obligation other than what one feels is, is right uh, to set up a claims office and to provide uh, financial assistance. Uh, we thought it was right. That's what we did. Uh, we have people there that uh, have to make a judgment. They have to handle uh, each and every case on an individual basis. Uh, we don't uh, have the ability to, uh, to hand out a blank check, if you will. But the purpose of the office is to provide uh, immediate assistance where that's needed. It's uh, settled 500 claims. I think we've advanced people uh, another 220, uh, given them financial advances. Settled uh, loss of business claims. Uh, altogether, there's uh, well over a million that has flowed out so far in that. Uh, in a process of that nature, with uh, 
I think feelings are fairly high. Uh, I, it wouldn't surprise me a bit to feel that some people were perhaps dissatisfied. All we can do is, is work through that process to the very best of our ability and treat pe uh, people as fairly as we know how. Are you uh, participating, are you aware of uh, Dr. Goldman's statement about the Attorney General investigating these complaints? No, I'm not. Wasn't aware of that until today. You have any objections to them looking into it I and think participating? That's, I think that's just fine. Uh, the other question I have for you, uh, you, you alluded to it a little bit earlier, and I'd like for you to make a comment about uh, the statement that I read that Dr. Goldman made about uh, the accident itself being uh, preventable. Uh, and you stated uh, you made some reference to the possible causes of the accident. Uh, I think you said wheel slippage and uh, the long and short cars, et cetera. Do you, um, um, do you have an idea, of, uh, I mean, a conclusive idea yet of, of what caused the accident and was it preventable? Uh, did it have anything to do with the lack of maintenance, maintenance the lack of uh, the equipment being uh, uh, in working condition the way it should have been, lack of inspections, et cetera? No. Uh, first of all, I appreciate and uh, have the same attitude that uh, Dr. Goldman has, that you have to treat every incident as if it were preventable. Uh, if you don't take that attitude, then uh, you never progress. But to say that there is uh, never going to be another uh, airline uh, plane go down, to say there's never going to be another uh, truck accident, to say there'll be, never be another derailment, uh, I think we all know that's, that's not factual. In terms of uh, conclusive, uh, the way our process goes in the railroad industry is that we go through a derailment analysis and closeout. That's not yet complete. Everything we're sharing with you here is preliminary. It's the best information that we have. But as things uh, become apparent to us, whether they're related to the cause or whether they're not, that we can do to improve the operation and make it safer, we do them. Uh, example, the smoothing of the grade uh, around Cantera Loop. Now that's not uh, something that had anything to do with the cause of the derailment, but it uh, looks to us to be a, a smart thing to do in terms of, uh, of uh, reducing stress. Uh, did anything in this derailment have anything to do with uh, poor maintenance conditions? Uh, no, not, not as we uh, understand it so far. Uh, the track uh, was in excellent condition. Uh, we essentially rebuilt that entire portion of the railroad in uh, 1984. Uh, Retied it, uh, laid it with continuous welded rail or 78s, uh, installed curve blocks, curve braces. Uh, you won't find that kind of structural strength on uh, on many railroads anywhere. So uh, no, we don't think it's a maintenance issue at all. We think uh, that the uh, causes point in the direction of what we have said here today: that uh, coupler angularity caused by the long car, short car, and uh, perhaps perhaps some sort of uh, locomotive wheel slip. And one other thing that we're looking at uh, now is the possibility of uh, some sort of a, uh, air leak in the, the train that may have increased uh, rolling resistance. That is something that has to be done by inference. Uh, you'll never know it. It's just uh, the weight of the evidence as it comes in. Um, let, me, let me just uh, have you close my portion of questions to you by, uh, do you think that uh, there needs to be um, action taken to, to make uh, things safer for uh, hazardous materials? Is there anything, does this, does this incident uh, instigate a thought that we ought to change or do something different than we're doing? Well, uh, as far as what we, the SP, can do, uh, I think that the uh, preventative bridge, and I believe there's an artist sketch in your exhibit there, is the best thing that we can do to protect the site. As far as what the uh, industry or regulators can do, uh, there is a substantial amount of serious discussion going on now at a railroad industry level with the Chemical Manufacturers uh, Association about uh, improving tank car specifications uh, on what are called environmentally sensitive chemicals, what, what the surface transportation industry designates as truly hazardous are already contained in a very high spec tank. And we are in uh, discussion, analysis, negotiation as an industry with the CMA right now to uh, to see if there is something that we can voluntarily come up with in terms of additional tankage requirements. Uh, failing some sort of voluntary agreement, uh, we have the option of proceeding with a, a rulemaking procedure as an industry uh, to let uh, government help us on the issue. That's ongoing. I think that's, uh, on, an, on a global basis, that's probably the most useful thing we can do. 
Uh, let, let me uh, go on to Mr. Martin just uh, real quickly here. Mr. Martin talked about the economic impact. Do you, do you uh, have a number of, uh, 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 Mr. Mohan talked about the payouts for medical claims. Uh, what, have been, what have been the payouts for business claims? Uh, are you aware of any that they have? Range-wise? Yes. Most of those have been kept confidential at the time of the settlement. Um, and I would, I would really just be guessing on that, to what, tell you the truth. From, I'll ask Mr. Mohan to give us an accurate amount if he can. Well, I... Yeah, it's it's in the range of a million so far on business settlement claims, and uh, there have been some very substantial settlements uh, in that so far. Uh, we're not through that process. I'd appreciate it if I could, if we could hold individual numbers All right. uh, confidential. Uh, that's that's acceptable. Uh, what kind of claims do, has business uh, uh, submitted? I mean, can you can you talk about that? Were they closed down? Uh, did you destroy them for long term or short term or? No, what, we, what we've tried to do is take every case on an individual uh, basis. Uh, people with tackle shops, fishing shops, uh, obviously they're severely impacted and we've made uh, what we think are very fair settlements. Uh, people with uh, lodging uh, uh, establishments, have, have, have we've made what we consider to be fair and generous settlements. We're not all the way through the process yet, uh, but we're, we're doing what we think we can. I could only... Uh, add here to what uh, both the gentleman from the uh, chamber has said and what Christy Osborne said as well, is, is I really hope as we work our way through this process of what to do to ensure that this type of thing doesn't happen again, that we can get the, the cloud off Dunsmuir. It's a hell of a fine place. A lot of nice people that my family has come in contact uh, with from the time we, uh, we worked in the area back in the early 70s. And uh, I think it's, it's well to, to move on and get the cloud off. Well, uh, Ms. Osborne talked about some problems with the medical claims that you said you were willing to, to work with whoever, the Attorney General, what have you, to try to sort out. Uh, you're here representing the business community, the Chamber of Commerce. Have you heard uh, similar complaints about lack of, uh, uh, of uh, the uh, SP to, to work out a settlement or to work out a problem? <clears throat> Well, my understanding has been uh, both from speaking with Dr. Baker, who saw a number of these people, uh, that his bills were paid if they were submitted to to SP. I, I'm asking a, a more business question: whether or not you know businesses that had problems uh, and it, there was an economic impact to them. Do, have you heard any complaints that SP was not willing to to try to resolve the problem? Everyone that has settled. Uh, that I have spoken with has been happy with their settlement. There are a few that have, very few that have been unresolved that I'm aware of, and I think they are going to take legal action. But the ones that have, which is the majority of the business community, has been happy with those settlements. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Conn. We have a vote. I'm going to sit right through it because this will, we won't get out of here till seven. So right, I'll go vote. Then. We hope you Somebody can make it. Vote. I understand. <laughs> yes, please go do it. Um, I'm very concerned about this particular hearing going on until so late that we lose some of the people who are very important to us. So I'm going to pursue the, um, the hearing right now. Mr. I'm going to get back to Mr. Saracen. Um, Mr. Mohan, in your statement you discuss SP's overall safety record in very glowing terms. And I'd like to discuss that. According to the California Public Utilities Commission, in 1987, SP had the highest accident incident rate of all the railroads in California, costing an estimated $5.4 million in equipment and track. In 89, SP again had the highest accident incident rate of all the railroads in California, costing an estimated $24.4 million in equipment and track. And what makes these figures even worse is the fact that the FRA is inspecting fewer and fewer locomotives, but finding more and more defects. So I'm wondering how you could say that your safety record is, in your own words, um, glowing. No, I, I don't think those were my words. My words were that, and I think perhaps a background would help you, is that uh, in the late 70s, uh, early 80s, uh, SP's train accident record uh, was very poor. Uh, I believe there's some charts we might put up there, but it was in the range of uh, 13 incidents per uh, million train miles. 
Uh, over time, we have driven that uh, ratio down. A lot of investment has been made uh, to where we're just about at, uh, at industry average. I suppose the, the pride goes more to where we have moved it from where we were. Uh, we had a, a railroad in, in that period of time that uh, was in a, a marginal state of repair. We've put uh, over three billion into it. And uh, this is essentially where we've taken it in terms of mainline incidents uh, from the uh, early 80s to, to the present time on a, on a rising traffic base. So the issue is more one of how much we have improved it uh, as compared to what it was and what it is today than, uh, than anything we feel we can improve. In the area of, of employee safety, uh, again, we went from the position of being the industry's uh, last to in 1986, 87, and 88, uh, being the recipient of the uh, Harriman Gold Award, which is the industry's, for the industry's safest uh, uh, railroad from an employee accidents uh, statistic. So I can't tell you that we're perfect. We're certainly not. Uh, I can tell you that there has been uh, substantial improvement. Uh, I can tell you that uh, we're pretty much in the pack nationally. As to California, uh, we tend not to look at things uh, from the same framework as regulators do. We tend to look at our railroad as a system. We have no uh, reason to want to op more, operate more safely in California or Illinois or Arkansas or anyplace else. We look at it system-wide. So I guess we don't share the same data and same perspective as, mm -hmm. as the California PUC might have. <coughs> but what I think the Cal PUC may be looking at is then in 1989, there was a, an extremely uh, uh, tragic accident. In fact, it was on our system at San Bernardino. That skewed uh, all of the statistics as well as, as the harm it did uh, uh, substantially up. Uh, absent that, uh, I don't think that things would have been particularly abnormal in California. So in other words, you're saying if you're compared to the national railroads, you're doing just about as well as they are. But if you look at your record compared to California, you had the highest accident rate of all the railroads in California in 87 and 89. You don't contradict that. Well, I don't have a, a PUC document uh, in front of me. They, they are the, the people that would make that kind of comparison. I really can't respond to it one way or another. We run roughly uh, as many train miles in California as the other two railroads combined. Well, I mean, I just is it true or is it not that SP had the highest accident rate of all railroads in California in 87 I simply and 89. Don't. I simply don't know. You don't know that? No. Okay. Well, we'll put in the record of uh, rail equipment accidents and incidents from the PUC, which will document that. Um, Mr. Saracen, I noticed a woman was whispering in your ear. Who is she? Uh, that's Edna Walls of the California Attorney General's Office. And she wanted me to... Uh, well, has she accompanied you to this hearing? We didn't, I didn't anticipate that. Is she telling you what to say and not say at this well, hearing? Uh, she whispered in my ear, and I'll, I'll tell you exactly what she told me, that the Attorney General's office is not doing an investigation into private claims, as been stated at this hearing, that they are coordinating all the claims for uh, the public entities. And that's okay. what she whispered in my ear. Okay. And yes, she did accompany me here. She discussed your testimony with you about what you can say and not say? We had a, a lot of conversations about my testimony here, yes. Can you answer the question, please? Did she tell you what to say and not say? She did not tell me what to say and what not to say. Well, what did she advise you? Then why did she fly all the way across here with you? Well, there are, I may have mentioned this earlier, that there are about 20 attorneys that are represented by state, county, and federal uh, jurisdictions that are coordinating you know, this, this, this case. And Edna is the, uh, the lead attorney there. And the, the attorneys are very, very cautious about uh, providing uh, information in an ongoing investigation. So that's yes. the reason that, that she came with me. Right, I might just point out we're having a very large investigation here in Congress into BCCI, into Solomon Brothers, and yet we're able to have witnesses and the Attorney General's office has stopped us from um, having Mr. Convalin here as well as has stopped us from getting um, a transcript of Fish and Games interviews with Southern Pacific, and I wanted to put that on the record, that we are having some problems, and it's going to be up to the subcommittee and 
the attorneys who advise the subcommittee, we may have to subpoena these records. We have not gotten any cooperation uh, from the Attorney General's office in California. It's been very disheartening for us, but we pursue on. Um, so tell me, uh, in the questions that we wanted you to ask, Mr. Connell, and I understand you did speak with him. Yes, I did. Did he leave the scene um, after he arrived there? And if he did, why did he leave the entire project of cleanup to Southern Pacific? Yeah. I, I, I had a, a conversation with him, and I also asked him some additional questions because I thought that you were interested in about Thank the movement you. of the rail car. Uh, and then I guess it's a matter of definition of leaving the scene. Uh, as, as people have said before, you know, there's a, a one-way or a, a one-lane road into the the Cantera Loop area. That there's a gate and there's a kind of a little staging area. And and two questions: one, did he smell anything when he was there? The answer was no, he did not. The first time he smelled anything was about six o'clock at the riverside in Dunsmere, and I did not ask him. So he smelled nothing? When he was there, correct. When he was there, and he what was, time was that? Well, uh, I think uh, the chronological we gave you, he arrived at 11.40 uh, that night, and he, and he smelled nothing. He did. Did uh, he speak to any of the engineers who had smelled the terrible smell? Did he find out from SP that what they have told us today, did SP share the information that at the time of the accident there was a terrible odor? I, I, I asked him, did he smell anything? And he said, he said no. Okay. Uh, in addition, he did leave the site completely and, and go into Dunsmuir. Lieutenant Matthews uh, went back, you know, once they determined about 3.30 that it was a hazardous uh, material spill, that Lieutenant Matthews went back to uh, about a quarter to a half a mile you know, up this one-lane road, uh, and also, also there was the uh, was the sheriff, the county sheriff, and the highway patrol were at this kind of staging area. And what time was this? This was at 3:30, uh, and I asked, uh, you know, uh, uh, Warden Convalin, did he think uh, that any equipment was taken down, and 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 have, and the car moved, and he said that that it would have been impossible since the, you know, the train was in the way, and that I asked him when you were there at, uh, uh, you know, midnight, did you, you know, see any equipment on, on the Cantera Loop? And he said no. And he didn't think there was anything spilt until what time? Six o'clock in the morning. I mean, again, he was, there was a, a train car upside down the Sacramento River. He had, you know, he did not go down to inspect it because that's what he's trained to stay away from that kind of thing. You know, if it's, if it's a hazardous spill, you don't go in. So he you was have. in charge of the spill, but he left the scene because he was the one in charge of the spill. Is that correct? The, the fishing game was was in charge, correct? And when he right. left, he he felt that the the site was secure as far as public health was concerned. There was no way into the scene past where the county sheriff was and where the highway patrol was and where Lieutenant Matthews, but did he stand on the tracks at the Cantera well, Loop what, continually? No, he did not. At what point did no, he, he feel it was very dangerous and therefore he didn't go down? At what point did he feel it was dangerous? I think as soon as he arrived. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, train crew indicated that it was uh, uh, a weed killer. You know, in, in so as soon as he arrived on the scene at 1140, he believed there was danger. Well, he... And he, he, he didn't go down to the scene. He left. Well, again, you say he left. And, and yes, he did leave that, that exact spot. Well, you spot. yourself said it would be dangerous. Absolutely. Okay. Well, so he, absolutely, at 1140, he ascertained there was danger. Possible danger. Again, the training that they receive is that, you know, yes. they're, 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 we read in the paper all the time about how, you know, someone goes down into a, a, a evacuated uh, tank car to clean okay. it out. They pass out. Somebody else goes okay. in after them. You have three or four people die, so they're trained at not to get close. At 3.30 in the morning, here's a man who at 11.40 thought it was dangerous. At 3.30, he calls in and he says, this is to the National Response Center, no need for EPA assistance at this time. No leakage into the river at this time. F and G on scene and in charge. 
I That's at 3.30. I haven't seen that document. Maybe well, I'll be happy to give it to you. Thank you. Absolutely okay. happy to give it to you. And, it, and he felt it was a danger. You're reporting to us here today. Let me tell you who else thought it was a danger. At 11 o'clock, 11.02, the dispatcher who's been in charge, who's been in touch with the people in the railroad, say, I mean, hell, we could have had half the city of Dunsmere knocked off by now. And the people down there don't learn about it for many, many, many hours afterwards. Mr. Con Convalin feels it's dangerous. He doesn't even go down to the site. The dispatcher says we could have half the town of Dunsmere knocked off by now. And you said before Fish and Game did a good job. Well, I have tremendous concerns about the way this was handled, uh, whatever scenario it was. And taking the scenario that it all spilled immediately on derailment, looking at this transcript, getting SP's own time frame that it immediately spilled. There were horrible smells. The people smelled it. And yet at 1 o'clock they reported nothing spilled. So I think um, we better shape up the way we respond to these spills, not only in California, but in the whole, in the whole country. Now, I just want to ask Mr. Martin one sentence, did, it's one question. Did you ever receive any settlement? Yes, ma'am. You received a settlement from SP? Correct. Did the President of the Chamber of Commerce receive a settlement? I don't believe so. I don't believe he submitted a, uh, a claim. He's a retired banker. Do you know if he did, sir? I have no Ron idea. Ron McLeod? Ron McLeod is not President of the Chamber of Commerce. He's president of the Business Professionals Committee. I'm sorry. Did and the president of the Business and Professionals Committee receive a settlement? Yes, ma'am. Was it four years profit from his hardware store? Is that about what he received? The way that he worked the settlement, I'm not exactly sure. I just okay. know he received one. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you all. Um, lots and lots of questions remain in my mind and my heart. I thank you for helping us um, some way or other get to the bottom of all this and we will ask the next panel to get up so we continue to press on here. Where is mine? Yeah. We got mine there? I know I just need put it in there. Got the puddle here. Yeah, please. Okay. You have the question. Turtle. Uh, looks like someone did here too. <laughs> yeah. Would you rise and, and um, raise your right hand, please? Would you rise and raise your right hand, please? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. We thank you. Uh, Judy Lamson, I understand you wish to begin, so why don't you go right ahead? Okay, thank you. Um, my name again is Judy Lamson. I am a senior counsel for the California Public Utilities Commission and I've been closely involved in several of the recent commission activities involving uh, the regulation of hazardous materials by rail. Accompanying me today is, um, or I should say I'm accompanying him, is Jack Rich, who is superintendent of the commission's railroad operations and safety section. And we both appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, for those who have read my statement, I think they'll be pleased to know I'm not about to read it all today. I'm gonna summarize it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Mr. Rich will then discuss the practical aspects of the safety division's activities following a general derailment and provide some particulars about the Cantera Loop uh, derailment. As I think you're well aware at this point, the commission staff's investigation is still pending, uh, so we do not have any uh, either staff uh, conclusions or commission conclusions. The first point I'd like to make is that 
Unlike environmental laws, where the federal laws set the minimum standards for the states and the states are free to improve on them, like the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act, um, under the two major rail safety acts, uh, the Federal Rail Safety Act and the Hazardous Materials Transportation Act, the states are restrained from improving on the federal program because of broad preemption provisions. Um, under the Federal Railroad Safety Act, regulations in areas covered by the act are preempted. This means that the states cannot even adopt the same standards for independent state enforcement. We're left to work out enforcement issues uh, with the Federal Railroad Administration. There is one exception, however, and that's the local safety hazard exception, which we are considering in a formal commission investigation. Under the Hazardous Materials Transportation Act, uh, as amended just last year, certain specific subject areas are preempted, if not substantively the same as federal law. And uh, many of these, these um, specific preemption provisions come into play in the Dunsmuir case. They preempt um, classification of hazardous materials, labeling and handling of hazardous materials, shipping documents, notification and reporting, and packaging specifications, including tank car specifications. What that means to California is that even though we know firsthand that metam sodium is obviously a toxic material and should be regulated as such, the federal law, the Federal Hazardous Materials Transportation Act, preempts the state from saying that it is hazardous for the purposes of rail transportation. Uh, we were confronted with this at the legislature and at the commission as well, because everybody's um, first reaction is, well, it's obviously toxic, let's add it to the list, um, only to discover that we're prohibited from doing so by federal law. Um, the fact that a substance is not classified as hazardous under the TOT, DOT regulations means several things. There are no tank car specifications. There are no labeling requirements. There is no automatic notification just because there is a release, because it's, who knows what it is, it could be milk. Um, and there are no automatic drug testing requirements. Essentially, the, the substance goes unregulated. Um, it's not only the, the, the statutory um, preemption provisions um, themselves and the case law interpreting them, but it's the threat of preemption that serves as a um, strong deterrent to uh, states, California and other states as well, from improving rail safety. Um, nonetheless, California has recently adopted uh, a new general order, number 161, which we think um, will improve things significantly. Um, some of the provisions are as follows. Um, immediately notify by telephone the appropriate local emergency response agency of a release of a hazardous material. Now again, then we get into the problem with hazardous material. Would it include metam sodium? Today it would not. Um, and I, I'll give you a little story that is in my written statement um, that shows the importance of this. In the Bakersfield uh, incident that was described earlier by uh, Southern Pacific witnesses, uh, there was a school principal who looked out uh, her window and saw students in the playground or in the courtyard, and then she looked beyond the fence, and there were guys in, in uh, space suits with masks in the works. There her students were on one side of the fence, on the other side of the fence were, were guys in, in um, you know, full armor with a tank car. And so she called the local police and said, what gives? What's up? We don't know anything about it. So the police and the fire department went to the scene and said, what's going on here? And the, um, the carrier's personnel informed them that, well, this is federal jurisdiction. We've called the U.S. Coast Guard in Washington, D.C. Um, and the local people had no idea of what was going on. They couldn't evacuate the children. They and couldn't what do anything about it. I'm sorry? What that was in Bakersfield. Was this was in Bakersfield. How many hours after the spill had occurred? I'd have to defer to Mr. Rich on that. Approximately three hours, mm -hmm. four hours. Um, another provision in the general order is to provide a local emergency response agencies along each rail line with a railroad's 24-hour emergency telephone number. Um, I think you've seen in some of the confusion that no one knows who to call. Um, some of the phone numbers are missing, no one answers, etc. Um, have in place an emergency preparedness plan to respond to hazardous material spills. Uh, ensure that cra trained crew members have the ability to communicate via radio transceiver which e with each other and with the train dispatcher. Um, provide upon request by a local agency, response agency, or an administrating agency, a list of each type of hazardous material that has been transported through a line segment for the, pri uh, the prior 12-month period. 
while that at, at first glance it looks rather ludicrous, who cares what went through there in the past year, what that does is provides the local emergency response agency with information to prepare for future incidents. They know what kinds of substances are coming through, like metam sodium if it were regulated, then they can have on, on hand you know, maybe a computer database and say, okay, this is what it is, this is how we respond. Um, Another, another requirement is to provide, upon request, information regarding leases for storage of hazardous materials in rail cars. Um, while the Commission believes that these rules complement the federal framework, um, there is still a possibility that even these requirements would be challenged um, by the railroads as preempted under these laws. Um, the, the original rules as proposed, I wasn't part of that proceeding, but apparently they were quite, um, strong, quite a bit stronger and they have been whittled down, and we are uh, confident and hopeful that these will be um, not only not challenged, but if challenged, upheld. Um, these requirements are obviously uh, necessary, and they uh, impose a minimum burden on all parties involved. Uh, to conclude, um, it is obvious that metam sodium is toxic and hazardous and should be classified as such, and we're wondering how many other time bombs are out there. And we're wondering who we're going to entrust to take care of this. Um, the Hazardous Materials Transportation Act says that we can't reclassify. Uh, RISPA hasn't done much to, uh, to classify uh, substances that are obviously hazardous. Um, so we have some recommendations. We would either like to see the list expanded by legislation, possibly as, as you had suggested earlier, to include all U.S. Coast Guard uh, substances, possibly to include all pesticides and herbicides. Um, or as an alternative to require the uh, RISPA to re-review the substances or the EPA to maybe publish a list. Maybe EPA has the appropriate uh, expertise rather than RISPA, but we need a stronger federal list. We also need to have some authority given back to the states so that, that the California is not worried about requiring the railroads to notify the fire department when a spill has occurred. I mean, that's, that's silly to have a state worried about something like that. Uh, perhaps those should be national standards. Uh, we also need to see safer tank car specifications, as has been previously suggested by the National Transportation Safety Board. Uh, another um, important uh, factor would be to have increased information on trains, uh, labeling requirements, whether or not the material is hazardous. Um, we've all heard of triage. You saw, this, you saw these tank cars right here. Look at them all. You don't know what's in the other tank cars or that those aren't other tank cars, I'm sorry, those are other standard cars. But if there were a bunch of tanks that had spilled, you frequently see several chain, uh, tr uh, tank cars in a row, how would you know what's in each of them? You wouldn't. There's no opportunity to do triage. Uh, so a simple identification on the outside, whether or not it's hazardous, would be really helpful. Um, a final point. Um, this is the final, <laughs> on user fees. The um, California legislature recently passed uh, a user fee provision that would apply to railroads. The railroads have previously enjoyed an exemption that other carriers have not, trucks and buses, et cetera, which pay for their own regulation. The railroads have not had to do so in California. Um, as, I, as far as I know right now, the legislation has not yet been signed, but it did go through the legislature. Um, there are user fee provisions in, I think, about 30 other states. I do understand that the um, administration has sent a bill uh, to Congress. I don't know if it has an author yet, but apparently that's going to broaden the user fee provision, the federal user pre fee provision, and I would just like to um, make sure that there's no preemption provision in that as well. It's very important to us to have um, enough funds to hire more inspectors to uh, conduct more inspections and to look more into the local safety hazard um, exception to preemption. Thank you. Mr. Rich. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Or Chairperson. I'm Jack Rich, Superintendent of the Railroad Operations and Safety Section of the California Public Utilities Commission. I am here today to describe the practical aspects of PUC's Safety Division's activities following the derailment and provide a brief overview of STAC's activities at the derailment site. Our investigation is continuing and we've drawn no conclusions from with respect to the cause of the accident, so I'm unable at this time to provide you with any conclusions specifically. 
CPUC has, got, has a staff of nine federally certified inspectors who are responsible for inspections of carrier operations covering approximately 11,000 miles of railway operation throughout the state of California. The Commission staff conducts its inspections and investigations under the Federal Railroad Safety Act in a manner consistent with federal certification requirements set forth in Title 49, Part 212. This includes inspection and enforce enforcement of federal regulations for equipment, track, and operating practices. In addition, PUC staff pursues regulatory compliance with state laws and regulations that address items unregulated by federal regulations, such as walkways, clearances, lease track storage procedures, local emergency preparedness and notification for hazardous materials regulations. Despite the restrictions of federal preemption concerning hazardous material shipments and notification, PUC has developed state regulations for rail emergency notification and pre-planning. The goal of this regulation is to complement federal requirements by requiring local notification and distribution of emergency preparedness guidelines at the local level to those closest to the scene and who most appropriately respond to a situation. If these new rules had been in place before the Cantera Loop incident, we feel that local emergency response agencies would have been better prepared to respond. For example, as part of this emergency plan, they may have had to, the opportunity to drill for derailments, and a, and a facet of that drill could have included unregulated commodities and what you do and how you react to an unregulated commodity. Currently, no provisions for state participation in federal enforcement of the uh, Hazardous Materials Transportation Act, as amended by the Hazardous Materials Uniform Safety Act of 1990, exist because the regulations to implement the program are still pending the rulemaking procedure at the Federal Railroad Administration. PUC staff routinely conducts field investigations of railroad accidents that result in employee or passenger injury or death or the discharge of a hazardous material commodity. These activities are conducted in concert with any federal investigative effort, particularly the Federal Railroad Administration and or the National Transportation Safety Board. The primary role of PUC staff in responding to a railroad incident is to investigate for regulatory compliance of the carrier, to ensure the preservation of perishable technical accident evidence, and to determine whether additional preventive measures or regulations are required. Additionally, as superintendent of the Railroad Operations and Safety Section, typically I will receive notice of a derailment from the Governor's Office of Emergency Services, referred to as OES, which receives the notification directly from the railroad. OES acts as a state clearinghouse for emergency information distribution. The notification includes location, time, carrier, injuries, and any potential releases of hazardous materials. Based on the information communicated, we initiate appropriate and investigative effort. Dependent upon the severity of accident, this may involve determining the probable cause of the accident and responding with uh, suitable inspection of the appropriate uh, equipment involved. Following the conclusion of the investigation, staff prepares a report on the incident which is then filed as appropriate with either the FRA, the NTSB, or the Commission itself, depending on the circumstances involved. In some cases, if certain thresholds are met, the NTSB, of course, will conduct a formal investigation, including hearings, which PUC will then represent the state. In this case, the NTSB has not formalized a public investigatory proceeding. However, as mentioned by Ms. Lampson, the PUC has ordered a formal state investigation, including public hearings. Relevant to the accident itself, the PUC has closely cooperated with the representative from the National Transportation Safety Board and the investigators from the Federal Railroad Administration. Following is a description of the actions taken by PUC staff with the approximate times indicated. On July 14th, Sunday, 1991, we know the reported time to be 9.40 p.m. That's based on evidence we've developed to date. Uh, I need to correct my one testimony. The correct time should be 11.20 p.m. I received a telephonic noti notification from the Governor's Office of Emergency Services informing me that Southern Pacific had derailed seven cars and one engine near Dunsmere at milepost 328. OES then indicated that one tank car in containing methamphetamine, sodium, an unregulated weed killer, had derailed. OES further indicated that Siskiyou County and the Department of Fish and Game were responding to the scene. Based on the reported nature of the derailment, no commission immediate response was initiated. 
Our next timeline starts in the morning of uh, July 15th, Monday, 7 a.m. About that time, I contacted OBS to confirm the commodity name of methamphetamine sodium to complete our reports on the incident. Because methamphetamine sodium is not classified as a hazardous material for rail transport, we could not find it listed in the DOT guide. OES then informed me that they were having difficulty also in finding information on the commodity and ascertaining the proper response procedures. PUC staff then contacted the manufacturer who provided a material, a material safety data sheet containing response information. We faxed this sheet to OES and to the local FRA office in Sacramento. Mr. Rich, I yes. think instead of your reading the entire chronology, which we will put in the record, sure. if you would go to your section July 18th, 1991 to date, that would be very helpful. Sure. July 18th, we are, we're, uh, from July 18th on, Commission staff is continuing investigation, including interviews with crew members uh, from the derailment site, inspection of track, locomotive performance, and uh, railroad response and mitigating uh, measures, and the adequacy of operating rules concerning uh, track and train makeup. The results of this investigation will be included in a staff report to be offered as testimony in the formal PUC investigatory proceeding. As a part of the proceeding, the PUC may develop recommendations for improved rail safety requirements based on the local basis or may um, petition the federal government based upon our uh, limitations imposed by federal preemption. In conclusion, the incident at the Cantera Loop demonstrates the overwhelming impact the federal classification of hazardous materials can have on the safe transportation of toxic but yet unclassified and unregulated materials. We solicit congressional intention to focus on this federal regulatory scheme which allows a commodity such as methamphetamine sodium to escape regulation. Congress should be reminded that the, th the threat of preemption all too often inhibits state regulatory action and serves to blunt local city, county, and state efforts to address specific local needs concerning notification, information, and mutual aid coordination with railroads. I'd be happy to entertain any questions. That's a very important point about preemption. I've never liked preemption. My view has always been the federal government should set a standard, and if states wanted to exceed that, we should encourage that. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and there's so many things they could help, help us with in that regard. Good. Um, Ms. Lamson, how would you describe, and you're, you're doing a very intense investigation of a lot of these issues, which I think is going to be very helpful to this subcommittee. And Ms. Lamson, and also Mr. Rich, if you care to, would you say that your investigation is being, being helped by SP and Fish and Game. Do you feel good about the level of cooperation? Well, I'm not the staff counsel on that proceeding, but from what I hear, we're getting less than optimum cooperation uh, from both sides. Less than optimum cooperation yeah. from SP and, the, and yeah, Fish and Game. Right. SP was ordered by the um, Commission's order instituting investigation uh, to file certain uh, a certain number of copies um, with the commission and has it refused to do so and as I understand it it has refused to comply with an administrative law judge's order and at this point it is at the commission level uh, I can't give you the you know can the commission use some subpoena power to uh, yes to get those documents good yes um, just so that I'm not uh, misleading you we have been provided with a single copy um, but they were required to file as a pleading, which means duplicate copies so that all of our staff can review it. Um, and it's just an obstinance that no one quite understands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mr. Rich, I wanted to ask you a question um, regarding the possible movement of the tank or nudging of the tank. Um, the subcommittee received photos from SP which showed the large front end loaders that were used in the cleanup of the derailment site. As part of your investigation, did you inspect this equipment? Yes, we performed uh, inspections of both the, uh, the moving and wrecking equipment and of the derailed equipment. Mm -hmm. Did you conduct any, derail, any detailed examination of these front end loaders, such as making measurements of the teeth in the buckets of the front end loaders? We show the staff memo concerning um, the wrecked equipment, we show um, the following equipment ordered by the Southern Pacific at approximately 10.30 p.m. on 7.14.91 from a contractor in Newcastle, California. One 
25 ton winch, 150 ton crane, and two 983 cat loaders, which are these bucket end loaders I think we may be referencing. Uh, this particular contractor also subcontracted with a local uh, contractor that had what they call a D8 cat out of Red Bluff. We show that D8 cat arriving at the derailment scene approximately 4 a.m. What time did they order that equipment? Uh, we show the equipment ordered at 10.30 p.m. with the contractor in Newcastle, California. So they ordered heavy equipment at 10.30 p.m.? That's what staff reports indicates. Mm -hmm. And that was before they had notified uh, the National Response Center that there was even a problem? If staff's timeline is correct, that's correct. Okay. Now, I'd like you to look at these photographs. I guess there's one other. Oh, we have another one that's a close, a real close-up of the tank car damage. Um, knowing what you know about the specifics of the front-end loaders at the scene and the distance between the two holes in the tank, is it possible, and I'm only asking you possible, that this damage was caused by one or more of these front-end loaders? I could answer that in the context of my 20 years experience in the railway industry. I've punched a few holes in tank cars and um, two separate occasions. And um, it was by end loader use, and it is possible. It is possible? Yes. That the damage there was done by those front it, end uh, loaders? It, it's possible for an end loader to punch a hole in a tank car. I, whether that Pacific picture reflects that, I'm not really qualified to say, but it's possible to punch a hole into a tank car. With that equipment that they had on the scene? Okay. Are you pursuing that in your investigation? We're, we've collected all the data that we think we can. We're, we're trying to get some um, uh, mail that are just available to staff to further evaluate the tank car itself. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to thank uh, both of you. I think what you've put on the table for us is very, very important. I'm very pleased that you're having um, this investigation. I think Mr. Katz already in his first investigation from the State Assembly revealed a situation going on here with FRA that I couldn't get at. So I think whatever the state does is very helpful in coordination with the subcommittee. And I think your testimony that it is possible that this damage was caused by movement with one of that heavy pieces of equipment is very important. We're never going to get to the bottom of this. We aren't. But we have raised enough questions, and I think that was an important point. And I thank you for your honesty and your cooperation with the subcommittee. And we thank you. And I'm going to go vote and come right back in time for our last panel, the EPA RISPA FRA. We'll be back. Okay. Do we have our our last panel in place, please? This guy is going to be by himself. Okay. We need Jay Feldman, National Coalition Against the Misuse of Pesticides, accompanied by Melvin Ruber, and we could combine that panel with Linda Fisher, the EPA, Alan Roberts, Research and Special Programs Administration, Edward English, Federal Railway Administration, Grady Coton, Federal Railroad Administration. Or do the witnesses from the uh, government prefer to be in a separate panel? Is that my understanding? That's fine with, with us. <laughs> That's fine with us. We're going to ask you to stand and, and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. You're sworn in? Um, Mr. Feldman, why don't you uh, begin? Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm Jay Feldman, National Coordinator of the National Coalition Against the Misuse of Pesticides, and I'm accompanied today by our staff toxicologist, Dr. Melvin Ruber. We appreciate the opportunity to raise critical issues and concerns about the public's exposure to chemical poisons on a daily basis and the continuing uh, government's failure to protect public health and the environment. The latest of many incidents, which is the subject of this hearing today, the, the July 14, 1991 spill of the deadly biocide metamsodium, raises critical questions about the regulatory authorities that govern 
The whole chain, cradle to grave, from registration, marketing, transportation, storage, and disposal of this poisonous pesticide. The events that preceded and followed the spill raised serious questions about the adequacy of protection being provided to the American public by EPA. What did EPA know about this poison? When did it know it? And what did it do about it? There is no question after reviewing the way EPA handled metam sodium that the agency should have and could have acted to restrict the material. This remains true today. A review indicates that studies were submitted to EPA in 1987 and in 1990 uh, the manufacturer BASF flagged uh, Two or a study that showed that fetal deaths were statistically significant. It is hard to conceive of a better system than what EPA actually uses right now for flagging called the Chemical Response Worksheet, which is intended to direct reviewers to significant problems. And yet a review of EPA's response is extremely troubling. The siren went off and was flat out ignored by decision makers. The leadership of EPA and the White House have shown a blatant disregard for human health and the environment environment and its failure to act to control pesticides. Unfortunately, this is not unique to metamsodium. In fact, there is a distinct pattern of EPA foot dragging on pesticide after pesticide in which adverse effects information is presented to the, industry, to the agency, followed by no action. And in our testimony, we provide for you the litany of indecision on, on an, only an example of chemicals. There are many others. Moreover, the committee should be aware that this is not the first time that EPA has been cited for poor review of information critical to health and safety decision making. In 1984, the cut and paste scandal broke and agency staff were found to have unreviewed industry studies pasted onto EPA letterhead. After tracking EPA's performance in regulating pesticides over the last decade, I am struck by the agency's failure to act on basic information on pesticide hazards. As a result, the agency's poor record to restrict the widespread introduction of hazardous pesticides into the environment has led to unnecessary risks and accidents time and time again. In many cases, we are not talking about hazards that are acute or immediate, as EPA refers to in its, in its testimony, but rather serious increases in risks associated with cancer, birth defects, genetic damage, or reproductive dysfunction. While the pesticide registration program is, for the most part, intended to evaluate uh, pesticides and protect against unreasonable adverse effects to humans in the environment, transportation, storage, and disposal of pesticides under FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, is highly politicized, and we conclude for purposes of this testimony that the agency is, one, ignoring important information and evidence of adverse effects. Metam sodium is an excellent example of that. Failing to meet deadlines for review and action on toxicity information. This chemical has been in the queue since 1972 with about 600 other active ingredients, consistently making judgments that miscalculate the real world realities, leaving little margin for error. Again, accidents are not generally considered by EPA in registering a material and ascribing benefits to poisons that can be replaced by safer materials or practices. EPA fails to review required adverse effects report is issued by the agency. I should point out here that the agency did publish a final interpretive rule and statement of policy in 1985, but never published the effective date after providing for congressional review. Thus, that policy remains um, ineffective at this point, although I'm told that some uh, industry groups have voluntarily adopted it. Spurred by congressional inquiry into its failure to examine adequately available data on metam sodium, EPA has now revealed that it is overlooked, and we were told as many as 36 studies on 20 chemicals. The testimony today indicates that there are at least 1,300 pieces of data that have been uh, submitted to the agency and presumably not fully evaluated under this program, or some have been fully evaluated, a small percentage. What we do for you in the testimony is look at a number of case studies. What emerges is a pattern of neglect, a failure to act, long unexplainable delays, secret negotiations with the chemical industry resulting in incomplete pesticide restrictions, all in the face of significant hazards. What I'd like to do is, is point your, your attention to this specific review of chemicals but not run through them right now. The, the point I'd like to skip to here 
is EPA's failure to meet deadlines for review and action on toxicity information. Because presumably, if EPA had adequately reviewed data, it had to it the information that would have filtered down to Dunsmuir and other uh, communities like it, uh, information that would have been available to the state would have sent the red flag up the flagpole, just as it was sent up the flagpole for EPA, uh, but ignored. Um, you should also be aware that uh, fraudulent data also plagues the agency, that is, EPA depends on independent laboratories paid for by manufacturers uh, to submit data, and most recently we've seen yet another uh, uh, case of a a laboratory presenting data to EPA is having fabricated that information. The upshot of all this is, and I think it played out in California, unfortunately, is that EPA misleads the public on the nature and the extent of pesticide hazards. We see this uh, as a pesticide information clearinghouse on a daily basis. It's documented on chemical after chemical from chlordane to deminazide to chlorpyrifos uh, in our testimony. EPA consistently makes judgments that miscalculate the realities of the real world, leaving little margin for error. The agency maintains that registered pesticides can be routinely used without unreasonable effects, all the while assuming strict compliance with label restrictions, no accidents, and adequacy of label precautions. EPA bolsters its position by refusing to acknowledge that serious accidents are a regular and predictable outcome of the widespread use of hazardous materials. The size and devastation of the Sacramento spill caught the attention of the press and public. But in the aftermath, it is important to ask how frequently hazardous accidents occur. The agency could have uh, told the public uh, and, and been aware that these accidents are both predictable uh, and usual. Now, EPA in its own in-house document has, has indicated that on the average there are five accidents every day in the United States involving hazardous substances. Approximately 30 percent, nearly two every day of those accidents occur during transportation. Accidents are and will continue to be a regular and predictable occurrence. Finally, I'd like to point your attention to the fact that EPA ascribes benefits to poisons like metam sodium that can be replaced by safer materials or practices. This is a general uh, policy at the agency. In the case of metam sodium headed for the, for the northwest to potato growers, there are numerous examples of non-chemical approaches to uh, potato growing which have been affected effective, excuse me. In conclusion, I'd like to say that inaction at EPA is bad enough. Worse still is the continual misinformation that comes out of the agency. We heard it with metam sodium right after the spill. No reason for alarm. We hear it when a medical doctor writes EPA with concerns about afflicted poisons exposed to widely used pesticides, one like chlorpyrifos. Quote from EPA, there is no evidence that this product presents an unreasonable risk when used as directed. This despite the fact that EPA has not completed its re-registration of chlorpyrifos. The sirens went off on metam sodium when the registrant submitted its worksheet. Inaction followed. The alarm system was in place. EPA failed to respond. The series of failures discussed here, which amount to only some examples, add up to inadequate protection for health, safety, and the environment. In the long term, the pesticide registration system must be overhauled to identify least toxic pest management practices that eliminate the need for our nation's over on toxic materials. In the short term, we must demand leadership to move the agency from its sedentary state. Policies must be adopted which ensure a response to information of bad effects. And EPA's pesticide registration and re-registration program must be audited annually, even semi-annually. Now, we've submitted a list of recommendations to the committee which we feel will address some of the short-term problems, establish new flagging mechanisms, provide an avenue for collecting pesticide incidents in the affirmative and comprehensive manner by law and through health facilities, provide for EPA follow-up to research these inc incidents and assess the information as part of the registration re-registration system, establish an annual audit, include data on accidents, label compliance, real world experience, and factor in pesticide registration, re-registration decisions. And after listening to the testimony today, I would like to add a sixth, and that is make political appointees criminally liable for their actions. 
Congress has considered the poor state of EPA's pesticide program many times. The U.S. General Accounting Office has documented severe neglect on the part of the agency. The pesticide program requires serious attention if we are to enjoy the public health and protection the country believes. We believe that EPA should be officially sanctioned for its continuing failure to protect the public. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Feldman. Uh, Mr. Feldman, and I would ask questions. Either of you can jump in. Yesterday, the GAO testified to a Senate committee that federal regulatory agencies, including the EPA, do not adequately protect the public against the dangers that chemicals and materials pose to the human reproductive system. As a matter of fact, they said, uh, not since the study um, of thalidomide caused limb deformities uh, in European children in the 60s um, did our government even look at this? And I guess my question is, in your view, was EPA guilty of that kind of lax attitude toward the reproductive data that emerged from the metamsodium studies? Well, le let me start, and maybe Dr. Uber can add. You know, I've got the, in front of me here, the uh, registration phase three chemical response worksheet in which EPA is alerted to two studies that significantly uh, sh show problems. I mean, it, literally on this whole worksheet, the only two boxes uh, that are checked happen to be teratogenicity uh, studies, birth defect studies. Um, maybe the attitude, uh, as, as described in the GR report, is reflected in the fact that this didn't mean much to the EPA reviewers. The fact is, though, as a part of the protocol that EPA is supposed to be reviewing relative to pesticide use, uh, birth defects uh, are standard questions that, that are, are to be asked. I think what, what we're facing here, and again, it's reflected in the accident, is that EPA has not fully met its, its responsibility to um, review these pesticides in a timely manner. Yes, Dr. Uh, they've been referring to uh, a, a rat teratology study and a rabbit teratology study. Actually, there are four studies. There are two rat studies, two separate rat studies, and there are two separate rabbit studies. And the results are the same in all of those, all of those studies. And We're talking about metam sodium now. Yes, metam sodium. And uh, these studies include a very wide range of doses, even very low doses. Now, metam sodium, a carbonate neurotoxin, uh, has a profound effect on the reproductive system, the placenta and the fetus, even at very low doses. Many fetuses died as a result of exposure. Those that live develop birth defects of the nervous system. Had more fetuses survived, uh, the incidence of the birth defects would have been even higher. Um, birth de I know you're referring to uh, reproductive effects, but birth defects of any kind, particularly those of the central nervous system, uh, are frightening. Um, the birth defects here were detected by gross examination of the fetuses, had more sophisticated uh, means been used, undoubtedly more would have been found. And this is not to mention uh, such subtle effects as on function and behavior of the nervous system. Well, let me ask you, since you're very familiar with the study, do you think EPA was familiar with the studies that you just talked about? Uh, well, they very recently reviewed them. Uh, until then, it's my understanding. They well, didn't. what I need to find out is, this accident occurred in July. In your opinion, do you believe EPA had reviewed those birth defect studies by July? I, I don't know. I can't answer that. Well, our understanding is that when a document like this comes in as part of re-registration, it, it goes through a series of loops. Um, individual reviewers and supervisors uh, take this material and review it and determine whether EPA next needs to take expedited action. Um, you know, again, it's, it's one of those situations where being on the outside, it's hard to determine what went on inside well, let me, the agency. Okay, let me ask you, Ms. But, Dr. Rupert, when did you know? that metam sodium causes birth defects. Was it after we asked the question, or had you been aware of it before? It was after you asked the question. OK, very good. Did you want to Yeah, I just wanted time? to add that it's very unlikely that material such as this came into the agency and sat and, and nothing happened to it. it. It's just as likely, or even more likely, that a number of people discussed this issue 
a number of supervisors may have looked at it, and given everything else that is going on in the agency, it was, it was just dismissed. Okay, let me ask you one other question, and then I'm, I'm very delighted to see my wonderful chairman of the Environmental Committee has joined the subcommittee, Mr. Sinor. Um, as you probably know, if you followed this spill, it was not the United States EPA that revealed to pregnant women that they may be in trouble after the spill. It was the California Environmental Protection Agency. And I guess my question to you is, and if you can't be definitive, that's okay, I'm going to ask EPA anyway. If the California Environmental Protection Agency knew about these studies that Dr. Rubert talked about and knew of the potential problems to pregnant women and to their fetuses, do you not think that the United States Environmental Protection Agency would have been privy to that same information? California is unique in its Birth Defects Prevention Act, which you're mm -hmm. aware of, which in fact sets up a system which many of us think is far superior to EPA's review of pesticides. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the process uh, of looking at the available information that it had and seeking through collaboration information uh, that EPA had, it was the initiative of California, as you've described it, that uncovered this situation. Um, it, it really is, um, it is the fact that California has devoted a tremendous amount of resources to this issue that has forced this sort of uh, information to, be, to come to, to so public view. It, so you're saying that it is highly possible that the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States of America didn't know something that the California EPA knew. Is that what you're saying? Yes. In fact, um, under the Birth Defects Act, uh, a, a couple years ago, uh, the sponsor of that act wrote to the assistant administrator and said that we reviewed uh, 99 studies that EPA has reviewed, and we have reached uh, different conclusions from the agency on 58 or so of those studies uh, on chemicals. And the, the response from EPA is that these, this is just a matter of difference in professional judgment. Mm -hmm. The point here is that, yes, it's quite possible that, and this will happen in the future, that given the resources devoted in California, that the agency there will turn up uh, information that may actually be in EPA files that they hadn't bothered reviewing or not even be available to EPA at that point in time. Um, the EPA has a terrible track record in both calling in the data and then reviewing it uh, when it does come in, and its, its system of priorities is skewed, and it's, uh, I think, in, in, this is a classic example, metamsodium, of, of how that plays out, uh, given a specific chemical and specific accident. Now, according yes. to the records, these uh, studies were submitted by the registrants in 1987. So, they were at EPA, and EPA should have known about them. So the people who make metam sodium had already submitted these studies, and right. they had submitted them to the Environmental Protection Agency, and the studies showed that they were birth defects. Is that yes. correct? That's correct. At exposure Twice. levels. In 1987, the, the, su the studies themselves were submitted. In 1990, as a part of the re-registration program, which had been passed by uh, or amended by Congress in 1988, the, uh, the, the registrants or the manufacturers submitted this summary uh, of the studies and, and highlighted them, flagged them, marked them for EPA to zero in on. Okay. So just to review your point, EPA had the information since 1987 on metamsodium. Metamsodium spilled into the Sacramento River and it was many, many days later that the California EPA uh, told the residents there if they were pregnant to seek help, and the U.S. EPA uh, never essentially uh, put forward any of this information. And you're saying they had it in their files. That's correct. In fact, uh, EPA in its testimony today tells the committee that they had the information prior to the spill. That's their language. Um, 
EPA had received studies on developmental effects of metam sodium. What they neglect to tell you is that they had that information four years prior to the spill, which is, which is just another example of how misleading EPA tends to be with committees of Congress and the public generally. In another part of the testimony, point you to page 13, EPA says that birth defects were not st statistically significant but fails to tell you that fetal deaths were highly statistically significant. And if what Dr. Ruber says is true, and we believe it is, that had those uh, animals lived through their life, those deaths, those animals that ultimately died, would have shown statistically significant birth defects. Okay. Ms. Steiner, any questions for this panel? Or you're going to wait till the next one. We thank you very much. You've been very, very helpful. And we call the final panel, Linda Fisher, EPA, Alan Roberts, RISPA, Ed English, Federal Railway Administration, who we, the subcommittee, knows, and uh, Grady Cothin, uh, Federal Railroad Administration, accompanied by H.T. Patton. He's getting the uh, Drew, can it be a little hotter in here? So you just have to take the camera so they can leave those slides there. Michael, I'm going to give their testimony. Do you want to question the EPA before I hear from everybody else? Yes. Yes. We'll just start off. We need a bunch more chairs. I have to swear. No, I don't think I have any. We're going to swear in this panel. So if you can, uh, please uh, raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Please be seated. Uh, what we're going to do, since Chairman Sinar is on a tight schedule and has a particular interest in the EPA witness and her uh, testimony, we're going to ask her to begin, and then I'm going to turn to the Chairman uh, for his questions. So uh, Linda Fisher, go right ahead. Thank you. Good morning, or good afternoon, Madam Chairman. We started uh, in the morning. Yeah, I know. I thought I would be up here earlier. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to respond to your concerns about the tragic spill of the pesticide metam sodium on July 14th near Dunsmuir, California. I am joined today by Dr. Penny Fenner Crisp, who is the head of our Health Effects Division. This incident has raised a number of issues which deeply concern EPA. The first is the fact that some number of toxic chemicals are not currently regulated in transportation as hazardous substances or materials. The second issue is the failure of EPA to immediately review two studies which indicated that metam sodium may cause adverse health effects. I'd like to discuss with you today what actions we are taking to address these two issues. The spill highlighted gaps in the government's coverage of the transportation of hazardous chemicals. Presently, there are many chemicals that, though not now listed under CERCLA or by DOT as, poten as potentially hazardous, could pose significant risks to health or the environment if spilled in sufficient quantities. Under current statutes and regulations, a chemical must be designated by name through a rulemaking process or meet a criterion for a level of acute toxicity in order to be regulated by DOT. When we examine the current system for identifying hazardous materials, a patchwork of regulatory coverage emerges. Four existing lists have the most direct relevance to transportation and accidental releases of a chemical. They are the DOT list of hazardous materials, which imposes specific requirements on shippers and carriers of hazardous materials, the CERCLA list of hazardous substances, which is fully incorporated into the DOT list, but also covers releases other than transportation, the list of extremely hazardous substances substances named in the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, and the list of marine pollutants known as MARPOL Annex 3, which is used by the Coast Guard to regulate transportation by water. Except for the MARPOL list, the pesticide metam sodium is not currently on any of these lists. The acutely toxic hazards of metam sodium were known and addressed in terms of FIFRA, which regulates the pesticide according to its normal agricultural use patterns. The fact that a chemical is regulated under FIFRA does not mean it is automatically listed as potentially hazardous in other circumstances. EPA has come to realize that acute human toxicity, 
which is the main criteria for registering chemicals in the majority of these lists, is not by itself sufficient to determine the potential hazard of a chemical for transportation or other accidental release purposes. We must include potential of potential effects to other health endpoints and to the environment in our assessment as well. There are approximately 900 pesticide active ingredients. At this time, a total of about 350 of those active ingredients are regulated under the four statutes. As DOT's new poison criteria are fully implemented over the next couple of years, this number will increase significantly. Over the next three months, EPA intends to screen the remaining pesticides against environmental and health criteria currently being developed so as to identify which of the remaining pesticide active ingredients are reasonable candidates for regulation. We are going to determine the most expeditious means available and initiate the necessary action to get these chemicals listed. The second troubling issue that came out of the California spill was EPA's failure to promptly review some adverse health effects data on metamsodium, which had been submitted to the agency as part of re-registration. Re-registration is a critical task for EPA's pesticide program, since it is the process for ensuring that pesticides registered before 1984 meet current safety standards. One critical aspect of the FIFRA 88 amendments for re-registration requires that a pesticide registrant must submit and flag any information that indicates that a pesticide may pose unreasonable adverse effects to human health or to the environment, to the EPA. To date, 184 studies have been flagged for adverse effects on the pre-1984 pesticides since FIFRA 88 was enacted. Of these, 157 studies have been reviewed by the agency. At the present time, the 27 studies that we have yet to review involve ab about 14 chemicals. In short, the system that we created for managing the review of these studies received under FIFRA 88 was inadequate. Under 58, FIFRA 88, the agency was directed to divide the old chemicals into four categories or lists. List A, which included the most which included most of the food use pesticide was given our top priority. For list A chemicals, all the adverse health effects studies that have been received have been reviewed. The other lists, B, C, and D, include ma mainly non-food use chemicals. It was for these lists of chemicals that we were frequently reviewed only the summaries, unless it was determined that a more extensive review was necessary. The problem, which we realized after the accident, occurred with chemicals on these last three lists. We have already taken steps to ensure that the 27 unreviewed studies currently at EPA will be fully reviewed by the end of November. We are also addressing the underlying systematic problem that led to the situation, that is, how EPA manages its review of adverse effects studies. In the case of metamsodium, where two adverse effects studies were submitted, the registrant stated in the summary that the potential effects were not statistically significant and perhaps were not related to exposure to the chemical. Our scientists reviewed the summary but failed to review the entire s study itself. We are changing this practice. Excuse me, who wrote the summary? Could you the chemical company writes the summary, and the agency reviews it. We are changing this practice. From now on, EPA will no longer read only the summaries of adverse effect studies that are submitted by the registrant. All adverse effect studies will be promptly reviewed by EPA after receipt. A special team of scientific reviewers and program managers will oversee this process to ensure that the studies are reviewed, that a consistent scientific evaluation is given to them, and that a decision is made on whether any regulatory action needs to be taken. It is important to note, though, that an earlier review of the data submitted for metamsodium would not have led to the pesticide's inclusion on either the CERCLA or the DOT list. Reproductive toxicity is not currently a listing criteria under any current statute or regulation. Earlier review of these studies, however, may have enabled EPA or the State of California to give a more timely warning of risk to the people of the Dunsmuir area following the spill. As with many older pesticides, the current database on metamsodium is incomplete. A number of tests are needed in order for us to better characterize the risks associated with exposure to this chemical, and EPA has issued a data call-in which requires the registrant to generate and submit this additional information to us. 
Based on current information and the review of the two studies, we have determined that the risks to the applicators of this pesticide are of concern. Updated information from the data call-in may change some of our assessments, but we cannot afford to wait any longer before taking steps to reduce potentially unacceptable risks posed by metam sodium. Yesterday, EPA reached an agreement with the registrants of metam sodium that will require significant risk reduction measures and remove some of the most troublesome uses from the market. The agreement states that protective clothing will be required for all individuals associated with the use of this pesticide, and secondly, that homeowner uses will be prohibited unless they are applied by a certified applicator. EPA will continue to review the studies of metam sodium's health and environmental effects as part of the re-registration process and will determine whether fu future steps may be necessary to protect the, the health and the environment. In closing, I can only reiterate that EPA is deeply concerned about the problems with our program that have been raised in the ap aftermath of this accident. We are taking steps to address them. Additionally, we are working within EPA and with the other agencies to improve our listing process to ensure that compounds are more appropriately identified, properly handled, and that information is readily available in the event of an emergency response. This concludes my statement, and I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fisher. I'm going to ask um, the chairman over here, but I, I must just make a passing comment. You know, thank God for these hearings. Last night, you reached an agreement. Um, to require people wear protective clothing and that the homeowner uses of this chemical be discontinued. Um, I don't know where you've been for years, but 24 hours before this hearing, you did something, and I'm glad, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and first of all, let me thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here today. As you know, as the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Environment, Energy, and Natural Resources, I have the privilege of uh, being the Oversight Chairman for FIFRA. And uh, Ms. Fisher, welcome today. Uh, since you weren't here for the last hearing, which I thought was pretty inappropriate, it's good to have you here on this very vital issue. Ms. Fisher, you're aware of the requirement by registrants to identify the adverse effects information that they discover after uh, a pesticide is registered. I've got to tell you that uh, Ms. Boxer and I and the others who were here at the first hearing were shocked to learn uh, at the last hearing that EPA had received, quote, those adverse effect studies on metam sodium, uh, which sat on EPA's files, not for a matter of days, not for a matter of months, but literally for a matter of years. Would you like to tell the subcommittee and the American people, and particularly the people of California, how that could have happened? The studies that you're referring to uh, were received by the agency in 1987. At that time, uh, registrants were not required to flag them as having any kind of adverse effects data. Uh, the flagging right uh, criteria came as part of the FIFRA 88 amendments. Um, the agency received the indication that these studies contained um, adverse health effects data actually in 1990. Um, from our perspective, that is still unacceptable. Um, we have uh, the studies that are submitted to us as containing adverse health effects data should be reviewed promptly. We had done that with information that was received on list A. Uh, it was not the standard practice for list B, C, and D, um, but that is the practice that we are going to change. Ms. Fisher, are you embarrassed by this? I think it's unfortunate that it happened. Um, the agency should be reviewing the, uh, reviewing the full studies where we re where they have been uh, indicated to contain adverse health effects data. Uh, and we have moved very quickly to change it once, once we so found out that there was a problem. You're not sitting here defending this practice, are you? No, I think we should have been reviewing it all along. As you're familiar with the, earlier today, and I'm sure during the hearing, it's been uh, used a number of times. The New York Times had an article with respect to uh, this whole issue. And in that August uh, New York Times article, uh, uh, Representative George Brown, who was, as you know, the major author of FIFRA, uh, came uh, forward and said these following words, quote, this is a complete violation of congressional intent and is a very dangerous dereliction of duty, unquote. Do you agree with that quote? Not completely. Uh, first of all, the agency had been reviewing a lot of the 6A2 data that came in. As I said, the priority has been given to list A chemical 
chemicals, that's where the majority of the food use chemicals are. Um, that's where there is the most public exposure. So I think that we carried out our duties in large measure, but we did not carry them out completely. And that's what we have taken steps to address. Well, I think the point that uh, Congressman Brown was trying to make is that you're deluged with information, with thousands of studies which are arrived for re-registration. Now, we in Congress have constantly sought, I think it's safe to say, assurances from you all down at EPA that these studies were not going into some big black hole down there and uh, lie unreviewed as the registration program winds its way through uh, the mountains of data. Now, Section uh, 6A2 is always cited by you all when you come up here as that safety net. And this was the assurance that you've been giving us for years that priority problems would be identified and dealt with at first. Now, let me read you another quote from that same article. And this one's by Dr. Jack Moore, a person whose job you now hold. Let me quote him. Quote, I told them, and he means Congress, the salvation of an avalanche of data was this effective mechanism to flag those studies that showed an adverse effect. My expectation was then, and as it is now as a citizen, that any time a piece of information comes in stamped, quote, notice of adverse effect, that it reads that day, that it's read that day. Now, did Jack not leave a pretty clear note and message on the last day of August? I think that that message was Jack's opinion in 1991. You'd have to ask him what happened when he was managing the program during the first year of FIFRA 88. Well, let's ask you this. How big is the problem? How many 6A, uh, Section 6A2 studies about pesticides have been sitting around the agency? Um, we have spent the past month uh, working feverishly to clarify the number of studies that uh, have come into the agency, uh, the ones that have been reviewed and the remaining ones that are not currently reviewed. Uh, to date, there are 27 studies that have not been reviewed and they affect 14 chemicals. 27 studies, 14 chemicals. How quickly will they be reviewed? The, the remaining studies uh, have been scheduled for review. Each of them, and I believe a list has been given to your staff, has a date that we believe the review will be finished by, and I think the package of them will be finished by about the middle of November. Now, Ms. Fisher, on page 13 of your testimony, you imply that one reason only, uh, that the one reason only that the summary of metam sodium study was examined at the time is that because the birth defects were reported as not statistically significant. But then if you'll turn to your testimony on page 15, you state that the current estimate of the margin of safety for the pesticide is only two times expected exposure, and as a result, you've now removed uh, for homeowner uses, uh, made a pesticide of a restricted use product and required protective equipment, as you just announced. Now, if you had calculated the margin of safety and only two when that study was first received, wouldn't you have imposed those same restrictions that you're now imposing? Um, a, a couple of points. First of all, when we rece receive 6A2 data, you only uh, have that particular study in front of you. You may or may not have exposure information uh, to add to it, to tell Did you, you whether... you have that exposure stuff? No, the yeah. exposure study actually, uh, the exposure information we use to make these calculations, uh, we did for uh, purposes of, of this hearing and to get a handle on what are the risks from metam sodium, but the exposure scenario was really a surrogate database that was uh, from the, the chemical T loan. It is not an actual exposure database for metam sodium. The registrants are generating that for us and we should have it next spring. Uh, so at the time we would have reviewed the study, had we reviewed it in May, we only would have had the adverse um, effects that showed up in that particular study in front of us. Now we could have used that, same as we are using the T-Loan now, um, to make a decision to, to, to try to restrict the uses uh, to the homeowner or to the, to the workers. Well, my, I guess the question is, would such a uh, low margin of safety have led uh, to further study and further attention and action? I think if we, 
yes, let me let me clarify. Definitely, if we had read the study a year ago when we got the flag, um, we undoubtedly would have taken some action to to get an exposure scenario and see whether we had to to restrict uses as we are now doing. Um, so there is a chance that this three or four year exposure that was out the exposure of the drug, I mean the pesticide being out there wouldn't have been out there because it would have triggered the study that would have then concluded what you're now concluding. I, I think the time frame I would use is the last year when we got the 6A2 flag. Well, let me conclude and again thank the chairman for uh, the privilege of being here today. Let me also announce, and I think Ms. Fisher, you're aware of it, that we are presently involved in this investigation. GAO is looking at it and that we're going to have some hearings either in late October or early November. The purpose of those hearings uh, is going to be uh, basically to look at uh, 6A2 and other parts of it. I've got to tell you, and I, I want to put you on notice so that you don't think I uh, blindside you then, I don't want you coming in there testifying to me that, uh, yes, we've got a problem, but we we're going to fix it. We're deeply concerned, or, quote, uh, there are gaps in the coverage. Uh, because those answers and those types of uh, uh, statements are not going to be acceptable. Uh, we are very sincere and serious about getting this program in, uh, in control. And I think Ms. Boxer's hearings uh, have focused the importance and the personal element uh, uh, for the need for them. So we look forward to those hearings in late October and early November well, with you. We also are trying to get the program in shape, Congressman Sinar. Uh, and we have worked feverishly to try to address this problem, uh, which is a serious one. There's no question about it. And if your hearing is scheduled for some time in November, perhaps we'll have reviewed all the studies by then. Just one final thing. I don't think Jack Moore is going to be looking for you on the A party list since you passed the buck back to him. <laughs> Thank you. He managed the program for six years. Ms. Fisher, why did California EPA have to dig up the studies and warn the women that they might have miscarriages and trouble? Where were you? Where was this agency? The, we had not uh, reviewed those studies at the time, and I think we actually are rather fortunate that Dr. Jackson went back and, and found those studies and brought them to our attention. But you looked at the summaries. That's correct. We the did summaries look. talk about it. The summaries show you what happened to the fetuses in those animal tests. When our reviewer looked at the summary, uh, they did not deem it necessary at the time to review the whole study. Uh, that this is, is in the summary. I understand that. Their opinion was different than yours, um, and that is why we have changed the practice. No, 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 not different from mine. How about different from the California EPA, who immediately warned... No, the California the EPA people. had... The, the California Department of Health had read the whole study. They did not. Re they did not three read. Years, three years ago. They read the whole study a few years back. They did not read just the summary. So, if you had seen the summary and you had seen the number of dead implantations that's in here, it wouldn't have flagged it. We we had we certainly had a group right before us who felt that this should have flagged it. It's right here. Did you see this chart? Did anyone in your agency see it? It's in the summary. Yes, the chart was part of a summary, obviously. They did read that, but there are two points to make. And uh, one has to do with what is the, de the definition of developmental toxicity. In its broadest definition, it isn't simply just the structural malformations that are referred to in this particular study at the high dose, the ones that refer to the neural tube defects. Those particular data points were not statistically significant. They occurred in the presence of significant toxicity to the maternal animal, a point of contention in the scientific community about its significance. There were increased numbers of fetal resorptions at the low dose and the highest in the middle dose, but not at the second dose. So okay. Let me ask you this. When Madam Sodium spilled, <clears throat> California EPA came out with the shocking information way after that pregnant women could be in trouble. What did you do then? Did you go back and read the, the whole study? Yes, we went back and read it in a few days. And what did you say publicly to those people in Dunsmuir? I th basically, we have, we've worked with California EPA uh, and uh, supported the statement that they made to the people. So federal EPA made a statement saying they supported what California EPA was saying about Madam Sodium? 
I don't know that federal EPA was ever act, asked to speak to the people about the study. We have worked in a very coordinated fashion with the state of California in dealing with the people out there, both on the response side uh, as well as after we found these studies, when we went back to review them, we have spent a lot of time talking to them. Um, from our perspective, we thought it was important that, that the people that were in charge of the response and dealing with the public maintain that role, and we've been working with them. Ms. Fisher, that's good, but I want to tell you something. Menem sodium doesn't just go to California, does it? No, but the people in California... I'm, I'm asking you a question. Does menem sodium go to other states in this union? Yes, it does. On train? Potentially. In reality? I train? assume so. I would. Unless the company walks it to every door in America. Does it go by truck? Potentially. How are most chemicals transported in this country? I assume by truck or train. Good. You're right. They do. And this is the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States of America. I'm not and you and, 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 and that metam sodium could spill any day, any time, any place, presumably. It seems to me that the Environmental Protection Agency, upon following the lead of California, and I'm proud because I'm from that state, I'm distressed that the Environmental Protection Agency of America didn't take the lead, but I'm proud that California did. If you agree with them, and you say you did, and you back them up, and you're working with them, what are you doing throughout the rest of the country? What are you doing about this chemical? It's still being carried the same way. What are you doing about that today? Now, the people that were exposed and have reason to be concerned because of their level of exposure were the people in the Dunsmuir area. What are you doing about the potential in your own admission that this chemical is being shipped today by train and by truck all over America? What have you done since you realized that you had made an error and not read the full report? You had relied on the chemical company's summary, which amazes me in and of itself, but I'm well, glad you're error, admitting the that. Error in what not are you reading, doing today? The error in reading, not reading the study itself, uh, although an important one, does not have any bearing on whether under today's practices it would be listed. In other words, the fact that a chemical such as metamsodium or many others might cause uh, reproductive effects is not today a criteria for getting it uh, listed or regulated um, for transportation purposes. That's the area that we are looking at. What criteria, environmental and health, beyond those we currently have, uh, should we be paying attention to uh, to get more chemicals listed? I think a lot well, of I, them... I don't want to talk about everything else. I want to zero in on a substance that spilled in a river, killed 45 miles of the river, sent 300 people to emergency rooms, caused one case of a cardiac problem. There's reports of miscarriages and a stillborn birth. The California public health people say they don't know if there are long-term effects, but people are still having symptoms and problems. What are you doing, EPA America, today as we sit here to stop metam sodium from being transported in the exact same way it was transported in July? What are you doing on that specific chemical? We are working with DOT to see that this chemical and others like it and others that are potentially worse than it will be listed where that's appropriate. But other than meeting with the company and telling them that people who use it now have to wear protective gear, you haven't done anything about not repeating this accident, is what you're telling me, except that you're, you're studying. No, we are looking to identify those chemicals such as metam sodium and others that are like it that we ought to be equally concerned about. I because agree. Because the next train accident probably isn't right. going to involve metam sodium. Well, we don't know. And, and get those uh, listed so that they can be transported and placarded appropriately. Right. Why can't you list metam sodium today? You have the ability to do that. Under which of my statutes? Well, I will show you in a moment which okay. one. I'm asking you, do you believe you have the ability to list metam sodium 
today under your emergency uh, laws. Show me the law. Or, excuse me, an administrative procedure. We'll give you the exact one, but you tell me if you have the ability under to FIFRA, do that. Under FIFRA, the pesticide law, we don't have the authority to list it. Um, under CERCLA, we can uh, go through some process to make it considered a hazardous uh, substance. You can go through some process. What do you mean? We can go through the regulatory process to have it listed as a hazardous substance. How about... Administrative, Proce Administrative Procedures Act Governing Rulemaking 5 U.S. Code Section 553 provides that a requirement for proposed rulemaking does not apply if an agency finds it's impractical, unnecessary, or contrary to the public interest, that you can bypass all this. If you don't mind, I'd like to have one of the Superfund experts please, come up. Please do. Go ahead. Madam yes. Chair, I'm, I'm Tim Fields with Hi. the Superfund Welcome. program. Uh, yes, we, we're familiar with the provision that you uh, have just read. We are looking at that provision. It, it, as you know, it has to, it has to, we have to document a good cause as to why we use those emergency authorities. We're working with our also. Let me give you one. Yeah, I, I, I'm aware of the... 45 right. miles of a river dead. Right. 300 people sent to emergency rooms. Right. People we, settling mm -hmm. because they're out of work. And those That's just are, a few. And those are exactly the considerations we're looking at. Uh, we're You're looking our, at that we're now. We're looking at those criteria and seeing whether or not it's feasible to make that good cause exception to the Administrative Procedures Act to do an emergency listing of the chemical. But right now, we have not made a final determination. We are, as, as Ms. Fish has indicated, looking at a variety of lists, including particularly those that include metam sodium, like the Marlpole list, the list of Coast Guard regulations, and finally the active ingredient pesticides. Those all three, those three lists include metam sodium. We're looking now at those three lists and determining how those chemicals compare with other chemicals that are currently on the circle list, and we'll be making a determination shortly as to whether or not those chemicals ought to also be listed and added to the hazardous substances list. Okay, my now, understanding how quickly I could this go? How quickly could this go? Uh, given 5 U.S. Code Section 553, which enables you to bypass all the necessary time um, because it's, it might be contrary to the public interest to, to wait, how long will it be before you decide to use that Administrative Procedures Act? I, th I think actually the, the quickest way METAM is going to get uh, listed might be through the expansion of the definition of poison uh, that DOT has put in place, which as I understand it is going to capture greater concentrations um, or lesser concentrations of METAM sodium, and that probably is going to be the quickest way to get it listed. Well, I'm asking you what your agency is going to do. I understand. Because I'll tell you, the last time I had this, it was DOT blaming EPA and EPA saying DOT. Well, actually, I'm asking you what your agency can do. Now, my staff has discovered this ability for you, which you didn't volunteer until your staff came up, 5 U.S. Code, well, he Section 553. Well, he's in charge of that office that manages that statute. Well, I think it's why. a pretty basic power you have. It's a heck of a power. Because if I was in your boots, I would exercise it today after what we learned. You know, you're reading studies that are sitting on shelves gathering dust. We had a real life accident. Mr. Riggs can tell you about it because a lot of his people were in it. Lasting effects. We've got the proof. You know, you can read summaries from now till night. We know what happened. You've got the ability to do this. Now, the issue is Will you do it? And what your staff is saying, you're looking at whether or not you'll do it. And I need to know when you'll have an answer for this subcommittee as to whether or not you've decided that metam sodium and what you now know about it has done enough harm that it's contrary to the public interest to wait any longer. When will this subcommittee have that answer? On the first two, two quick responses, on the Administrative Procedure Act exception, good cause exception, we can utilize, we should make it, we should have a definitive decision on that in about three weeks, as whether or not we have the criteria based on what you cited, you know, the 45 miles, the hundreds of thousands of fish, et cetera. We're, we're looking at that very carefully. We should have a definitive opinion in about three weeks. On the other issue of whether or not we, the other list we're looking at for that metam sodium is currently on, whether or not they ought to be added to the circle has the substances list, we should have a decision on the regular rule 
rulemaking issue in about three months, by the beginning of January. Okay. So we'll have an answer from you in three weeks as to whether or not you believe Madam Sodium should immediately be added to your list. That's helpful, and that's good. And I hope the answer is it's, it's added. Just a moment. Okay. How's this? You've got a real good reason to move on this. You should do it this afternoon. Forget three weeks. This is the Administrative Procedures Act, some of the language. The good cause exception. Immediate action is necessary to reduce or avoid health hazards or other imminent harm to persons or property. Yeah. We've got the proof. You heard it today from the people who lived through it. So I don't know why it's going to take three weeks, but we'll hold you to the three weeks. And what I'm going to do in the meantime is put a bill into Congress here that will force you to do that. I hope I don't have to. It's a long thing for us to get. You know how a bill becomes a law? It takes a long time. You can do it quicker. So I'm going to put that bill in and hope that that will move you a quicker to your goal, to our goal, of seeing Madam Sodium put on this list. Um, Dr. Goldman has testified, she's from the public health of the state of California, that state EPA officials had a great deal of trouble getting information on the metam sodium studies because they allegedly contained, quote, trade secrets and were kept in a locked room. <coughs> this seems to me to be an outrage. Here's a product. It's going all around the country. We know it. As, as we sit here, it's going on some train or some bus or some truck. So the information's locked in a room. What's your response to this? There is a remarkably strong CBI, con con Confidential Business Information Protection, offered under the statute to registrants of the pesticide, generally. Uh, FIFRA, the, again, the pesticide statute, offers um, them tremendous opportunity to declare things CBI, and there is a uh, process that the agency has to go through before we can release it, even to state um, government what's your, officials. What's your reaction to that? Um, a couple things. First of all, the agency is, is going to publish um, a policy, and we're going to try to work with the chemical industry uh, to get a better, clearer, quicker ability to release CBI information in a case like this. Uh, and what does CBI stand for? I'm sorry, confidential business information. By statute, the, the chemical companies are afforded um, a protection where they can declare something trade secret, and then there's a lot of constraints that are put on the federal government before we, we release it even to a state government official. Um, I think uh, we need to look at it. We may need some statutory changes. In the meantime, since as you acknowledged it takes a while to get laws passed, uh, we're going to issue a policy uh, in the Federal Register that would enable the EPA to release that kind of data. Um, Did that CBI inhibit you from reacting once the spill occurred and people were hurt? I don't think it inhibited us from reacting um, as an agency. Uh, I think it inhibited us in sharing some of the information we had with the state of California, um, although with respect to these two studies, it's my understanding they already had them. Uh, so in other words, it's very possible that you're sitting on some studies that you haven't read them all. You've read the summaries but you're going to read all of them now. But you, you're sitting, you could be sitting on some studies of chemicals that are as deadly as metam sodium, and it could spill somewhere in another state that isn't fortunate enough to have a California EPA yeah. that has this information. And you're not going to be able to tell them uh, what these studies showed? Um, hang on just one second. Sure. Um, Penny suggested that the problem was more getting their information. The state health department was having some problem getting re release of the studies to the from CBA. from, from the California Department of Agriculture as well. That they were running into the same kind of of CBI type problems. Um, I think what we did in that instance, and we could do it in another instance, <laughs> um, is we worked with our regional office 
to get information. Well, let me ask you this. If there's an emergency like this and such a chemical spills and people are in danger, are you saying we need to change some kind of rule or some kind of law here before you can tell people what the danger is? No, I think... What are we? Some of the information we could make available with respect to health and safety uh, concerns. It wasn't as though there was a complete block. I think one of the issues... The well, there was a complete block. Well, I'm not Those positive that's correct. I think the area that there was a bigger problem with was what was the actual formulation of the product that spilled, what what was the mixture, the, uh, the formula... Um, is the part that we had a, a big problem in. It was days and days and days afterwards that pregnant women knew they were in trouble, okay? That, that's correct. But that I don't think was completely uh, the, the CBI problem. I think that the uh, information on, on what, was, what we knew about metam sodium um, was not where the CBI issue came up. I believe it was more with what was the formula actual form formation of the the product, how much of it was the active ingredient, metam sodium, how much of it was in an, an inert ingredient okay. or a different chemical. Well, the California EPA disagrees with you. They said they had a real problem with that issue. Um, I, I'm not disputing that they had some problems. I, I thought I made that clear, that the statute is rather confining, uh, and we may need to take a look at what we can do to fix it to allow the agency, uh, in some limited circumstances, such as accidents, uh, to release more of that kind of data. When will you look at that? Oh, we're looking at it right now. I've already, uh, in fact, talked to uh, the, the Ag Chemical Association and okay. told them that this is not acceptable. Okay, I have one last question. I've introduced a bill with Congressman Sinor and Congressman Herger that would change the definition of hazardous material for the Department of Transportation to include materials that pose significant ri risks to the environment. Right now, it's significant risk, as you know, to people and property. In addition, it would require regular consultation between DOT and EPA on regulating materials posing risks to the environment during transportation. What is your reaction to that legislation? Um, it, 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 having not read it, it's hard to, to, to give you a precise opinion, but it sounds a lot along the lines of what we are doing. Uh, in other words, when I spoke earlier, the fact that we are looking at um, the need to set new criteria. How many minutes left? When I said earlier, we're looking at setting new criteria that would reflect broader health effects and include environmental effects um, as reasons to regulate chemicals in transportation. It sounds as though you are picking up what process we are beginning to put in place. Well, let me put it this way. I'm not picking it up. I had testimony from the person you sent to the last hearing <laughs> who said if it causes harm to the environment, it doesn't matter. We don't worry about it. And that's why we went ahead, and Mr. Riggs is also an original co-sponsor of that bill. What we're going to have to do is go vote. Are you going to come back and then do some questioning? So if you could all stay. Thank you. We stand adjourned again. Okay. Thank you for all your patience. Um, I'm hoping that Mr. Riggs will come back, so I would just like to um, make one more comment or question to um, Ms. Fisher and ask her to stay here in case he does come back. Two recent developments regarding EPA's record on regulating materials um, gives me pause to, it gives great pause to my confidence in EPA. First, the announcement last month that EPA would partially ban the use of a pesticide, pesticide parathion, which has caused 70 deaths and thousands of illnesses among farm workers over the past 30 years. In this case, Ms. Fisher, you were quoted by in the Washington Post as saying, quote, we've not been very quick to get off the dime on this. And second is a GAO report in a congressional hearing yesterday that revealed that EPA is one of several regulatory agencies that does not adequately protect the public against the effects of chemicals, uh, particularly on the human reproductive system. And um, that you really have not required tests for these types of effects. So, I mean, along the lines of Mr. Sinar's questioning, uh, given these criticisms and given these reports and given what happened in Dunsmuir, and given that you haven't done anything yet except 24 hours ago, which I'm glad about, and you're looking at doing something maybe, and we'll find out in three weeks about putting metamsodium on a list, what can you tell people 
of California and the people of America. Um, what can you tell them to give them some confidence in this agency, First given, of all, let's your, talk given about these uh, problems that you've had? Let's talk about Parathion. Uh, what we announced um, about a month ago actually was an action to get rid of 100% of Parathion. The first step of that was one that would take place immediately, and that's because we reached a negotiated agreement with the registrant that would lead to a very quick uh, stop use of parathion where it causes the most risks, and that's to workers in vegetable uh, fields and in fruit fields um, and in those kind of crops. Uh, we did that with a, with a negotiated agreement, which was a much quicker process than we could have done under any of our statutory authority. The second step uh, is where we are going to exercise our statutory authority and go ahead and move to cancel. Under FIFRA, the cancellation process uh, laid out in the statute, and we have actually asked the Congress to fix the statute, is a very lengthy procedure. So we think the parathion um, settlement plus the regulatory action that's going to come on its heels to get rid of the, the uh, remaining uses is, is a very good one. The highest risk uses are going to be gone quickly. Uh, the risks that are do not stack up as high, um, we are going to move with our cancellation process and deal with that over the coming year and a half. That is a problem we have with the statute, and we have asked the Congress to fix the law so that we can move more quickly against pesticides uh, that cause problems. With respect to the GAO report, I think they really mischaracterized, especially in the pesticide program, what we do with respect to testing uh, for reproductive effects. Currently, um, new chemicals coming onto the market have to be fully tested uh, against reproductive and developmental uh, effects and as part of our re-registration process, the older chemicals uh, registrants are required to produce data on those. And in fact, we have a lot of data um, on those those effects already in hand. Well, in 1962, there were warnings against this parathion. It caused 70 deaths. Parathion, uh, we have been aware of its, its risks for a long time. When it was registered, people knew it was acutely toxic to workers. Uh, because of that, it has been held both by the state of California and the federal EPA to very high standards, worker protection standards. Um, but we didn't think that those were working appropriately. Uh, there were better substitutes that have come online, and that's why we moved to get the chemical off the market. But you agree you've not been very quick to get off the dime on that. Well, it took us a while uh, to make the decision. One of the problems um, is that uh, under FIFRA, again, the pesticide statute, we have to weigh risks against benefits. And we worked with USDA uh, to develop a lot of benefits data on parathion and found that there were safer substitutes, and that's why we could make the decision to get rid of it. But then again, that statute that I pointed out would give you the ability to move quicker. No, you did not point out that statute. I'm talking about FIFRA, the pesticide. No, law. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the statute that gives you the ability to move a pesticide quickly, to remove it quickly. You have no emergency there is powers to do that. We, we have emergency powers to get pesticides off the market. You do? Uh, yes, we do. Under, and we um, threatened to use that authority um, quickly I should say by FIFRA definition is um, perhaps not quickly by everybody else's definition. Um, the settlement we agreed with the registrants to get uh, most of those the field uses um, or fruit and vegetable uses off the market was actually going to be quicker than what we could exercise under the statute. Mm -hmm. So you threatened to use that? Yes, that's correct. So when will that pesticide be completely off? The, market. the um, fruit and vegetable uses, again, where you have the most worker exposure, because that's where people are actually in the fields picking, uh, will be over uh, as of January 1. Uh, most of the seasonal uses of that uh, pesticide are over. In other words, the growing season is concluded, so we think the risks this fall are actually rather um, small. They will be officially illegal for use as of January 1. The field uses, where the corn, the wheat, and the soybeans uh, will stay on with additional protective equipment while we go through uh, a cancellation proceeding, and that proceeding probably will take about a year. So getting back to my question, what can you tell the people of California and the people of America with about the EPA today to give them confidence that it won't take 70 worker deaths, that it won't take more uh, spills with 
miscarriages and so on. What, what can you tell me to give me the confidence that this critical report, this subcommittee, uh, Mr. Sinar's comments, um, that you're hearing us? I think that we have taken a number of actions on chemicals in the past couple of years uh, to reduce exposure to the public, to get them off the market uh, when that has been necessary. I think with the uh, amendments to the law that the Congress uh, passed and the President signed in 1988, uh, we have changed our uh, managing of the program uh, significantly. Uh, we will be making decisions on a lot of chemicals, getting a lot more test data in over the coming years because of that law, uh, and, and making decisions on whether they need to come off the market or, in fact, can stay safely, safely on. Mr. Roberts, would you like to go forward? Good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Alan I. Roberts, Associate <coughs> Administrator for Hazardous Material Safety in the Research and Special Programs Administration of the Department of Transportation. And with me is Judith Coletta, our Chief Counsel. I've submitted to the committee a uh, subcommittee a uh, written statement, and I do not intend to repeat that statement, uh, except to point out that on page two, I point out that we intend to publish, we hope to publish a rulemaking before the end of the year implementing the MARPOL Annex Three. I should point out that the Coast Guard list that's been referred to on many occasions comes from Coast Guard Annex 2, which has been in effect for several years. The Coast Guard published its regulations in 46 CFR subchapter O under the term dangerous cargoes. And uh, there is no such thing as a hazardous materials list in the United States Coast Guard. My office and our agency issues all rules and regulations pertaining to the transportation of materials identified as hazardous materials by tra in transportation by air, highway, rail, and water. Uh, I have no further comments concerning my statement, Madam Chair, but we'll be glad to respond to okay. questions. Thank you, because I really just want to get to the heart of um, why you haven't moved to put metamsodium on the list. Um, you have the authority to do that, and you still haven't done it, and I'm asking you why that would be. As I just pointed out, Madam Chair, we plan to issue a notice of proposed rulemaking within the next few months, before the end of the year. Well, I know. That isn't good enough for this committee. You have the ability to move forward now and take a chemical that has all these problems that hurt people, destroyed a river, and you're talking about making a study that you'll let us know in a few months. No, I indicated that we intend to open up a rulemaking proceeding and How long will that take? Proposal. We went through that the last hearing. Well, this is not a, this will not be a very complicated uh, rulemaking in many senses because of the scope of the Marpole Convention, the fact that it is already a ratified international treaty. That's one point. Secondly, I would not have visualized it's going to be a very difficult process because there's already been indication of public support for such an action on, by the chemical industry. The chemical industry supports putting metamsodium and these other chemicals on the list. They did not refer to metamsodium. They're referring to the chemicals addressed by the MARPOL list. Now, you must understand, as stated in my statement, more than half of all the chemicals in the MARPOL list are currently regulated by DOT. And when we complete the uh, rulemaking, if we adopt a final rule pursuant to the, the uh, process, uh, we will probably be regulating more than 90% of all the pesticides transported in commerce. So uh, your, your answer remains the same as it did the last time I had this hearing. Which no, is my answer is a little bit different, Madam Chair. Oh, uh, it is. Well, why don't you explain to me how it's different? Because you gave me the same answer the last time that I can remember. Go ahead. Explain to me how it's well, different. Well, I would suggest that what I've done this time is given you a form of a commitment that we intend to proceed with a rulemaking within a specified time frame. And, this, and the time is when? Before the end of the year. And what, and what happens? How does that go? We're currently developing a notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, to and we are processing the entire uh, Annex 3 MARPOL list. And That's the Coast Guard list. It's not a Coast Guard list. It's the international It's the international list, list of the, for the Maritime Pollution Convention. Does that, is that equal, about equal to the Coast Guard list? Would they have similar chemicals? The Coast Guard has no list under Annex 3 of MARPOL. It never has. 
Does it the Coast Guard have a list of materials? Coast Guard has a dangerous cargoes list for bulk ships, for tankers, right. That's under right. Annex 2 of the Marpole Convention. What we've been speaking to is Annex 3 of Marpole, which was just signed by the President on June 10th and placed on file in London uh, on July 1st for formally going into effect on July 1st, 1992. And this Coast Guard list that they have, do you think we ought to incorporate it immediately into uh, the list you already use so that items like men of sodium would be included immediately on the list? In accordance with the rulemaking procedures of our department, yes. I think that we should move forward to propose its inclusion as a hazardous material under our regulations. Why wouldn't you use your emergency powers to move it quicker? Well, I've explained this repeatedly, and it's mentioned in my testimony. But well, you uh, didn't read your testimony, so explain to me why you wouldn't use your emergency procedures. I would not think it would be justified. You don't think it's justified to move in an emergency when metam sodium caused the havoc to the community that it caused, caused more than likely several miscarriages and one stillborn baby, caused blistering on feet, caused congestive heart failure in one person, caused many other problems with breathing, you don't think that that would be enough justification for you to move with your emergency procedures. I want to know if, if that's what you're saying. As I indicate in my testimony, the, we see nothing coming from adoption of the um, Marpole list, which would include metam sodium and concentrations down to 10% uh, concentration, <coughs> that would have uh, changed the outcome of the accident uh, in the Sacramento River. Well, that completely, of course, um, goes against uh, comments made at the last hearing, in which there were comments that the uh, tank car would have been placed in a different part of the train, uh, and many other issues would have been quite different in terms of marking on the car, etc. Um, so I won't go backwards. I just want to move forwards. Well, may I respond um, to that, please? Yes, you certainly may. The regulations for car placement are found in 49 CFR uh, Part 174. Materials such as hazardous substances that come to us from CERCLA, this is materials like saccharin, adepic acid, food additives, numerous chemicals, are re currently regulated by the U.S. Department of Transportation in a category or classification called Orem E. This is currently under a new rulemaking we've just issued will be converted to a United Nations Class 9, consistent with what the United Nations has done for worldwide transport. transport. Class 9 materials are not currently subject to car placement requirements under our regulations. Um, you, know, I, you know what you need to read is the discussion that the workers had that night in their frustration when they had no idea of what they were carrying. And for you to sit in front of me and say to me that it wouldn't have made any difference is essentially saying that our laws don't make any difference. Because in fact, had it been carried that way, there would have been placards on the side of that very tank car. There would have been immediate information. We wouldn't have had a series of confusion. People didn't know. And I really would like to, uh, at some point, share with you some of the comments made. Because what you're saying indicates to me that you don't think it means anything to put any of these chemicals on the list because, in fact, the people themselves who carry these products are complaining that more of them should be carried in a marked fashion, not fewer. So it says to me that you don't know what's happening on the ground. And while you're answering that, I'm going to dig out those well, comments I, so that you can um, see what I, they I said. I can uh, only respond by saying that the information and that was related in the last hearing concerning the way bill, the information that was available, the information you had available this morning concerning communication with Chemtrek well conveyed the fact that there was a this chemical was present. Uh, we did not see any uh, part factor that related to miscommunication of this material that led to the consequences of the accident. When the car came off the bridge, it was a DOT specification tank car. It was punctured. Uh, weighed about a, uh, weighed, it was a very heavy car. weighed about 125 tons. And a tremendous amount of energy was delivered into the shell of that car when it hit the river. Right. And the material discharged. And uh, I'm not happy about that. I'm not happy about that, regardless of what product was in the, uh, the tank car. 
But the question we have to ask ourselves in, in engaging in emergency powers, which, you know, for example, would be done if we had uh, an, a compound that turned out to be explosive that was being shipped in some innocuous way and posed a substantial threat, uh, that we would take prob probably take emergency action. In this case, we happen to know that there are several hundreds of materials that have like hazards that need to be brought into this process, and we cannot bring them all in on an emergency basis. Okay, let me just say, because they can't find the exact words, but I have it in my head. One of the first things that the, uh, the dispatcher said is, you mean that this material isn't being carried in a K car? K car? And the fact K car is their language for hazardous materials. The fact of the matter is it would have made a difference. The fact of the matter is we know what it did. The fact of the matter is it wouldn't hurt anyone if you move quicker. And I'm very disappointed that you won't use your emergency powers that you could use. Um, and I, I guess I need to ask you, give me a time frame since you're moving on this list. And that's good that you're moving on this list. Give me the earliest date that you could have that MARPOL list incorporated into your list and give me the latest date and give me the latest date that you will have it incorporated. We will make every reasonable attempt to publish a notice of proposed rulemaking within the next two or three months. I mean this Go is on. the first and week of October. Yes and then and then. And then the shortest time frame we usually specify in our rulemakings for public comment because uh, for some reason or other the information about our rulemaking sort of travels west and uh, uh, this one will <laughs> uh, 30 days is usually the minimum time we specify in a rulemaking of this type I mean, that's absolutely minimum normally it's 60 days okay but we can we can deal with it in 30 days and then await anybody's request for an extension of time to file comments so and the, and the longest would be 60 days, is what you think? I would say so. I, uh, under those given circumstances, I would say that that would be a reasonable time frame. So that if all goes right, in 90 days we could have this completed? Well, we're required to analyze all the comments. We're required to comply with the terms of the, uh, the various statutory mandates that uh, okay, go with well all the federal rulemaking process. And, uh, and, and finish the process. And, and, uh, and what's the outside of of how long that would take? I, I would hope to have this in full force and effect prior to the effective date of the International Convention. And that date is? Next July 1st, 1992. That's only me speaking in terms of what I would hope would happen. You're hoping that metam sodium and other compounds like it will yes, be on our list by July 1992. Right. Now, if EPA acts, uh, under the other statute that I mentioned, and they Certainly. look like they're going to have an answer for us in three weeks on that, that will affect you as would well. It, would if it not? If I didn't quite understand the answer from EPA, but if they're talking about putting it on the circular list, uh, we automatically do that by final rule without notice and procedure. And the last time we did that, we did it within seven days of EPA's publication. So if they move, you can move within seven days on metam sodium. We have done it in the past. It's, uh, there is no notice and public procedure requirement uh, relative to that because the Congress has mandated that we will right. list and regulate uh, materials put, put on the list by EPA right. pursuant to that statute. So the bottom line of all this, it's been very instructive for me to cut through, is that if EPA does move and in three weeks decides that as a result of the metam sodium spill they want to move quicker, then you would, and you always have in the past, follow along and that metam sodium would be on the list, we wouldn't have to wait for the MARPOL list to, to have it on there. Is that correct? Well, the, you have to understand, uh, we have to base it on something. And uh, one of the things we're looking for in the interagency working groups, which is mentioned in our testimony, is uh, expanding our uh, general criteria uh, for environmentally hazardous substances. And we think this is a very critical effort because right now, in some areas, we're just looking at materials one by one. Now, the MARPOL list, comes from an organization called Gazump, which has a very long French name. But it's, uh, it's an international organization that's, that's been assessing uh, chemicals for many, many years relative to their effects on the environment. And that's where the MARPOL list comes from. And so we're jumping over several stages because uh, I have a grand total of four chemists on my staff and no budget whatsoever or no laboratory to research chemicals. So therefore, 
I must, we must avail ourselves of available mechanisms uh, throughout the world, internationally or domestically, uh, which we can latch on to. Uh, one of which is the MARPOL. And it's very fortunate okay. that it's easy for us to do it because it's a, it's a ratified convention. I understand, and I think getting through it, I hope the EPA acts, and then for sure we have a double chance at getting Menem Sodium on the list. Just, I, we did find what I wanted to tell you, the dispatcher says, just to show that it does help to have these cars marked. It does make a difference, and they count on it. It's their life, you know, if they're there. Mm -hmm. Well, now nobody can find out what's in, what in the hell's in this car. The train doesn't even show that it's dangerous. It doesn't show it's dangerous. It doesn't show it's a K train or nothing. And these guys are saying the fumes are so damn bad down there that Mahon could smell it before he even got down there just driving in. So if we ever wondered if what laws we pass work, I say they work. They have some sense of confidence if they see that it's in a specially marked car. So that's why I think it would have made a big difference in the way they acted. And um, I want to see this man of sodium get on the list as soon as possible. And I don't want to keep you here any longer than you've already been here. So I want to thank um, EPA and uh, RISPA for coming. If you wish to leave, and then we'll talk with FRA. And then we'll actually be finished with this marathon hearing. It started at 9.30. So thank you very much. And uh, Mr. English, why don't you uh, begin? Good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Edward R. English. I'm the Director of Safety Enforcement for the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, I have submitted a formal s statement for the record. Uh, I will not make an oral statement this time. However, Mr. Cawthon, our Associate Administrator for Safety, would like to make an oral statement this time. Sure. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, FRA appreciates the opportunity to be before you again to discuss matters related to the safety of railroad operations. Uh, in addition to uh, Mr. English, uh, with me today on uh, my immediate left are uh, Mr. H.T. Patton, who's our regional director for Region uh, 7, and uh, S. Mark Lindsay, who is our chief counsel. Um, I also have uh, submitted a prepared a statement for the record and ask it be included its entirety. I will, uh, I will briefly, in, in light of the hour, if that's satisfactory with the chair, just uh, summarize sure. uh, what has transpired since Mr. English last appeared before you. Uh, with respect to the, uh, the accident near Dunsmere, FRA has continued its investigation of the accident. Uh, we have um, completed um, initially a computer simulation of the train's operation across that territory. And um, the simulation indicates that as a result of the makeup of the train, its tonnage and placement of cars, and the topography of that railroad uh, with respect to grade and curvature, um, that uh, the uh, conditions precedent to the action did exist by virtue of, uh, of those factors. Uh, we've continued to look at the issue of the performance of locomotives in the accident. Uh, we continue to believe uh, at this stage in the investigation that uh, the locomotives were uh, uh, perhaps surging. Whether they uh, surged at the point of the accident uh, will never be known, uh, but we're continuing to look at that particular factor. Since the accident, uh, the Southern Pacific, as you've been told, has placed significant uh, uh, restrictions upon uh, train makeup in that territory. Uh, we will be looking at those restrictions and recent modifications that have been made to those restrictions to see if they effectively deal with the, the problem that was presented at the Kantara Loop on July the 14th. Um, the SB has also raised the track in the area, reducing the challenge with respect to train handling by locomotive engineers operating through that territory. 
Um, with respect uh, to the Sea Cliff accident, um, we've continued our investigation as well, and uh, we participated in the teardown of the failed bearing in the accident. Um, it appears uh, in that case that the uh, uh, mechanism of the bearing had uh, had lost lateral clamp uh, to to some limited degree. <coughs> Excuse me. As a result of um, uh, the uh, seals, cap screw seals on that bearing uh, setting, um, losing torque on the entire mechanism and permitting it to move slightly, creating the conditions for bearing failure. Um, we're looking right now at what can be done um, to, uh, with respect to that situation, there are a number of bearings out there uh, that were installed before 1988, uh, which of course have had a long service life since which may present a slightly greater uh, potential for failure than other bearings that do not have these seals under the uh, cap screws. And if, uh, if it's indicated, we'll take action on that front. Uh, these, this is the kind of defect that is not apparent in, in a train yard inspection. Uh, and so the action, that uh, responsive action, is not one particularly uh, with respect to this railroad or location but rather we would be looking at the entire, entire national fleet of roller bearing equipped cars. Um, I'd like to just uh, say a word or two in light of the, uh, uh, the uh, confusion which arose um, after uh, testimony in the immediate wake of the accident um, and, and address uh, FRA's commitment to railroad safety. Uh, there really uh, shouldn't, I think, if you look real hard at us, be any question about that. Uh, despite the often irregular and long hours that uh, Federal Railroad Safety personnel work to protect the safety of the public and railroad employees, um, uh, we, we do seem on occasion to be uh, the target of accusations. We're to too close to the railroads or we're too close to the labor unions. We hear that mostly from the railroads um, or to some other special interests. And uh, so we, we understand why the circumstances of the accident um, and the, the occupational hazard of being a federal railroad regulatory or federal regulatory agency would raise that question. But let me say first that we've been aggressive in addressing the, uh, the problems that we do have with the Southern Pacific Railroad in terms of compliance with our regulations, particularly in the motive power and equipment area, particularly the motive power area, the locomotive area. We'll continue to be aggressive. One irony here is that uh, our regional director, whom you've invited to the hearing, is a leading advocate and exemplar of the task force inspection strategy within the Federal Railroad Administration. And the Southern Pacific Railroad has frequently been the object of those inspections. Um, SP, um, uh, as you'll recall uh, from the correspondence that we've had since the last hearing, uh, did call uh, Mr. Patton at one point and complain about being inspected, but they, didn't, they weren't complaining for just being inspected because we're always inspecting. The Southern Pacific uh, Transportation Company, other railroads in California, and other railroads across the country. And the complaint arose because Mr. Patton knows when and how to inspect in a way that inflicts acute discomfort if necessary. This is not done for the purpose of harming the railroad. It's done for the purpose of getting the railroad's attention at a high level and making it apparent that lax compliance is not good business. Second, I'd like to note that there's no evidence that one canceled inspection um, out of uh, several task force inspections uh, on that particular railroad in this area uh, that month had anything to do with it, this accident. Third, um, when Mr. Patton received a call from the railroad's chief mechanical officer complaining of the prior task force inspection uh, at Tucson and two other inspections as well, he had fulfilled his initial objective of obtaining the attention of the railroad. That is, the railroad had been made aware of the need to address compliance, and the consequences of noncompliance had been amply illustrated in this particular, and we tried to, to illustrate that as necessary uh, uh, in a variety of other ways as well. Time at that point would be required to then for Mr. Patton and FRA to determine whether the railroad would actually respond with improved inspection and maintenance. One of the greatest challenges of operating a railroad is maintaining a locomotive fleet, uh, Madam Chair. A uh, piece of track, you can go out and send a system gang right through there and, and uh, replace a lot of ties and, uh, and, 
and surface the railroad and work the ballast and clean it up and put down continuous welded rail and, and the maintenance of that piece of railroad thereafter uh, is not going to be that difficult. It needs to be inspected, inspected with the required frequency and any problems need, need to be noted. Locomotive isn't so simple. A locomotive uh, has many parts and appurtenances. And when we say that a locomotive is defective, we mean that of the hundreds of items that one of our inspectors might look, on it, uh, look at on a locomotive, we found at least one of them with something wrong. So it's, it's quite a challenge uh, to maintain. And what it takes is commitment, a good quality control procedures, and adequate resources. And so time, uh, time was required to see whether this time uh, we were going to be ma able to make the further improvement in their compliance I'm history. I'm going to ask you to kind of wrap up, if you will. OK. Um, finally, I'll just note that uh, when we took our inspectors and moved them from one place to another, they were needed the other place. Um, and finally, um, we don't want to, we want our managers to exercise that kind of judgment. We want them to be flexible, to address the ever-changing safety problems that we do find on the railroad. Um, and uh, we believe that's uh, what we've done here. And we're happy to have the opportunity to respond to the question that the chair had about that issue. Yes, I will ask those questions to the gentleman sitting on either side of you. I wanted to ask you, um, PUC discussed in its written testimony the fact that a preemption clause in the Federal Rail Safety Act prevents states from enacting tougher safety rules in areas in which the federal government has already enacted rules. The effect of this is to essentially preempt California from enacting tougher laws or any other state on its own. Would you support allowing the states to enact their own more stringent safety rules? I, w I would first of all support as a policy matter uh, those states that are involved in the state participation program to work with us to determine what's required across the country that might be in common um, so that we can establish a regulatory agenda that's responsive uh, to, to everybody who's involved in this process. Uh, there, are, there are partners, uh, and we do have regular meetings with our state partners. But I didn't ask about that. Would you oppose or support legislation that gave any state the right to go beyond the safety, in other words, have tougher safety rules than the federal government has, and just set the federal government as the minimum standard? Well, I think that the, the FRA and the Secretary of Transportation over the years and uh, various administrations of both parties have supported the current division of state-federal responsibility with respect to railroad safety. So the answer is you don't. And uh, I don't know of any change in policy on that point. So the answer is you don't support a state preemption in safety. Well, uh, Madam Chair, it's, it's a very complicated subject area. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm just of, trying to find out yes. because it has been suggested by the state PUC that this would be helpful. They yeah. want to do tougher, more stringent rules, and they're prevented from doing it. And I just wanted to know if you supported or opposed that. If you oppose it, fine. Just say it. Well, uh, Madam Chair, if I may, there are certain things that the states may do and already do do that are in areas where we've not specifically regulated. Um, for instance, uh, you were told today that they look at clearances, uh, and the state has specific clearance requirements. Well, I'm not asking about a specific thing. I'm saying as a general policy. I could ask it of any federal official. And, and, a, and as a general policy, yeah. you, if you have problems that cut across state lines, you want them to be addressed in a uniform manner. OK, fine. So the answer is no. The um, answer is as I stated it, Madam Chair. I don't know what it is about some of the people who come to me from these agencies. I don't, I respect your opinion. Thank it's OK if we disagree. But let's not insult each other's intelligence. The answer is no. I accept that. The way you said it, I boil it down to. Thank you. No. Thank you. OK. Um, Mr. English. On July the 31st, you testified before this subcommittee on the July 14th derailment. And I remember distinctly thanking you for how upfront I thought you were with me. 
Under oath, you specifically denied having any knowledge of any FRA inspections of the SP Railroad that were called off because of financial problems that might result from findings of widespread violations. However, on August 15, 1991, Mr. Pat, Regional Director of FRA, testified before the California Assembly Transportation Committee and admitted that he had canceled an FRA inspection of SP's West Colton Yard. He further testified that he had informed you of his decision to cancel that July 24th inspection. Now, who is the subcommittee supposed to believe? Uh, I, I told you the truth on July 31st, and I said that I could not either, neither confirm nor deny uh, that statement, that an uh, inspection on the SP had been canceled. I, I did not remember, remember at that point, I, and uh, I still do not remember talking to Mr. Patton. I don't deny that he did. Uh, I am sure that uh, we did have conversation. I talk to uh, a number of regional directors uh, every day on a, a great uh, variety of subjects, and, uh, and changing inspection priorities is one of them. I don't, uh, I, I don't remember that conversation, uh, and, uh, uh, but I still I support that decision that Mr. Patton made. When we asked you why this canceled inspection was not on information provided to the subcommittee, you replied in essence that canceled inspections are not accounted for or tracked. This greatly concerns me. How many FRA inspections of SP have been canceled in the past two years? And how about for other railroads? Well, uh, Madam Chair, uh, our regional directors and, and people in the region uh, change inspection priorities uh, very frequently. Uh, for example, uh, the inspectors that went to investigate the derailment that we're talking about at Dunsmuir uh, canceled inspections to make that investigation. Uh, whenever we investigate an accident, there are inspections canceled. Uh, there are a number of other uh, reasons for canceling inspections. One is to look at, uh, uh, look at complaints. One is uh, 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 issues come up uh, on other railroads that may require us to switch priorities. Uh, it is not an unusual situation. Uh, it never has been, and it, and it will probably never will be uh, unusual to do that uh, uh, and switch inspection priorities. Well, here you have a railroad that has the, the worst record in California, and you, you switch. You walk out in the middle of an inspection. Uh, we had, uh, we had conducted uh, uh, a number of inspections during that month, uh, filed an, a, a large number of defects and violations, uh, and, uh, and yes, we did stop the inspection on that, uh, in June. However, uh, I think that uh, as noted in information provided to your staff, you will see that during the month of July, we conducted um, a, a number of other inspections on the SP, looking at both locomotives and cars. So uh, again, it, it not an unusual situation. So you can't tell me how many FRA inspections of SP have been canceled in the past two years or any of the other railroads? No, I you cannot. You don't keep records of that? No, we do not. Of called off inspections, okay. Now when the subcommittee asked you why the July 24th inspection list which you provided to the subcommittee did not contain the February 1990 FRA inspections of SP, which found that 100% of the locomotives examined, 53 out of 53, were defective, you replied, the inspections were omitted from the listing due to clerical oversight. Uh, yes, and the, and the information that we provided to your staff, uh, I think that was the answer that we gave you, yes. Do you understand why it might be hard for us to believe that? Uh, no, I don't. You don't? No. Well, just how many other emissions do you think there are? And how many clerical errors uh, can we expect to hear about? Uh, as far as I know, there are no other clerical errors. Uh, we, uh, but it we just so happens the one that showed 100% failure rate wasn't in the package. 
we uh, we tried to provide uh, all the data that uh, that your staff staff asked for, uh, provide it to them in a timely fashion, and and provide you with honest information. You heard our earlier comments on SP's increasing accident rate in California and the increasing incidence of SP employee injuries, yet FRA inspections of SP are on the decline. Why would that be, Mr. English? Uh, the, uh, uh, when, when we look at the overall uh, FRA activities uh, on SP, uh, the, the number of uh, inspection units uh, are on the, actually on the rise, uh, Madam Chair. So you're inspecting more? We are before. inspecting more. Okay. Well, I have to tell you, FRA Region 7 inspection data, inspections of locomotives, 2,253 and 88, 2,110 and 89, 2,074 and 90, 1,421 in 91 up to July 31st so it looks like a downward trend are you saying you're going to reverse that now what I am saying is that that the overall inspection activity and and I was not referring to just in California but our overall inspection activity with all of our people are is on the increase throughout the SP system so when I look at these at the end of 1991, um, I'm going to be able to say that uh, you're inspecting more because so far it looks like it's on the decline and you're reversing that. Is that correct? I, I am saying that we are actually increasing the number of good. inspection units on Well, hospital. that's good. Well, we'll take a look at the end of the year. Um, Mr. Patton, Regarding the canceled June 24th FRA inspection of SP, you stated, quote, I felt I had pushed the SP about as far as I could, unquote. That's correct. What does that mean? Basically, it means about the same as Mr. English's uh, explanation. My intent of, of going to uh, Bakersfield, Roseville, and Tucson following the Sparks uh, inspection and unsatisfactory results was to get push the railroad and get upper management's attention so that they would take some action to improve compliance. But what does that mean? I pushed the SP as far as I could. Just that I was I was pushing them into a compliance situation through upper management attention. Well, it doesn't sound too good that statement. Now when you talk to Mr. English, you remember the conversation in which you told him you were going to call off the inspection. What did you tell him? Yes, I, uh, as best I recall, I talked with Mr. English on uh, June the 24th. And uh, in fact, we had talked throughout the month of June, uh, giving him updates on our findings on Southern Pacific locomotives. Uh, and the last conversation was on June the 24th. And I as best I recall, I just advised uh, Mr. English that I was going to, to pull my inspection team out of West Colton and send them to Barstow. And he um, said? He neither said yes nor no. He, he didn't approve or disapprove. Did you make notes of that conversation? No, I did not. Okay. So you informed him, you didn't ask him? Yes, that's true. I understand you conduct team inspections of the railroads with the PUC. This gets to Mr. Cothan's point. You work together. Have there been any team inspections with the PUC since the canceled June 24th inspection? The one at Barstow uh, that, that followed the West Colton. Uh, There's been one well, since the, June 24th? The, the state inspector that was with our people uh, proceeded on the West to No, I meant since that time, since that day of a canceled inspection? I don't believe so. Has the PUC been advised or invited to any of these team inspections? No, since we've, then? we've been quite busy in the, in the two accidents and the related documentation since then. Additionally, we, 
we uh, this week moved our office from San Francisco to Sacramento, which was very disruptive. So that Mr. Colton says there's really fine cooperation here, but yet since June 24th, and here we are in October, you haven't had a team inspection. So. I, I have had a team inspection, but not in California. I'm talking about of SP. No. When do you intend to begin that procedure again? We had, uh, during the month of July, we had, I think, three people on the SP at Taylor Yard, if I remember correctly. I did not participate in that, uh, in that inspection. Since you made that statement that you couldn't push them any further and you called it to the attention of the higher-ups, have you had any more inspections since well, then? Con we continually to uh, inspect on the, on the SP and all railroads in, in my region. And you have a list of those inspections you could provide the subcommittee with? Certainly. Inspections of SP since that canceled one? Certainly. Did you get called at home by an SP executive? before you decided to cancel the inspection? Yes, I was called on June the 23rd. And what home. did he say? It was on a Sunday. Uh, Is that unusual for a private company who you are overseeing to call you at home? How would you even get your phone number? I, I do not object to, to upper management having my phone number at home uh, because uh, I have received calls on occasion of of accidents that gave me an advance uh, uh, notice and able to respond quickly, and that's main, the main reason why why I pass out my home phone number to these people. Well, what did he say to you when he called you? That uh, I don't recall the exact conversation, but but he mentioned that uh, that my exercise in Tucson had. Uh, uh, had their attention, and they hadn't calculated the the entire cost of the Southern Pacific, but it uh, would exceed a million dollars. And that uh, uh, Mr. Holtman, their vice chairman, had uh, attended a meeting uh, that weekend, apparently, and had stated he did not feel that it was the intent of Congress for FRA to bring a railroad to their knees. I'm sorry, it was the intent of Congress what? to permit FRA to bring a railroad to their knees. We... What would have ever made him say that? Well, um, we greatly affected uh, their operation of, of trains through Tucson during our, our few days that we were there. Well, Mr. Barron, we I appreciate, that. you know, your honesty here, but I have to tell you, <coughs> to me it is shocking that an SP person would call you and tell you it's the intent of Congress to bring this railroad to its knees essentially say something to you that would get you to call off an inspection. I mean, I can't come to any other conclusion. That, Is that, that a fair? That conversation with Mr. Berry basically communicated to me that I certainly had their attention and no further action was necessary on the SP at that time. In his now, opinion? In my opinion. Well, didn't he tell you that? No, no. no. My main intent of these these four team inspections throughout the month of June was to get management's attention and, and motivate them into improving compliance. That's exactly why I did it. And that's the basic reason why you do most team inspections. Now, isn't it true that under the FRA rules, um, there isn't any set time in which they have to comply? That, in fact, they pay their fines a couple of years late, 50 cents on the dollar? Well, <clears throat> our violation, do you want to answer that, Mark? Sure, I, I would like to answer that, if I may, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, can we have your, your name now, please? I'm Mark Lindsay. I'm the chief counsel of the agency. Mm -hmm. And uh, I handle that end of the enforcement process in my office. Uh, it is true that in recent years it has taken a couple of years to end up settling civil penalty collections. It's not the case, however, that the railroads uh, relax because of that uh, period of time. Uh, it is true that normally uh, settlements average out 
uh, somewhere between 55 and 60 percent. Uh, but the reason that the railroads do not relax at that is that these cases are settled uh, anywhere ranging from zero to 100 percent on the dollar of the initial amount assessed. Each violation is treated as a separate case. The railroad investigates the facts that we allege to them. We investigate the facts. We negotiate this as a litigation matter. It's settled out as a result of the value of the case in litigation. The railroad is motivated to enhance its compliance in this process because the claims are mitigated if the railroad has fixed the problem for which it is cited so that they end up paying less money if they demonstrate to us at the settlement conference that as a result of having been cited, they have improved their compliance with the law. And our purpose is to obtain their compliance, not to collect dollars. Well, it makes sense for them to have an incentive to fix the problem, and then I agree, get paying less. Makes mm -hmm. sense if they fix the problem. The trouble is these things are taking two years on average, as I understand it, a year to two. That is a problem, Madam Chair, and is coming down sharply, very sharply. Uh, we have been reducing the amount of time taken to assess the claims to the point that by the end of this month, uh, we'll be doing so in about 10 months. Uh, <clears throat> and by next year, uh, we expect to assess claims within four months uh, and to have all claims settled within the same year they are cited. Well, that's very important. The average person who gets a ticket on a car for a faulty brake light has 30 days to fix it. And they don't carry hazardous materials, and they don't carry Madam people. Madam Chair, let me please address. So the fact is, get cited, and then it takes a year or so to get to the bottom of whether or not they really did the fix and what the settlement will be. It's just too long a time. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to, to state, uh, by way of reassurance, that it is totally unacceptable for a railroad to fail to repair an FRA-identified defect or a defect that the railroad has identified in a daily inspection required by FRA or the more rigorous 92-day inspection required by FRA. And if we have any indication at all, Madam Chair, that that's the case, then we will use out-of-service authority to remove that locomotive from service. Removing the locomotive from service denies the railroad the use of a $1 million instrumentality. Okay. The reason I stopped here, I have a GAO report on railway safety, July 1990. Reinspections are a tool for determining whether a safety problem has been corrected. In a limited number of cases where FRA inspectors performed a reinspection, we found many instances in which the reinspection revealed that previously cited defects had not been corrected by the railroad. So that's one reason that we decided to put in a bill to say they have to make the fix in 30 days, period. And hopefully you can act on that. When I asked Mr. English about that the last hearing, he was going to think about whether or not that was a good idea. I decided not to wait for him to complete his thought process. We actually got it part of a bill. But I hope you can move it along yourselves. But in any event, I am disturbed by what I've heard here today. I'm, I'm pleased that you're moving along to get these things down to four months. But listen to what this sounds like. A Southern Pacific individual calls up a federal inspector at home and says, you got my attention. Congress is trying to bring us down to our knees with their rules. And then the federal inspector, well-meaning, nice, cancels the inspection because wow. He couldn't push them any further. It doesn't sound good. And I don't want you to be on the side of the railroad, and I don't want you to be on the side of the labor union. I want you to be on the side of the people. You have our assurance, Madam Chair, that that's Well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm just asking Mr. Patton this. 
I've recognized that as my responsibility for 17 years and I haven't changed it. But do you I, see the way it looks to people? I can understand where it, it might look uh, as uh, to be a problem with you. Uh, yeah. the well, I think the average person, if you went up on the street and said to somebody, how would you feel if you knew that... I'm just trying to think of another example. An IRS investigator was called by a corporation. The IRS was doing an audit. The corporation said, please lay off. I, you got my attention, but don't push me any further. And then the next day, the IRS auditor didn't go. It, it, this can't happen anymore. What? I need to have your agreement that this will not happen anymore. When you look at the record of, of team inspection, task force inspections that I've done on the Southern Pacific, the number of violations uh, uh, that Region 7 has filed, you, it's easy to see that there certainly is no compassion for the Southern Pacific. And I don't... Well, let me ask you this again. Do you think that it is proper for a federal inspector to call off an inspection midway after he was called or she was called by the company that he or she was overseeing. Do you see a problem with that? Let me make a little explanation, if I may. During the month of June, when these locomotive inspections were going on, I had available to me motor power, federal motor power and equipment inspector, <laughs> inspectors capable of making independent inspection consisting of one in Sacramento, two in Laguna Niguel, California, and one in Salt Lake City. Now, I, I spent three weeks on the Southern Pacific using all but the one in, in Salt Lake. And I also have responsibilities on the other railroads in the four-state region. I was just reallocating my so resources after accomplishing what I had originally intended to do by getting management's attention by going to address some other problem. If any railroad calls you again at home and says, you got my attention, you've levied X number of fines on me, don't just lay off for a while. I don't want to be pushed. What will you tell that person? I'll tell them no. If I still had a mission to accomplish. No, that's just not good enough. Well, let me just say, I'm, I've, I'm not making my point. To me, there is something inherently wrong with taking a call at home and discussing that kind of inspection with someone you're overseeing. And if I, I mean, am I the only one in the room that, I mean, in other words, it's so obvious, a conflict. You shouldn't be asking the railroad you're overseeing if you're pushing them too far. If they bring that up, you say, this is unethical. I'll stop this inspection when I feel I've discovered all the problems. And I need to know, maybe I will ask Mr. Colton at this point, if there will be some rules going out from you to your inspection team to give them guidance because maybe, maybe don't, they don't see the conflict. Well, Madam Chair, let me address it this way. Um, we had a regional director's meeting uh, recently uh, at which this subject was discussed. And I think that uh, the circumstances are sufficiently chilling to them as to what the impression was from the point of view of subcommittee. That probably uh, the tendency will be not to make as many good independent judgments as they should for a while. Um, I, I understand entirely, I understand entirely, Madam Chair, what you're saying about the impression that is given. Did I, under you call I this, Did you call this cancellation a good independent decision? Uh, Mr. Patton's been working with the Southern Pacific Railroad for several years on this problem. The important thing is to progress 
the resolution of the problem. Uh, I think uh, on the merits of the issue. And the problem is. Putting aside public perception. And the, the problem merits, is, all right, and the problem is. The problem is we've got to get the SP, Madam Chair, to devote the resources to establish the quality control procedures and to have the commitment to bring down the rate of noncompliance. Uh, we could go out there with all our inspectors and find all the problems and they'd fix them that day and we'd come back the next day and check it. But if we didn't stay there every day and we do not have enough resources to do that, it would be just as bad three or four weeks from that time unless the company itself resolves to make a commitment to do the job and get the situation under control because locomotives break down <coughs> in service every day. Components fail and items wear. So, and I can fully understand the impression that you're talking about here, and, and I think the impression is important, and I think the caution has already gone out um, that, that, that the impression that's left in some quarters is not a good one, and we want everyone to have confidence in the Federal Railroad administ Administration's commitment to railroad safety. But I think on its merits, and putting aside the impression, it was a good decision. Now, we're, we haven't stopped going after the issue of locomotive compliance on the SP. They've given us a compliance plan. We will believe that, that, that they're going to actually do something when we see the results of that plan. And we're going to be monitoring their 92-day inspections, which is the place, the control point, at which you can get the maximum benefits over the next couple of months. But again, we won't have any confidence that the problem is solved, that, that they are achieving an acceptable rate of compliance based on their own inspections until our inspectors report back that uh, clean locomotives are coming out of those 92-day inspections. And then we'll be looking at the daily inspections. So, now, how many compliance plans have you received from SP in the last five years? Um, um, I know of one other written compliance plan. And, when was uh, that received? Uh, March of 1990 is, is my memory, and Mr. English has been at this longer than I, and he may want to add to it. So you have the plan. Now you've asked them to do yet another plan. Okay, let me just, um, instead of belaboring this forever, ask your attorney. Mm -hmm. As the attorney for this agency, <clears throat> have you made any recommendations to them based on ethics and integrity and appearance of conf conflict of interest regarding these kind of conversations between inspectors and a company that is being overseen? I was at that same regional director's conference and participated in that discussion. Uh, I suggest, Madam Chair, that it is principally a problem of appearance here. To use your own analogy uh, of the IRS inspector and the, and the taxpayer, the message that Mr. Patton got in that context effectively as you've got a taxpayer here who, let's say, uses his automobile and his business for his livelihood. And the IRS has taken his automobile out of service now so that he can no longer earn that livelihood. And the message from the taxpayer to the IRS agent is, you've gotten my attention, I'm going to pay, and moreover, I'll file my future uh, filings on time and correctly. The average taxpayer doesn't have the home phone number of the IRS inspector. That's Trust true. me on that. That's different. Trust me on that. Well, Ms. Ms. Box, if I may, the railroad industry is a 24-hour-a-day industry, unlike the IRS. And that's why um, we want our people to have phone numbers where they can reach carrier officials. Normally, it's an operations center. We want the carrier officials to have numbers to reach our senior people. Mr. Patton is a senior manager of the FRA in, in, in our regional force. Um, so that we can receive accident notifications and so that any other issues that may arise can be worked out. Um, and the reality is that the railroads do run uh, 24 hours a day. So, um, you know, I, I want Mr. Patton to be talking to these officials. If he's not talking to these officials, he's not doing his job. Uh, if we're just talking... They can talking, talk to him any time, 9 to 5, can't they? And they do. But Good. we are also out Good. on the property, Madam Chair, Late at night, and I've talked to officials. Uh, uh, well, let late me just night, suggest to you this: the man didn't call with any emergency. I agree with you, okay? Madam Chair. Okay. The man didn't call to say, 
uh, we got a real problem and I need your assist. He called to essentially say, you caught my attention, lay off. And as far as I'm concerned, that's not acceptable. And I don't think that should be an appropriate kind of a uh, phone call. Now, he did it, and I think the appropriate answer is, that's just not appropriate for you to be telling me this. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to be independent about it. And I'll decide when to cancel an inspection uh, when I'm convinced that you're shaping up. Let me just say this. Um, I I'm disappointed in the sense that your response is one of, yeah, we hear you, we'll make a few changes. You're not really saying to me what I would like to hear, but what I would like to hear is um, we understand this, and we're going to go right back out there, and we're going to inspect these trains, we're going to make them safe, we're going to answer to the public. We do that every day, Madam Chair, and, and the gentlemen on either side of me have almost two decades each invested in that. Then let's not have any more canceled inspections. Let's have a system where we go in, we inspect, we make, we we say we're here because we care about the public, we care about the health and safety. We don't want to see people um, in trouble. We don't want to see babies being miscarried. We want to see items being carried safely. We want to see safe operations of the trains, and that means that we do our job and we think about the public and we don't think about the company or the workers, we just think about safety and health. That is, that is the job of, this, um, of these inspections and it's absolutely crucial. And if the news is bad, that means that the news is bad and that people have to clean up what they're doing and fix up what they're doing. And if they need our help in doing that, we can look at ways to help them do that. But your job is a serious one, an important one, and I only hope that as a result of this, you continue to do it um, in the proper fashion. I thank you uh, for coming before us today. Let me just say in closing, this has been a very long day. Um, I am absolutely convinced that this subcommittee has caused some good to come out of all this. I am absolutely convinced that first of all, we got the 30-day law passed through the House and I'm hoping it's going to move. Second of all, we got the EPA to say that they are going to look at the possibility of using their emergency powers. We've got RISPA to say something they didn't say the last time, which is hopefully uh, in several months' time they'll have the entire um, maritime list on their list. We still have confusion about what happened on the night of the accident. It's possible the car was touched, we may never know. But whether it was or it wasn't touched, one thing is for sure, the spill occurred and it was excruciatingly slow response um, by everyone. And it led to tragic consequences. And had there been quicker action, it may not have led to those tragic consequences. I think there's more to the story, but I think that the subcommittee, by its perseverance, has made things a little bit better. And we will keep on following this. We are going to listen to the uh, transmission of the actual conversations that took place on the night of the accident. We just apparently got it this afternoon. And we will keep in very close touch with the FRA, with the EPA, with RISPA, with SP if we need more information, with the PUC in California. And I just want to say as a Californian that I'm proud of um, what the California EPA did there. Because maybe the pregnant women may never have known uh, what problems they were facing if it wasn't for the California EPA. And I'm proud of the California PUC for um, really doing a good job in inspecting this whole accident. And I only hope that we in the federal level will work with them the best way we can in joint inspections, most cooperative effort that we can with them to get to the bottom of this and to see that this doesn't happen again. The last thing I want to do is come back here again. This has been 
painfully hard for everybody. Good, decent people across from me. Good, decent people. And um, we need to make sure these things don't happen again. We're all human, and if we learn from our mistakes, that's the most that we can do. We'll make other ones, every one of us. But if we don't repeat the other mistakes, then we've moved civilization forward. So the people of California and the country deserve no less than our learning from what happened. And when my head is clear, I will know exactly what I learned. The one thing I know is we have to have these fixes done in a timely fashion, 30 days. You find a problem, you fix it in 30 days. And we're moving ahead on that. Secondly, if a chemical is on the Coast Guard list, it ought to darn well be on the list of materials that have to be carried in a special way over land. Thirdly, if a chemical can destroy the environment, it should be enough of a criteria to get it immediately on um, the DOT list. Because the people out there who I quoted count on that listing. It means something to them. They were aware of it. And when we fail here to put these items on the list, we fail them. And then we fail women and children and, and men and families who get the fallout of all this. So thank you all for coming forward today. I know it has been unpleasant, unhappy, but we're getting to the bottom of something and I'm hoping we'll move forward from here. Thank you all. C-SPAN continues to preview the upcoming Supreme Court session Monday morning with two live viewer call-in programs. Join us at 8 a.m. Eastern Time when we talk with Lyle Denniston, Supreme Court correspondent for the Baltimore Sun. Then at 9.15 a.m. Eastern Time, our guest will be Pepperdine Law Professor Bernard James, Supreme Court preview here on C-SPAN beginning Monday morning at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. Join us. C-SPAN, the cable satellite public affairs network, and its companion network, C-SPAN 2, are privately funded to serve the public by America's cable television